Estoy bien, ¿sí? Sí. Sí, como no, sí. 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, sí. Ey, sí. Sí. Sí, bueno, sí, sí, dos, tres, dos, tres, sí. <coughs> sí. Sí, bueno, sí, sí, dos, tres, dos, tres. Sí, sí. Ey.
sí o no, sí o no. Uno, 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 uno. Uno, uno.
bueno, bueno. Bueno.
Buenos días, esta es la primera llamada. Access key. Uh -huh. yeah. It's the speed of the delivery because they're very, that's why they're in the cloud. Uh -huh. It's huge database. Sometimes you can get them and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Can you see the size of the cloud? Okay. So should I just, looks like I should just use the pointer probably here. Yeah. Do you want to, 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 to change yourself? The, yeah, I'll yeah? Change it. yeah. We have a pointer. That, that would be nice to have Okay. Yeah. I don't need a pointer. Okay. I use my mouse. Mm -hmm. This is splendid. What about audio? Audio? Yeah. yeah. There, there are two slides. Mm -hmm. We have water here. I don't here? need it. Oh, but it so I just plug that in from mm -hmm. the computer. Mm -hmm. Don't have to worry about setting. It's really Great. Mm -hmm. Coffee break. Oh, yeah. Take care of it. Okay. Yeah, 3.30 or whatever. Do you get used to it? We're talking about 10 o'clock at that break or the lunch break? No, at the <laughs> 11 o'clock. That's not nice, but sometimes it happens. Yeah. 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 We are like Excellent. too busy mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. stuff, yeah. but we yeah. take a moment yeah. to look through the window. Yeah, you have it on there. Yeah, it's beautiful. Segunda llamada. for Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Esta es la tercera llamada. Invitamos a todas las personas que se encuentran fuera del aula a pasar a sus asientos porque vamos a comenzar el evento. Buenos días. Sean todos bienvenidos al primer simposio de Biología Ambiental. En unos momentos daremos inicio formalmente a la inauguración del evento, pero antes de eso quisiera invitarlos a que pongan en silencio sus celulares por respeto a nuestros ponentes. Este evento es el resultado del esfuerzo en conjunto de los alumnos del posgrado de Ciencias de la Vida con orientación en Biología Ambiental. Quiero agradecer a mis compañeros y a los investigadores por la confianza y el apoyo. Ahora para dar la bienvenida formalmente, eh, tendremos al doctor Stephen Bullock, jefe del Departamento de Biología de la Conservación. Good morning and welcome, uh, especially to our distinguished visitors. It's a pleasure on behalf of the Director General, the Director of our Division of Experimental and Applied Biology, and um, myself, the Department of Conservation Biology and the Postgraduate Division to welcome our distinguished guests and uh, our distinguished visitors from, from Ensenada and other institutions. Um, estamos muy contentos de tener todos aquí hoy. Muchas gracias por su participación, su entusiasmo uh, para venir. The, uh, all of the higher authorities, as well as myself, are, um, wish to express their uh, great satisfaction to the organizers of the symposium. Uh, for their enthusiasm and, and um, uh, liberty and um, scientific interest, et cetera, in, in organizing this, this symposium, um, basically by themselves. Thank you very much to all of them. The young people are the, the, the future of our, of our world, and we hope that you will take uh, inspiration from, from this event. Esperamos que ustedes este, tomen el día así para um, reflexionar, pensar, preguntar mucho, este, ver nuevas direcciones, nuevas interacciones. No se animen de, de estar muy abiertos y, y preguntar sobre cosas, este, ligar entre los diferentes ponentes. Excuse me for speaking both Spanish and English, but sometimes uh, it's a little bit easier for the, for the introduction to uh, uh, smooth over some points. So, um, I guess officially I've never done this before, but uh, one has to give a, an official opening and declare an open of the a symposium at 9.24 in the morning of the uh, 6th of November. Um, so welcome and have a good time and uh, buen provecho. <laughs> Bueno, pues ahora voy a darles una breve introducción sobre nuestra primera ponente, Kathleen Tresider. Ella se graduó de la carrera de Biología en la Universidad de Utah, obtuvo su doctorado en Ciencias Biológicas en la Universidad de Stanford. Actualmente es profesora de Biología en la Universidad de California en Irvine. Su investigación aborda ampliamente el papel que juegan los hongos en mediar las respuestas de los ecosistemas frente al cambio global. Está dirigida a escalas que van desde lo molecular hasta los ecosistemas. Desarrolló marcos conceptuales para vincular la forma en que los modelos de ecosistemas se pueden incorporar a la ecología microbiana. Así que demos de la bienvenida. Sorry about that. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Um, it means a lot to me to be invited by students to speak, 
And I really appreciate all the work the students have put into organizing this symposium. It's a, it's a lot of work, it's not trivial, and they've done a really great job. We feel very well taken care of. And um, I was really happy, especially to come here, because uh, one of my PhD students, Adriana Romero, um, is a graduate of CSSA. So I've heard a lot about it and often wanted to visit. So this was my chance. So I'm very happy to be here. All right, so today I'm going to talk about fungal diversity. And um, you know, fungi are really amazing. I'll tell you a lot about them this morning. Um, one of the things about them is that they're, they're highly diverse. So we think there are tens of millions of species of fungi in the world. And you know, we've only begun to study them. We've only described about 100,000 of them. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but you know, one question that I get is, uh, why? Why should we care about fungal biodiversity? Is there are animals and plants out there that you know, we know a lot about, we know they're important. What do fungi do? Well, fungi have a number of really important services that they perform in ecosystems and also that humans benefit from. And from what we know so far about fungal diversity is that different fungal species really vary a lot in the services they perform. So we really need to consider the diversity of fungi when we're thinking about ecosystems. All right, so there are a few things that I'll talk about that fungi do um, that are very important for ecosystems. One is that they perform decomposition. So they'll break down dead tissues from plants, animals, and other microbes. And as they do that, they're recycling the nutrients that are in those tissues so that other animals, and plants, and microbes can use them. So that's very important. Um, at the same time, while they're doing that, they're converting part of the carbon in those tissues to CO2. And that gets released into the atmosphere. And that's something that we're very concerned about because, of course, CO2 is a greenhouse gas and it contributes to global warming. So they can also influence future trajectories of the Earth's climate by their activities. And one thing I want to make sure I point out is that they're especially good at decomposing really tough material, really complex organic compounds like the lignin that's in wood that most other organisms can't break down. So this is an important and unique service that they perform. Um, so I'm going to call these compounds recalcitrant carbon compounds, the ones that are very difficult to break down. I'll be talking about that throughout the, the seminar. Okay, another thing that they do is that they make their own recalcitrant carbon compounds. Um, they, as they're building their tissues in their cell walls, they're making a lot of compounds that are difficult to break down. Then when they die, those compounds go into the soil. And a lot of the soil that you see in ecosystems are actually these former fungal biomass tissues that have built up over centuries. So they can contribute both to the release of carbon as CO2 to the atmosphere, and then also the storage of carbon in the soil in these recalcitrant compounds. So they have two very important and imposing effects on ecosystems, and different species perform these functions to different extents. So I'm going to talk about that. OK, now because you know, these fungal species really vary in their uh, services in ecosystems, they can potentially form feedbacks on climate change. So let's say, just in general, you know, a lot of the work that I study involves looking at the, the fungal role in these feedbacks. So let's say you have an element of global change, like global warming, or increased drought, or pollution. That will often influence how the fungal um, community is structured, what species are in there, and also what they're doing in the ecosystem. And that, in turn, affects ecosystem function, and especially you know, how much carbon the ecosystems store. When ecosystems store carbon, that carbon's not in the atmosphere is CO2, so that's very important to us. And then if the ecosystem function changes so that there's more or less CO2 being released to the atmosphere, that can feed back to alter um, the tra trajectories of global change. OK, so that's a general feedback. Um, I'm going to talk about one particular scenario for the first part of my talk. And that involves um, global warming. So we have the greenhouse effect um, that is causing global warming currently. And we know that you know, from many, many lab and field studies, if you warm up soils you know, uh, 4 to 8 degrees centigrade, um, which is about the level of warming that we're seeing, that increases the availability of nitrogen in those soils. And the thought there is that it's because microbes are um, 
acting more quickly, they're recycling the, that nitrogen faster, there's more nitrogen available. Now, this is really important because nitrogen is a critical element of the biomass of organisms and fungi too. Um, fungi require nitrogen to build proteins and their cell walls. And so we would expect that if there's a change in nitrogen availability in an ecosystem, we would influence fungi. And we also might expect different fungal groups to either increase or decrease depending on how much they need nitrogen. And then depending on what those fungal groups are doing, um, they could alter soil CO2 release, and that could go on and, and feed back to um, either increase or decrease the greenhouse effect. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about one particular group of fungi to start with, and that's mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhizal fungi, um, can I ask you, how many of you have heard of mycorrhizal fungi? Just so you know. Okay, so quite a few. All right, that's good. So I'll, I'll just give you a general overview. Mycorrhizal fungi are, are amazing. We couldn't live without them. They grow on you know, about 80 to 90% of plant species. They form relationships on plant roots, and they'll mine the soil for nitrogen and phosphorus, pass a portion of those to the plant, and then in exchange, the plant provides carbon to the fungi from the photosynthate. And this is one group of mycorrhizal fungi that's fairly abundant, and it grows on um, pine trees and um, hardwoods and some softwoods. And that's ectomycorrhizal fungi. And ectomycorrhizal fungi grow around the outside of plant roots. So they form these sheaths here. This is a plant root from Chile. And there's all the pink material you see here is this fungus that's grown around the root. And then here you can see this is a pine seedling and it's been colonized by ectomycorrhizal fungus. And this is the root of the pine seedling and this is the root and this is the root. And everything else you see here is this mycorrhizal fungus. So it grows around the roots and then it grows these hyphae out into the soil. And that's how it gets the nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, you know, these hyphae represent a lot of biomass in the soil. And when I was um, first starting to study uh, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, I thought, you know, if you see mycorrhizal fungi in an ecosystem, they're probably contributing to soil carbon storage. And I was thinking that because, you know, if you look at all the biomass that they're making, as those hyphae die, that carbon's going to remain in the soil. Um, I was thinking, well, they probably get a lot of their carbon from the plant as photosynthate, so that's where they're getting their energy they're probably not breaking a lot of carbon down in the soil. And so altogether, I was thinking that these um, fungi would form this conduit of carbon into the soil that would stay for, for quite a while. Um, since then, I've really had to reanalyze my thinking on this. A lot of the new data that's been coming out um, makes me really question whether mycorrhizal fungi can contribute to soil carbon storage. I think in some cases they can reduce soil carbon storage because they can perform decomposition under certain circumstances. All right, there's another major group of mycorrhizal fungi, and that's our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. And so they grow on about 80% of plant species, very common. Um, they actually grow into plant roots, inside the roots. And here's a root from Hawaii that's been stained so that the, our buscular mycorrhizal tissues are dark. So you can see them growing in through here. So here are some hyphae growing through. These are arbuscules. These are little structures that are the sites at which the nitrogen and phosphorus is passed from the fungus to the plant. And that's also where the plant passes the sugars, the carbon, to the fungi. And here's some roots from Hawaii, I mean, um, Alaska. And they're growing through the soil. And you can see that these mycorrhizal fungi are growing all these hyphae out into the soil. And so, again, they can be very abundant in the soil. They can um, also act potentially as a conduit of carbon. And this right here is just a little columbulin. I put this here because I understand that fungi are not as exciting to a lot of people. I put an animal in there for those of you. So, now one thing about our vascular mycorrhizal fungi is that if you ask most people who study these fungi, they will say they absolutely do not conduct decomposition. They do not break down dead carbon, um, carbon and dead plant material in the soil and release that as CO2. Um, they're not thought to do this. In fact, people think they're such weak decomposers that they can't even um, use nitrogen or phosphate or phosphorus unless it's in a mineral form. You know, they, they, it's thought that they can't use nitrogen that's bound up in organic nitrogen compounds. And so that's been a really long paradigm. There's actually not a lot of um, testing that's been done for that. And so I'm also reassessing that. 
Okay, now the neat thing about mycorrhizal fungi is that they respond to global change. They're very sensitive to the environment. And that's in part because of their relationship with their host plants. So um, there have been quite a few studies that have been done um, in field sites where researchers have added nitrogen fertilizer or phosphorus fertilizer, or they've increased CO2 concentrations around the plants. And then they've looked at the abundance of mycorrhizal fungi, and they see that the fungi really change. Um, so this is a meta-analysis that I performed quite a while ago now of these field studies. And um, this is the average response that we see in abundance of mycorrhizal fungi um, across these studies. So for instance, if you add nitrogen fertilizer, on average across these studies, there's a decline of about 15% of mycorrhizal abundance. If you add phosphorus, there's an even stronger decline, that's 32%. And if you increase CO2 around the plants, there's an uh, opposite effect, an increase of about 47%. And these are all, these are 95% confidence intervals, so where they don't overlap with this line, this is significant. Okay, so why? Why is there this consistent response? Well, it makes sense when we think of the ecology of the mycorrhizal fungi. So if plants have these fungi that are growing on their roots that are very expensive, they require a lot of carbon for the plants to feed them, it, it makes sense that if there's more nitrogen or phosphorus available in those soils, that the plants will stop investing their carbon in those fungi and invest them elsewhere. And so the fungi will become more starved and declined. Now, elevated CO2 has the opposite effect because when plants are exposed to higher CO2 levels, oftentimes they increase their photosynthetic rate, their growth rate, they have more carbon to allocate to the fungi, so then they can invest that extra carbon in the fungi and the fungi will, will grow better. So, you know, it's nice to know that there's this consistent effect. This also means that these fungi can then form part of this feedback where they're responding to global change and then whatever they happen to be doing to soil carbon then could cause a feedback. Okay, so um, just really, really started to reassess whether mycorrhizal fungi can perform decomposition or not. And one of the reasons that we're reassessing this idea is that um, we now know from a number of lab studies that have examined ectomycorrhizal fungi in petri dishes and in, in pots in the greenhouse, they found that ectomycorrhizal fungi can actually break down organic carbon um, often cases fairly well. Um, and this, again, is, is d different from what we normally think of. So, for instance, they can break down cellulose, pectin, lignin, you know, these really complex carbon um, compounds. And, um, and again, this is not something that we expect because normally we think that they're getting that carbon from the plants. Uh, they do uh, break down this chitin and proteins. I want to highlight these because these compounds have nitrogen in them. So it makes sense that if they're you know, searching for nitrogen, that they'll be de uh, breaking down these compounds in particular to get that nitrogen. But these other compounds here, we, we really don't know why they're breaking them down. They have the carbon from the plants. Why would they do this? Okay, so one of my former PhD students, Jenny Talbot, she thought of some reasons why these mycorrhizal fungi would be uh, conducting decomposition. And, and there are three hypotheses that she proposed. One of them is, um, she called it coincidental decomposer hypothesis. And with this hypothesis, she was just thinking, well, because mycorrhizal fungi are searching for nitrogen in the soil, um, some of that nitrogen will be in these uh, organic forms. There'll be carbon associated with those nitrogen atoms. And as they take up the nutrients, they'll release the carbon from the uh, molecules, and, and that, some of that will go into CO2. And so they're just essentially performing decomposition as a byproduct of this nutrient acquisition. Now another scenario is um, Jenny called Plan B. In this scenario, um, she was thinking that mycorrhizal fungi might in some cases just be using the soil carbon as an alternate carbon source. So there might be cases where the plants are not giving the mycorrhizal fungi enough carbon, and so the fungi might use the, the soil as another source of carbon. And then the third possibility is priming effects, where um, you know, the mycorrhizal fungi, they might have an advantage if they get carbon from plants. They can allocate that to enzymes to break down these molecules and actually help increase their decomposer ability. Now, of these three, um, I think the most likely one that's occurring is this coincidental decomposer hypothesis, because we know that mycorrhizal fungi are um, foraging for nitrogen. Okay, so we tested this um, in the field. 
So we wanted to see basically whether nitrogen availability would decrease mycorrhizal fungi, you know, that's been studied already in a number of field sites, that's consistently found, and whether that would likewise cause a decrease in organic nitrogen uptake by mycorrhizal fungi. And if this results in CO2 release from the soil, then there would be a resultant decline in soil CO2 release and a potential negative effect on, on the greenhouse effect. Okay, so the, the thing that we had to do then, of course, is measure how much organic nitrogen is being taken up by mycorrhizal fungi in the field. Uh, so we went to an Alaskan forest. This is a boreal forest. And we set up nitrogen fertilization plots. So we have um, 10 by 10 meter plots that we established. We added um, fertilizer, uh, nitrogen fertilizer to half of them, left the remaining half undisturbed as a control. And then it was just a matter of measuring how much organic nitrogen the mycorrhizal fungi took up. All right, actually, that's really hard to do. It's very hard to do in the field. Um, people have tried to use isotopes, and it's not, it's not easy. So we had to come up with a new way to do this. Um, and one of the ways that we found was really promising was using a new nanotechnological tool, and that's called quantum dots. So quantum dots are really amazing. So they're very, very small semiconductors. So their diameter is you know, from less than one to 100 nanometers, about the size, well, we used um, two nanometer size quantum dots. That's the size of about 10 amino acids bound together, so a small molecule. And these quantum dots are made of heavy metals and other metals, and it's amazing. If you shine a UV light on them, they'll glow very, very brightly in whatever color you choose, a pure color. So you can get red quantum dots that grow really brightly red, green quantum dots that grow really brightly green, and so on. So this means that you can actually watch these quantum dots move through fungi and through the soil and through the plants. Now the other really great thing about these quantum dots is that you can buy them with these um, carboxyl or amino groups attached to their shell. And because you can buy them that way, you can actually attach a compound that you're interested in to the quantum dots and now that compound can essentially glow. And so you can watch that compound move. And this was one way that we could see whether organic nitrogen was being taken up by mycorrhizal fungi. And I have to give credit to my former PhD student, Matthew Whiteside. He's the one who brought this technique into the lab. It was developed for biomedical purposes and nobody had used it at that point in ecology. And he, um, he came in and he told me about it and I said, Matt, that's never gonna work. Don't, <laughs> don't waste your time on it. Um, try to think of something else to do. Um, but he didn't listen to me, which I'm very happy about. And in his spare time in the evenings, he came in and tried out this technique and he got it to work. And so I'm so happy that he did. Okay, so the first thing that he wanted to do was to test whether mycorrhizal fungi could take up a very simple uh, organic nitrogen compound, and he picked glycine. This is an amino acid. Here's the structure right here. It has this nitrogen atom, but otherwise it's fairly simple. So he, he conjugated red quantum dots to this glycine so he could follow it into fungi. And what he really wanted to do was, was watch this go into mycorrhizal fungi, but he had a really hard time um, culturing mycorrhizal fungi. He was new to the area and it kept, his cultures kept getting contaminated with mold. And mold actually is a fungus, it's penicillium. So he ended up just deciding to do his test on the mold. So it was a lot easier for him to do. And so he grew this mold in the lab and here's some hyphae of the mold. And then he added um, to water around the hyphae these glycine uh, molecules that were attached to the quantum dots. And the fungi actually did take up the quantum dots with no problem. So here you can see the red color here, that's all quantum dots that's going into these fungi. Um, they're taking them out of the solution here. And this is just after two hours, after six hours you see more uptake, and after 24 hours you see quite a bit. So it looked like these fungi were actually able to take up the quantum dots, which totally surprised me. Um, but then the, one of the questions that we had then was, uh, you know, why are they taking up the quantum dots? Maybe for some strange reason they want those heavy metals. It doesn't make any sense, but that's a possibility. So of course we had to come up with some controls. And so Matt made some controls where he had in a solution just these quantum dots by themselves. Glycine was also added to the solution, but they weren't connected together. 
And so when he added this um, solution to the um, penicillium, the penicillium didn't take it up at all. So here's the hyphae of the penicillium, and you can see that it's, it's pretty dark because you don't have the quantum dots in them. And then the quantum dots are still in the solution here. So what he um, surmised was that the fungi were taking up the quantum dots to get this glycine when it was attached, and the quantum dots were coming up along with it. Okay, so that was, that was great. He, he established a proof of method. Um, the next step was to actually look at uptake of organic nitrogen compounds attached to quantum dots in mycorrhizal fungi. So he grew some arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi on grass seedlings. And, um, and again, you know, normally we don't expect our vascular mycorrhizal fungi to be taking up compounds like this. All right, so he, he made these glycine conjugated quantum dots. He added it to solution um, around the roots of the plant and the, and the hyphae of the plant. And the glycine was taken up very, very readily, actually. This is after four hours. You can see the quantum dots going into the arbuscular mycorrhizal hyphae. And then you can even follow it into the plant. So here, they're getting transferred from the hyphae here into the root tissue. And then you can even watch it go up into the leaves. So the plants are moving it up into the leaves. And after 24 hours, the quantum dots end up in the chloroplasts, which is where the, the plants tend to store their nitrogen compounds. So this was um, a, a nice uh, example of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi actually being able to take up this organic nitrogen that we hadn't thought they could do very easily. All right, but that's a really easy organic nitrogen compound, very simple. We really wanted to challenge these fungi and see if they could take up this more recalcitrant compound that's tougher to break down. And so uh, Matt thought of a, a model, recalcitrant molecule to use, and this is chitosan. And so here's the structure of chitosan. It's fairly complex. It's a derivative of chitin, which is a fairly abundant um, compound in the soil. And he attached quantum dots to these amino groups in the chitosan. Normally, this is tough for fungi to break down. OK, but it turns out that it, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi could take it up with little trouble again. So here's, a, um, here's our arbuscular mycorrhizal hyphae right here. And this is just a big chunk of chitosan. That's how we buy it. And you can see it's labeled. And you can see that this, this hypha was able to take up the quantum dots that's attached to it. And this is a sterile solution. So it's not like there are other microbes that are breaking this down and then the um, fungi are taking up the remnants. It's, um, it's, it's just the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And this is after five hours. So again, this is very surprising to us, that these fungi could actually conduct decomposition in a way, break down this organic nitrogen compound and, and take it up. OK, so that's in the lab. That's great. You know, what we really want to know if these fungi are performing in ecosystem services, what are they doing in the field? We need to know that. So we went back to our Alaska plots. And Matt made a cocktail of different quantum dots that he injected into the soil. So he had quantum dots that were green, and he attached those to glycine, very simple, um, which we call labile car um, nitrogen compound. And then he had red quantum dots that he attached to chitosan. And he mixed them together in a syringe, and then he could look at the colors and see who was taking up which one. And he also made a, another set of cocktails where he had the um, quantum dots, but they were not bound to the compounds. And you know, we just never really saw the mycorrhizal fungi taking up these controls, so I'm not going to talk about them anymore. Um, all right, so here's a picture of Matt injecting this compound into the, um, the boreal forest in Alaska. And he injected it and waited 24 hours, and then came in and, and dug up all the soil around that injection point, took out the roots and the hyphae, and looked at them under a microscope. All right, so then the next thing he had to do was actually measure how many quantum dots were taken up in these um, samples. And that was, that was really challenging. He had to develop a whole other method to do this. Um, I, I'm not going to go into it a whole lot, but basically he used a confocal microscope and performed raster image correlation spectroscopy. And so this confocal microscope was set up. It could count how many quantum dots were in the samples. All right, so here is a root from Alaska that he pulled up. And so this is, this is the root right here, and this is the interior of, of the root. And then these right here are our buscular mycorrhizal hyphae, right here, 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 and here. And you can see, based on their color, what they were taking up. So um, this hypha right here 
was taken up both glycine, which is green, and chitosan, which is orange. So it looked like they were able to take that up, no problem. This hypha right here is my favorite one because it had a preference. It had a preference for chitosan. So you can see here it's turning orange because it has the chitosan bound quantum dots, but it wasn't taking up any of the glycine bound quantum dots. And um, so we could really start to get an idea of the separation and function of these fungi. Now, one of the things that I, one of the questions I often get at this point is, um, you know, how do you know that when we see these quantum dots in these fungi here, that they're actually, that those compounds are actually intact? It's possible that when we put those quantum dots into the soil, some other fungus or bacterium broke down the glycine or the chitosan and made it simpler, and then the fungus took it up. Well, it turns out that Matt could detect that, could detect if that happened. And he could do that by looking at the um, light spectrum of the quantum dot. So this is, these solid lines here, is the, those are the emissions of the quantum dot um, when they're intact. So this is glycine conjugated quantum dots. That's this right here, they're green. And the chitosan conjugated quantum dots are right here. But what's really neat is if you take off a portion of that molecule that's bound to the quantum dot, it changes the, the spectrum of the quantum dot. Not a whole lot, but just enough that we can detect it with the microscope. So for instance, if you have just green quantum dots bound to am simple amino groups, the spectrum shifted a little bit. It's red shifted. Same thing with the chitosan bound quantum dots where the amino groups remain. It's shifted. So he could actually go in with this quantum, with this confocal microscope and count the number of quantum dots where these compounds had been broken off already before they were taken up. And that's these colors right here. So all this green here, these quantum dots had glycine on them, but they got converted to amino groups. And same here with the chitosan. So you can see they're not very abundant in these samples. This is just after 24 hours. So it's possible there just wasn't very much time for these microbes to break down this compound. Um, but it seems like about 95% of the quantum dots that were taken up had this intact molecule on it. So they were, it did seem like they were taking up these, these compounds. OK, so then you know, we'll go to the data. Uh, you know, we found that in general, yeah, there was a, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and the ectomycorrhizal fungi in the field could take up these organic nitrogen compounds with little trouble. So this is um, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which we generally tend not to think of taking up these compounds. And you can see here that they did take up um, chitosan bound to quantum dots and, and glycine bound to quantum dots, and kind of equally easily. And then in the nitrogen fertilized plots, there was a decline in the amount of glycine that was taken up by these fungi. And that's just because each individual fungus took up less quantum dot associated glycine. And there wasn't a significant effect on chitosan. Okay, for the ectomycorrhizal fungi, um, again, both of them could take up both types of, of organic nitrogen compounds, the glycine and the chitosan. In this case, the ectomycorrhizal fungi um, had a decrease in chitosan taken up when we added nitrogen in the, in the nitrogen fertilized plots. And for the ectomycorrhizal fungi, it's just because there were fewer ectomycorrhizal fungi in those plots. They tended to get knocked out, so they weren't taking up very much as a whole. Okay, so altogether we did find that there was a decline in, well, the first the fungi could take up these organic nitrogen compounds, and there was a decline when we increased nitrogen. Now, we might expect a portion of those organic nitrogen compounds then to be converted to CO2, um, this release from the soil. So at the same time that we were measuring this process, we also looked at the amount of CO2 that was being released from the soil from these plots. And we actually measured it over quite a few days, over a few years. And altogether, we found that there was a decline in CO2 being released from these plots. And this is consistent with our finding with the fungi. Um, but the, this fun finding with the mycorrhizal fungi, it doesn't explain the entirety of this response. Um, a lot of organisms are releasing CO2 from the soil, so there are a lot of things that are contributing to this. So the mycorrhizal fungi would be just one portion. Okay, so altogether then, we found um, support for our hypothesis. So we have nitrogen availability increasing. There's generally a decline in mycorrhizal fungi. In our case, we found a decline in organic nitrogen uptake. For our vascular mycorrhizal fungi, it was for the glycine, and for ectomycorrhizal fungi, it was for the chitosan. 
Um, altogether, uh, this could reduce the amount of CO2 released from this process. And if this process is, is large enough, there could be um, a negative effect on the greenhouse effect. There's less CO2 going into the atmosphere. Um, but the question is, how common is this effect? We just studied it in one field size, so we need to look at it in others. Okay, so then I'm gonna talk about another aspect of climate change, and that's drought. So, you know, we often think about global warming, but of course, um, we're seeing more drought in many areas. I assume down here, in Southern California, we're having a really a, a big problem with drought. Um, and that's partly contributed to by global change. All right, so if we have climate change that's increasing drought, um, that might also affect fungal groups because fungi need water, like most organisms. And depending on what these fungal groups are doing in the soil, that could alter soil carbon storage and then feedback to affect climate change. All right, so, you know, there are lots of different ways we could measure how drought might affect fungi. One of the ways that we wanted to do it was to look at a global gradient in climate and look at fungal communities in the soils across that gradient and see if changes were related to drought. Okay, so we had um, about 47 different field sites going across North and South America. And these field sites are, are in these uh, symbols right here. And um, these sites varied a lot in both temperature and precipitation rates. All right, so we collected soils from these field sites and then extracted DNA and measured the fungal community in each of them and looked for changes in species di uh, distributions across these continents. And um, we found a kind of a, a, an interesting pattern, actually. So the more ancient fungi tended to be restricted to tropical areas where it's warmer and there's more precipitation. So they tended to be found mostly in these sites right here. They're really old fungi. The newer fungi, um, in contrast, tended to be found in all the sites. They could live almost everywhere. Now this type of pattern is found in plants and animals too. It's, it's fairly common. It's called the tropical conservatism hypothesis. And we were amazed to find it in fungi. So what we were thinking was, that there's some sort of evolutionary event in the history of fungi where um, you know, the older phyla, maybe they evolved at a time where there was a lot of water and um, global temperatures were warm, so they're adapted to that climate. And then there was some sort of event in their history where they changed their physiology somehow that allowed them to occupy drier or colder sites up here. All right. Well, so what, what's, first of all, you need to know what was the environmental variable that seemed to be most important in structuring these communities across these continents. And we looked at all the different aspects of the sites, we performed a number of different analyses, and we found that precipitation really seemed to be key. Uh, precipitation was the best explainer for changes in fungal composition across the globe. And, um, and in fact, we can look at how um, these different fungal phyla prefer um, different precipitation levels. So this is a, um, the fungal evolutionary tree. Here's the ancient ancestor, Cryptomycota, and these are the more recently evolved um, subphyla. And um, this is just the average um, annual precipitation of the sites in which each of the, these groups were found. And so you can see here these more ancient fungal phyla in general preferred fairly wet sites, sites with high precipitation, and these younger phyla could tolerate drier sites, and um, this split um, significantly. So, so what's going on here? We could actually even, um, we could identify where this split occurred. We performed a phylogenetic analysis, and it's this divergent, divergence, divergence right here where the um, preference for dry versus wet sites really um, split. Okay, so we can go in and look at the time at which this divergence happened. All right, now there are much better mycologists than I am looking at the evolutionary history of these fungi. And um, they have, um, right now, they estimate that this split right here occurred 600 to 800 million years ago. So quite a while ago. So we're thinking something happened at this point in the Earth's climate that then allowed these fungi here to um, evolve to develop a tolerance for drier ecosystems. All right, so what happened? Well, when these fungi were evolving, um, the Earth's climate was fairly, fairly warm and wet. They didn't have a lot of ice ages. There was an ice age that happened, but it was before even this ancestor had evolved. So they're evolving in a fairly um, uh, pleasant climate. 
but around 600 to 800 million years ago, that was in the Neoproterozoic. And we can look at um, geological history, and we find some strong evidence for these extreme ice ages that were happening during this time. And in these extreme ice ages, um, much of the water on the Earth was frozen as ice. So, so much of the oceans were even covered with glaciers. And this is called uh, snowball Earth for obvious reasons. So there were several of these events during this time point. And obviously it was very cold on Earth when this was happening, but it was also very dry because a lot of this water was frozen. And so this could have been a strong selection factor for these fungi and could have selected for um, new species that could tolerate these drier ecosystems. And that might be influencing their distributions today. All right, so what, is that, what does that mean? Like, uh, you know, we know that these different fungi are growing in different places on the earth. Um, that's great to know, but what I'm always interested in is how is that gonna affect the ecosystem? Well, um, one of the things that we wanted to look at is what kind of trait was conferring this drought tolerance on the new fungi and how does that affect their ecosystem function? And so fungi have a lot of different ways that they improve their drought tolerance, but one is by strengthening their cell wall. So when they're exposed to drought, they're vulnerable, they're losing water. Um, if they can strengthen their cell wall, then they avoid this water loss. And they can do that by adding this compound, it's called beta-1,3 glucan into the cell wall. And it, can com it comprises quite a bit of the cell wall among the fungi that have it. And there have been some nice laboratory tests that confirm that fungi that have this compound are better able to tolerate drought. Um, but the, the neat thing about this is that not all fungi make beta-1,3 glucan. It's a relatively recent evolutionary event. And we can actually go in and see which fungi can make this compound because we know the gene that encodes the compound. And um, we now have quite a few whole genomes of different fungi going across the whole fungal tree of life. And we can just go look in those genomes for evidence of this gene and have an idea about whether different fungi can make this compound or not. And so we did that, and we found actually that the ability to produce this beta-1,3 glucan does seem to be significantly related to drought tolerance of these fungi in our study. So here, um, this axis right here is the number of beta-1,3 glucan synthase genes in each genome. Um, of representatives of each of these phyla or subphyla of fungi that I talked about earlier. So now these are the fungi right here that are really ancient, and in general they prefer the wetter climates, as you can see here. Now they do not have any genes to make beta-1,3 glucan, they just, they simply can't do it. And so this might be one reason why they're restricted to these climates. Now, even among the ones that have the gene, some have more copies than others, and this um, fungus right here, the glomeromycota, it has some copies but not many, and again, it, it prefers um, slightly wetter habitats than these others. So this could be one of the drivers of this pattern. And I want to point out this subphylum right here, Saccharomycotina, is the poster child for beta-glucan synthase. It's been studied a lot in its ability to use this. Here are these fungi that are growing. The beta-glucan synthase is, is dyed red here, and it comprises a lot of their cell wall. About 60% of their biomass is beta-1,3-glucan. So they can make a lot of it. Now, beta-1,3-glucan is, is very interesting to me as an ecosystem ecologist because it actually has two simultaneous functions in the ecosystem. One is that it could potentially confer drought tolerance, and the other is that it is a really tough compound to break down. It's very complicated. It forms these cross linkages with the other compounds in the cell wall. And um, it's very difficult when we are in the lab and trying to dissolve it. We can't dissolve it in acid. We can't dissolve it in alkali. It could potentially be very long lived. So these fungi that are making these compounds, not only could they potentially be better able to grow in these dry areas, but they might be depositing more recalcitrant compound in the soil and increasing soil carbon storage. All right, so altogether, you know, this, this mechanism could form a feedback then on climate change, where you have climate change increasing drought um, that might select for fungi with more beta-glucan in their cell walls. Um, there might be, as a result, more recalcitrant carbon being deposited in the soil, and that could increase soil carbon storage. And if this is the case, then this process might form a negative feedback on climate change as well, because the carbon that's in that soil will not be released as CO2 to the atmosphere. 
Okay, so just to sum up these two different scenarios that I've been talking about, you have climate change increasing warming, which can increase nitrogen availability in the soil and decline organic nitrogen use by mycorrhizae and may potentially reduce the CO2 that's released as part of that process. On the other hand, if you have drought occurring as well, that can cause a shift in the fungal community towards these more recently evolved fungi and could potentially increase recalcitrant carbon de deposition because they're making this beta-1,3 glucans. And that likewise could contribute to um, greater soil carbon storage. And so these are just two of the scenarios of global change that I've talked about. And there are many, many other functions that fungi perform in the ecosystem. I could talk for days about it, um, but I just wanted to focus on these two. And I think these are um, fun examples of how fungi could form these feedbacks on global change. All right, so I'd just like to end up by thanking all my collaborators and funding agencies. And I think the fungi, the fungi are always great to work with. And I thank you for listening. And so any questions? Yeah, thank you. Is it possible to grow experimentally uh, these guys? Thank you. I'll repeat that. Is it possible to grow them such that you can say the organisms with um, the older organisms with, yeah. with with or without the beta beta one three glucan? Yeah, glucan. Yeah. <laughs> Left the one three out. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have independent cultures of them and test them against different kinds of climates, even in the laboratory. Yeah, I think, yeah, you can do that because you know what's really neat is that we have mutants. We have mutants of that Saccharomycotina huh? fungus that, doesn't, that has the beta-1,3 glucan gene knocked out. And so you could grow them in these different conditions and see how well they're growing and then also see how much recalcitrant carbon builds up in the media. And from the community ecology perspective, you could also determine whether it's a real preference or whether there's some active competition going on right. that restricts the, the, the drought tolerant ones to the drier areas or restricts <laughs> the, the ones that seem to need a lot of water. But I'm not worried about that one. It's the first one. It yeah. restricts the drought tolerant ones to where they are because they can't compete successfully where there's lots and lots of water. I get, I get that question, I think it's entirely possible. These fungi can form really big, the individuals can actually be very big of the ectomycorrhizal fungi and others, and they definitely overlap and interact. And some are better competitors than others. So that could definitely be a, um, a mechanism. Splendid, Splendid. thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's a lot to study. Uh, <laughs> I found your studies with the uh, the quantum dots, very interesting. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, how big are these dots? Yeah. And I ask you that because the cell wall of a fungus is very tough to penetrate. I know. So the, my concern is that the, the quantum dot is on the surface of the cell, not exactly inside the cell. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. That was, one of, that was the reason I told Matt not to do it, because <laughs> I thought there was no way that they could get through the cell wall. Um, we do find that if we do the larger, we, we use the larger quantum dots that are about 20 nanometers diameter, they're not taken up as easily as the ones that are two nanometers diameter. So I think there's a, definitely a threshold there. Um, we can, when we're using the confocal microscope, we can take depth slices through the sample, and we always do this to make sure the quantum dots are actually inside the cell. Um, if we don't see evidence they're inside the cell, then we just assume that they're, they're stuck on the outside. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, it, it does seem like the smaller quantum dots can make it through those pores okay. I also want to ask you about the, uh, uh, what you said about the beta-glucan. Yeah. And uh, because what, what we know about cell walls of fungi, both the aquatic fungi, the terrestrial fungi, have beta-glucan as a major component of the wall. Right. So uh, I, I, I don't see the, the, the logic of, 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 your, uh, uh, of your conclusion. So you're thinking that all the fungi should be able to make it, so it's hard to say that some might be um, selected for versus others? 
Yeah, I, I said th th this is probably the most common com uh, cell wall component in the fungal uh, kingdom. Yeah. So I, I, I don't see where the, uh, uh, the acquisition of beta-glucan has made any difference because all of them have it. Well, I think, um, I think that's a really interesting point. I think that um, when people were first looking at beta-1,3-glucan, um, the, the species they happened to look at, and they did, a, I mean, people did amazing surveys of a lot of species. The species they happened to look at um, did have that ability. But as more surveys have been done, we do find those groups that lack the gene also, we don't see evidence for the beta-1,3-glucan. And, um, and I'll, I'll grant you those more ancient phyla are generally rare in the soil, so they're harder to pick up. So I'm not surprised that when people were first looking at its distribution that, that they didn't see this, its absence. Um, but it, it does seem like there are some fungi that cannot make it. It's a more recent um, evolutionary event. I'll ask you later, OK? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. I was very intrigued by your proposed feedback that increased nitrogen could decrease CO2 flux yeah. and soil carbon storage. I'm wondering how you would reconcile that with like Michelle Mack's work where long-term fertilization sort of enabled the decomposition of all these old root tissues. And yeah, so that, there's all these right. So that was her work up in um, Tulip, right? Yeah, so I think people talk about that a lot because they think about the nitrogen fertilization, but at the same time they were adding nitrogen, it was mixed together with phosphorus fertilization. I think, um, I think you wouldn't know that until you looked at the methods. So it's not exactly this um, just pure nitrogen, uh, pure nitrogen response. Um, but I think that definitely the soil carbon responses to nitrogen are incredibly complex and um, they vary a lot among the ecosystems. And I think that's because there's a lot of different processes that go into it, and there are many different microbes that are involved. And so it's very difficult to predict. So I'm hoping that if we can focus on just this one process by the mycorrhizal fungi, at least we'll get a better understanding of that. But again, it's, it's very hard to consider all of them all together. Yeah. I think in general, microbes are very talented at getting nitrogen. So <laughs> yeah. you expect them less, to be less likely to be nitrogen limited. And so I, th yeah. I think it your feedback makes sense. Yeah, in fact, um, I, you know, I thought that in general, you know, there was this paradigm for quite a while in ecosystem ecology that microbes were nitrogen limited. So if you added nitrogen, you'd see an increase in their just total abundance. That doesn't actually happen very often. When you go look at the studies, they tend to get knocked out in general. So yeah, this, that was surprising to me as well. Tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más. No sé si alguno de los participantes. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I would like to ask you about your forecast for yeah. tropical deserts versus very wet places. For example, here in Mexico, we have a, a the southernmost desert in the in the north latitude right. that is called Tehuacan. It's a very dry place, and perhaps less than 30 miles from there, there is a super humid place. Yeah. In, close to the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. What do you think that it will be like the strongest component for the composition of the community of fungi? Either the dryness of the Tehuacan Desert or, or the proximity to the southernmost latitudes? And what do you think would happen in yeah. the humid side of this? I, I think that's so neat. I think that when we have these really strong delineations between the climate types and we might see a movement of, of climate zone one into the other. I think that's where you're gonna find these real changes in the fungal community composition. And you know, if they are sensitive to drought, like it seems, there really could be a change. And I think that's exactly the place to study it, where you have these really extreme areas in such close proximity. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. And one more is, what do you think would happen with the your cycle of feedbacks in those areas, no? See, if you have more, well, more rain in a place that is in, almost in the same latitude, right. and you have the control just out, just the other side of the mountain range, no? And yeah. Then you have this. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, no, I think that that's, I think it's entirely possible. And one of the things that I'm really interested in situations like that is whether fungi could actually migrate. If they, you know, they can be carried on the wind and if they could move from one place to another, where, you know, maybe these wetter areas could be a reservoir for, um, you know, occupying the new ecosystem if the climate changes. And yeah, so I think those are really neat. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. And, and I was like quite amazed that most tropical America was like not survey. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know. And I know. Mexico was. I know. Yeah, I know. I uh, yeah. So I'm hoping Adriana, my PhD student, will help rectify that. The thing, what happened here is, uh, and and I do find this embarrassing. Um, you know, I worked with a collaborator, and he's the one who got the soil samples. And what he did was he wrote to all of his friends and ask them to go out and collect soil <laughs> from their nearest ecosystem and send them to him. And so you can see where his friends lived. <laughs> so, um, so it's a real shame that we didn't have more, um, more sampling in South America and other places. We could have definitely used it, especially, I mean, this whole tropical forest here. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I think that there's a lot of improvement to be made. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. It was wonderful talking to you. Muchas gracias. Muy bien, para continuar con nuestro programa, bueno, antes de eso quisiera invitarlos a no traer café adentro de la sala. Y después, para continuar con nuestro programa, nuestro siguiente invitado es David Libson. Él se graduó de Ciencias Ambientales con Orientación en Microbiología de la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Obtuvo su doctorado en Ecología Microbiana en la Universidad de Colorado. Actualmente es profesor en San Diego State University y su investigación va desde ciclos biogeoquímicos, dinámica de suelo, ecología microbiana hasta cambio global. Tiene interés especial en cómo es que los microbios afectan procesos biogeoquímicos y cómo esta respuesta microbiana puede retroalimentar procesos ecosistémicos globales. Demos la bienvenida. All right, thank you again for the invitation and for taking such good care of us. And thanks to Kathleen for the perfect introduction to my talk. Uh, so you already know how important fungi are and talking about how they could mediate feedbacks between climate change and how ecosystems respond. Uh, and that'll be a key theme as well for me. So I'm going to be talking about more uh, local ecosystems, ones that are at least uh, similar to what you find around here and in San Diego County, uh, Southern California shrublands. And we'll, I'm going to tell you two stories today, uh, both about how microbial communities respond to aspects of global change and how that can alter ecosystem functioning. So I prepared this talk for a fairly general uh, audience that maybe doesn't already know that soil microbial communities are incredibly important. But, uh, first of all, they dominate most of evolutionary space, at least in terms of, uh, if you look at it in terms of ribosomal RNA sequences, you can see that it's all, you know, prokaryotes, prokaryotes, and even most of the eukaryotes here are, are microscopic, are microorganisms. Like Kathleen mentioned, incredibly important, binding together soil particles, maintaining carbon in the soil and helping plants grow. There's, uh, this is a picture of bacterial biofilms growing on plant roots. A lot of these are, uh, promote the growth of, bacteria, of uh, plants. And of course, there are this, the diversity of microbial communities is something we're still trying to figure out. So one gram of soil has a billion cells and, oh, who knows, maybe 50,000 species. It's really hard to say. With a better sequencing technology, we're maybe getting some better answers, if you can even define a bacterial species in the first place. Fungi is, well, extremely diverse, maybe not quite as much as bacteria, but still more than we can currently describe. And impressive amount of biomass. So 
if you think about hundreds of meters of, of hyphae in a gram, right, so if you untangle all the, the fungi, it stretches for 100 meters in just one gram of soil. So very impressive. And we know very little about most of these things. We can culture a, a fraction from the environment. We know they're active in the soils, but most of them, we haven't figured out how to keep them happy in the laboratory. So we do these DNA-based surveys, and those are getting very powerful. The problem is that we still don't know that much more about these species. We just know that they're there from these molecular techniques. But we do know how important they are in biogeochemical cycles. So uh, and again, Kathleen already gave a wonderful introduction of how fungi can drive parts of soil respiration in the carbon cycle, and, and they're very active in nitrogen cycle, other cycles. And so a key question in microbial ecologies, how are these poorly described microbial communities, how do they contribute to larger level pra uh, processes, ecosystem function? What are they doing there? Why do they matter? Why do microbial ecologists have jobs? So this is uh, from the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change. I think it's, no, not the latest, I'm sorry. This, I can't keep up with those guys. This is a carbon cycle from the IPCC. And the main point, this is very small text and lots of arrows. The arrows in red are human impacts on the carbon cycle. Um, the black ones are attempts to estimate the carbon cycle uh, in the absence of major human influence. But a couple things I want to talk about are the fluxes out of, into and out of terrestrial ecosystems. So photosynthesis is coming in here, about 123 gigatons carbon per year, mostly matched by soil respiration, which is a combination of plants and microbes in the soil. And you'll notice that that flux is, it's mostly in balance, but it's order of magnitude greater than what humans are producing in the air. Uh, we're up to about eight gigatons of carbon per year. There's much more than that cycling through ecosystems, both on land and in sea. And so subtle balances in the way that soils, the ecosystems process carbon, have a big impact on the carbon cycle. And of course, there's much more stored here than, so currently our stock in the atmosphere is 589 gigatons of carbon. And in the soils, there's uh, several times more than that. You know, especially now that you include the revised estimates for permafrost, a lot of that is starting to melt. And so that carbon could become more available for cycling and going into the atmosphere. So. So predictions of future climate change have a lot of uncertainty. And so these are various scenarios depending on our fossil fuel use, our population size. But even within a scenario, you can see a lot of uncertainty. And a lot of that is driven by these biological feedbacks. So increased temperature, how does that affect the way the ecosystem functions, does that increase or decrease carbon dioxide, methane, greenhouse gases. And so models are trying hard to incorporate these biological feedbacks and uh, reduce some of this uncertainty. And so soil microbes are one key component. Here is the aggregate, the combined uncertainty of all these feedbacks. In general, they're mostly positive feedbacks. So a positive feedback, sometimes I'm reminded to tell audiences that's not a good thing, right? That's accelerating the rate of change. So it's a vicious cycle. So everything on this side of zero is an effect, a feedback that's amplifying climate change. So for every little bit of elevated CO2 or increase in temperature, these components of the ecosystem speed up climate change a little bit. And I'm concerned in particular with things like soil decomposition. Net primary productivity is uh, also a result of how nitrogen cycling, uh, the water cycle, how all these things change. But 
I'm particularly interested in climate effects on soil decomposition and also CO2 effects. So you can see here these negative feedbacks are the so-called CO2 fertilization effect in plants. Plants can soak up some of the excess CO2, um, but at the same time, they're exuding more carbon into the soils, like Kathleen was just talking about, that can prime decomposition of organic matter and actually contribute to loss of soil carbon at the same time. So at the moment, we think all these things add up to a positive feedback, but there's a fair amount of uncertainty. So, so these are the two components of my talk. Uh, they both concern feedbacks, uh, microbial responses to climate change or to human disturbance. First, I'm going to talk about elevated carbon dioxide on the fungal communities in the chaparral, well, both bacterial and fungal. And then I'll talk about the impact of invasive plants uh, in a coastal sage scrub environment. So the first study was carried out at Sky Oaks Field Station in San Diego County. Um, this is a face ring uh, built by Walter Schell and his co-workers a long time ago. Uh, that's a free air CO2 enrichment. So this is a shrubland. It's dominated by Adenostoma fasciculatum. And uh, so this is one experimental approach to looking at how ecosystems respond to elevated CO2. Earlier work was just done in chambers. It's easier to control carbon dioxide in a little tent. But there are more artifacts. You change relative humidity and uh, a lot of other things. This, on the other hand, is very expensive. You have to constantly pump out carbon dioxide. It senses the wind direction and releases CO2 so that the ambient CO2 here is, in this case, we went for 550 parts per million on average. So there's some statistics for this face ring. And this is a much smaller experiment compared to the, the major face rings that are replicated across the landscape. It, places like uh, Harvard Forest. and um, This was done sort of in-house uh, for as little money as possible. And so we would have liked to have these rings replicated all over the landscape. But because I'm studying microbial things, I felt I could get away with this vast landscape in here from a microbial point of view. And you'll see this is a very patchy ecosystem. This had burned not too long ago in the past before this experiment. And so you can see these relatively small shrubs and then bare ground. And so that'll become important when I interpret my data because I, I was forced to use a very small amount of this very small experimental manipulation. But I had to deal with spatial variability on a micro scale. But it did operate for quite a long time, from 1995 to 2003, before we ran out of money for all the CO2. It was something like. And I keep saying we. This is mostly Walter Schell's project. I got hired in 2001. I just barely took advantage of this opportunity. But I think he was costing him $40,000 a year for CO2. But don't worry, it was industrial CO2 that had been captured. So we weren't polluting that much in this experiment. The CO2 would have already been in the atmosphere, but they recaptured it, and we brought it to Sky Oaks. And then we uh, used. There was a control ring, but it turned out that the soil properties there were completely different, it had higher clay. And so to really have a better control, I used the surrounding landscape. And that also gave me a better idea of the natural spatial variability in this ecosystem. Um, so at the time, this shows how old this project was. We're over 400 parts per million now, but at the time it was around 380. Oh, there's Walt. Hats off to Walt. So the first thing we found, and this is uh, common among most of these uh, CO2 enrichment experiments, is that the below ground portions of plants respond more than above ground. This makes sense for wild plants. They're not usually carbon limited. They're water limited. They're nitrogen limited. Um, and so they can invest this extra carbon below ground, grow roots, get more resources, more nitrogen, more phosphorus, more water. And so the red bars are the face. And in all these uh, size categories, coarse roots, fine roots, total roots, uh, mainly the ones that are 
right next to the uh, right next to the plant, I was trying to deal with spatial variability. So I was sampling directly under the canopy of plants and then in gaps. And so 30 centimeters away from the plant, not a lot of root biomass and not a big response. But in general, total root biomass roughly doubled with elevated CO2. And so this is important. This is going to drive the responses of the soil microbes. The average CO2 concentration in a soil is already orders of magnitude higher than what you see in the atmosphere, right? So changing the atmospheric CO2 concentration won't affect directly the, the soil microbes, but it alters the plant allocation and therefore what the microbes are eating. So to deal with the spatial variability problem, I mainly use these analysis of covariance. So we see spatial variability the soil organic matter was a really good predictor of all of my microbial variables. So the easiest way for me to take advantage of this small experimental area was to control for variation in soil organic matter and look at the two different treatments. And you see increased microbial biomass per unit total soil organic matter in these elevated CO2 treatments. Although more subtle differences in this measure, which is um, the previous graph was just chloroform fumigation extraction. You basically nuke everything and measure how much carbon comes out. This is a substrate-induced respiration. It's the uh, metabolic potential of the microbes, and not as much difference there, not significant. But this gave me a hint that it wasn't just the amount of biomass that was changing, the metabolism of the biomass was changing. So I have a few different indices showing, for example, in the face plots, a, uh, this metabolic quotient, so showing the uh, total amount of respiration coming out versus their potential. So the glucose SIR, we feed them as much sugar as they want, see how much they respire, compare that to the amount that they are respiring without added substrate. And the face plots are more metabolically active. They're closer, they have a higher percentage of their potential respiration, so they're better fed. Um, and this also can include root respiration as well. So there's also more root respiration likely in these plots. Similarly, if we look at the specific respiration rate, so per unit biomass, how much can they produce? How much carbon dioxide are they producing? This is very important because we want to know the microbial community, how much is it contributing to soil respiration or how much can it sequester carbon, keep it in the soil. And we had this evidence that per unit biomass, this community in elevated CO2 plots was actually respiring less. So good evidence that they were in a different physiological state or maybe there were different species there. So I wanted to investigate that. There was also a different expression of extracellular enzymes. These are enzymes breaking down cellulose, so very important for organic matter decomposition, higher in the face plots. Same is true for amylase, breaking down starch. So I wanted to see, first of all, how do the bacterial communities respond? These are major phyla, in some cases classes of bacteria. And I was surprised to see that there was really no response in the bacterial community that you could see. These are all essentially identical. Um, if you look in more phylogenetic detail, where we have a phylogenetic tree showing these major bacterial groups, each one of these is a sequence, a ribosomal RNA sequence collected from the soil, it's, you know, collect soil DNA, sequence a bunch of things. You can see red triangles are the face plots, blue dots are control, they're mixed. You can't see any clusters of red or blue on this diagram. And if you do a, a statistical test, you can say that this is essentially random, that pattern. There's, these are the same community just being sampled over and over again. So uh, the soil microbial communities are acting differently. It's not the bacteria. What could it be? Hmm. Obviously, it was fungi. So uh, 
again, this is a fairly crude technique just using uh, microscopic observations of fungal life and fungal hyphae length and uh, converting that to biomass. It was, and now on the x-axis we have total microbial biomass. Fungi increased more rapidly with increases in microbial biomass in the face controls, in the face treatments compared to the control. So this is a convoluted way of saying that the face treatment stimulated fungi. This is the way I had to deal with it statistically. And the enzyme rates that we measured in soils were correlated with the fungal biomass. So we can say that the fungi seem to be responsible for these important enzymes that can break down roots, for example, plant tissues. All this stuff was published quite a while ago, back in 2005, and I kept these soils frozen, hoping that someday I'd have funding or an opportunity to look at the fungi. Because I had fungal biomass and I had bacterial, you know, more details on the bacterial community. And uh, fortunately, uh, sometime in between 2005 and now, I ran into Cheryl Kuski at Los Alamos National Laboratory, who is studying fungal communities in CO2 experiments across the United States. And uh, we took some archived frozen soils, and she provided me with lots and lots of fungal sequences. And so I got to really learn a lot about fungi in the process. I didn't know what most of these groups were when I started this project. And this just came out earlier this year in Global Change Biology. Um, don't read the title, it'll give away the surprise. If, but no, okay, I, I'll give away the surprise now and show you the details. The biggest impact of CO2 was on diversity of fungi. There were sort of similar groups present in both of the treatments. Uh, there were subtle differences in terms of were there more or less of these certain fungal groups in one treatment or the other. The most interesting result was that there was elevated diversity in the fungi. So first of all, this fungal community turns out to be very diverse. I tried to compare our study with other comparable studies. This is a, just an index, this Chow 1 indicator, but you can think of it as a estimate of fungal species at our site, 478. The true number is probably higher than that, but that's corrected for the sequencing effort, the number of sequences we had. And uh, again, you can see here the control plots are white dots, elevated CO2 dark dots, and the gray dots are fungal types that showed up in both treatments. So there are some areas where you can see some concentrations of black dots. For example, these Eurotiales, Eurotiales. Um, but for the most part, it's a fairly random pattern. But you can probably see more black dots than white dots. Now we're zooming in on just the uh, non-ascomycetes. Um, you can see in general, there's, uh, there may be some concentrations here and there of uh, areas that were stimulated by these face, the elevated CO2 treatment. But let me get quantitative. First of all, just looking at the community structure using principal components, this shows you an amazing amount of spatial variability. These each uh, represent soil samples taken from around the landscape from these, uh, and now again, they were either in control areas, in the elevated CO2 area, directly under plants with higher organic matter, or these gaps that were in the canopies, the bare areas between plants. So the idea of this design was to compare, to encompass as much spatial variability on the landscape. So we already knew that organic matter in the soil was driving most of the microbial variables we looked at. So this was our way of uh, looking at plants versus gaps to look at uh, the full diversity across the landscape. Not a lot of obvious clustering, particularly the uh, gap areas in the, you know, each individual one was very hard to predict. And this principal component, this just shows species abundance in uh, 
let's see here, this is the, uh, essentially just a way of describing these complex communities, their similarities. So these ones are very similar to each other and these are very different. So, um, No clear clustering by either plant type or face treatment. Um, there were, however, some significant differences in the, uh, the community structure. So this is just looking at the most abundant fungal classes, and you can actually see some just barely significant results here in Sordariomycetes, Leosiomycetes. I point these out because, in particular, these, this group here does include a group of fungi that can be mutualistic with plants. Um, these dark septate endophytes, that means they're dark colored, they grow inside roots, and they may or may not be helpful. A recent meta-analysis found that um, at least a certain group of these dark septate endophytes actually seem to provide a growth benefit to their host plants, but they're not quite mycorrhizal, uh, but they, they're somewhere on that continuum between parasitic commensal and mutualistic. So, but it does at least make sense, based on what Kathleen said recently, elevated CO2 increases allocation below ground, that feeds root mutualists. So it makes sense that maybe there's more of these dark septite endophytes. And I certainly observe those in the microscope um, in my initial measurements. But again, to me, the most interesting thing about this project was not a relative abundance of different fungal groups in the treatments, but this overall property of the community, a higher diversity. So looking at uh, the elevated CO2 treatment in the face plots compared to the control plots, here's a rarefaction analysis. You can see overall, oops, sorry, higher diversity in the face plots. And I looked at this a few different ways. Again, this Chow one is, a, is an old method where you look at the number of sequences and what we call operational taxonomic units. Those are sequences that are within, say, 3% of each other is considered the same one. That's an arbitrary cutoff. You can use different similarity numbers. Um, you look at the number of ones that appear a single time in the database versus the ones that appear twice, and you can get an estimate of diversity. And so, in this case, I combined all of the spatial replicates and treated them as single samples. And you can see the face higher than the control. Or we can also take the mean of these individual replicates. And so you can see these smaller numbers here are the average for a single soil sample. These higher numbers are for all the samples combined. But anyway, higher diversity with elevated CO2. And this occurred at multiple levels of complexity. So uh, phase plant, phase gap, control plant, control gap. This was, this trend existed and was actually significant for all these different levels. So the class level all the way down to the genus or what I used actually 98% similarity level, which is very similar to genus. When you're doing molecular studies, it's hard to define a species or a genus, but you can see that what I used for 98% similarity was close to genus. So, um, in general, the triangles are higher than the circles, and for the most part, under the plants, higher than the gaps. So you can really see the influence of plants increasing fungal diversity at all these different levels. And it seems to be driven by the increase in fine roots. So again, I only have 12 points here, but there was a decent correlation between this uh, Shannon index at, in this case I used the uh, diversity index for order, because that was where the, the trend really was the strongest. And uh, you can see a decent correlation. Most of this, you know, R squared, or the R was 0.687. So a fair amount of the variability was um, explained by the amount of fine roots in the soil. Fungi like roots, more roots, more fungi, more species diversity, or more order diversity in this case. 
And uh, by the way, I, I don't think I have a graphic to show this, but not only was the uh, diversity enhanced at all these different levels from class down to genus, but also if you look at the ascomycetes, which were the most abundant group, and everything else, the basidiomycetes and all the other more rare groups, uh, the same trends. It was significant in both cases. So at, across the tree and at multiple levels, higher diversity. So I wanted to just show you a bit of what's contributing to the diversity of these plots. And it makes sense that you would have more fungi that make a living eating plant roots, either mutualistic or decomposing plants. But the diversity seems to, uh, what do they say, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, if you look at, I'm trying to infer the lifestyle of these fungi based on their sequences and their closest relatives, but the most abundant one is actually a pathogen of other fungi, right? So as you increase fungal diversity, um, it makes sense that uh, you would have pathogens of fungi, parasites on fungi would also uh, would benefit. And apparently there's some literature now saying that parasites can actually be a sign of a healthy ecosystem, that you have these weak interactions, they can help provide coexistence among many species. And so, so actually uh, having a lot of parasites, in this case a parasite of uh, fungi, but also of plants. Um, so, and by the way, uh, I showed you the spatial variability earlier. Turns out there was a, a, a puffball that was found in extreme abundance in just one sample. And for those of you who've ever seen puffballs, you know, little balls that can make billions of spores. So clearly one of my samples had a, a puffball explosion on it. But, but so there's pathogens of insects. Uh, both mutualists and uh, pathogens and parasites on plants and on other fungi and saprotrophs that just degrade organic matter. So uh, it's a very diverse, both uh, taxonomically and functionally, this fungal community. So why do we care? Again, uh, fungi can have important impacts on the soil. Um, they can bind together soil aggregates, stabilize carbon, and help store carbon in the ecosystem. So less goes into the atmosphere, it could help moderate the rates of global change. And shifts towards fungal-dominated communities seem to store more carbon in the soil. That seems to be across ecosystems uh, what people have found, there's more carbon sequestration associated with fungi versus bacteria. And the data I showed you earlier showed that they actually have more efficient respiration rates in this ecosystem. Under elevated CO2, there was a lower metabolic quotient. They were, for the same amount of microbial biomass, producing less CO2. So if the community is producing less CO2 per unit biomass, that could help stabilize carbon in the ecosystem. Interestingly, one place where this trend is re uh, reversed are in agricultural ecosystems, where sometimes uh, in grasslands and agricultural ecosystems, elevated fungal biomass can lead to more rapid carbon loss. But these soils, of course, well, agricultural soils are very disturbed, and so that we have a, probably different fungi altogether. And of course, mycorrhizae, um, this could be a, plant, a positive feedback where if we uh, stimulate the uh, mycorrhizal numbers in the soil, the mycorrhizal biomass, that would benefit the plants. And this feedback could operate through more nutrient uptake by these dark septate endophytes in this ecosystem. And then there's the classic debate in ecology if more diverse communities mean more stable communities. So I tend to think that most microbial communities are so, even the simplest microbial communities are fantastically diverse. But it's an interesting question. Um, would elevated CO2 in this case lead to a more stable fungal community? 
<laughs> right, like I said, parasites are good for you. Parasites can help stabilize the uh, interactions among multiple species. Now, the problem with this study, a key weakness, is that we really only looked at a single factor, elevated CO2. Climate change is multifactorial. Those changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, along with changes in carbon dioxide. And so, how will all those factors interact? I don't know. But one key finding from the study would be that the fungal response will follow the plant root response. So if you can predict how the plant roots are going to respond, you'll probably know what's going to happen to fungal diversity and, and functioning in this ecosystem. OK, so I should take a breath and a drink. I want to change gears and talk about a related study um, where's my pretty picture? I'm only going to give you a small part of this overall story. Uh, I'm working on a collaborative project now to study influences of altered rainfall on our local shrublands. And this shows many possible feedbacks between altered climate and altered functional types. So we have a lot of invasive plants are coming into our shrublands. Um, I don't know if that's as much of a problem down here. It's generally associated with higher population density. So coastal sage scrub, that I'll show you more detail, is a vanishing ecosystem type and being filled with uh, exotic grasses and mustards and other things. And so as these ecosystems are changing from a shrub dominated type to a, you know, a grassland or an annual herbaceous plants, how is that going to affect the ecosystem and how will that interact with uh, climate change. And so we, are, we have some experimental manipulations of rainfall and some other components. I'm going to mainly just focus, I'm going to try to keep this simple. So we have a rainfall manipulation experiment. I'm not going to present results of the rainfall manipulation itself. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about the vegetation differences, because so far those are the most obvious. This is Elsa, who's primarily responsible for uh, us having this grant. She's at UCSD. And she's uh, responsible for the above ground stuff, and I take the below ground stuff. We have these shelters that are three meters by three meters. This is what our native shrubs look like. There's some black sage and some artemisia. And here's a weed plot. So this is a naturally disturbed area. Well, it was disturbed. We don't know the history, but this is in our field station, and there's uh, these big patches of weeds have moved in in between these uh, shrubs. You can see an obvious effect above ground. This is a 50% rainfall plot. This is a 150% rainfall plot. So you can see the weeds like water. I probably didn't need to tell anyone that. This is very predictable. The effect on the, these shrubs that are very drought adapted has been more subtle, and the effect on the microbes has been subtle. I think I'm seeing nitrogen cycling effects, but I'm going to wait one more year before I report that. I want to focus on the plant communities and how they affect the microbes. So you can see these very different, you know, so these are herbaceous weedy vegetation compared to shrubs. So we've been looking at the microbial community and how they function in these two different plot types. Earlier work done primarily by Lizzie Volkovich, uh, who was a, a postdoc in Elsa Cleland's lab and has done other great things. I think now she's at Harvard. Showed that grass, particularly uh, one of the common grasses, I think it was mostly bromus, addition of litter completely changed the carbon cycling of the system. So this is a, a detailed carbon cycle that we put together for a relatively uninvaded system versus one that's invaded by grasses. The overall size of this box shows there's more carbon, more coming in, more going out, mostly through root respiration. The changes in the microbes were more subtle. But there was increased carbon storage in response to her. Uh, she actually moved litter around, and her litter addition experiments increased the amount of carbon in the soil. That's shown here. She showed increased grass litter cover, 
changes in carbon and nitrogen over uh, the three years of this experiment. And this changed the important aspects of the microbial community. So altered the decay rate and altered the, uh, also increased the fungal to bacterial ratio. So the fungi responded to the grass litter and actually had a slower decomposition rate on this new litter type. So here is some newer data from our, our uh, the rainfall experiment, again, excluding the rainfall treatments, just looking at the vegetation treatments. We followed microbial biomass in these plots, and it's very seasonally dynamic. And in, the de in December, when we had, there was actually a, an increase in the biomass in the shrub plots relative to the weed plots in December and June, but it switched in March. So there's this complex seasonal pattern, excuse me, that I don't fully understand yet, but uh, this provides an opportunity to look at some of the differences that are being driven by the vegetation difference. So also some metabolic differences. Again, these things follow the seasonal trends only in the inverse pattern. Higher specific respiration rate, so that means more rapid respiration by microbes in the weed plots in December and June. And this is a, a related quantity, their growth rate. You can take the entire soil and look at growth of biomass in the laboratory, and you can see that as a whole, the microbial biomass has a higher growth rate, and that contributes to a more rapid respiration rate. So you can see the biggest differences were observed in December, and so we're starting to look at how this fits in with the microbial community. And so just now looking at uh, that December soils where we saw the largest differences in function, can we relate that to, in this case, the bacterial community? This data is just now being processed. We also have the data for the rest, the other months, um, but it hasn't been processed yet. These are metagenomes. This means we're taking all the soil DNA and randomly sequencing it. The past, I showed you marker genes that were just ribosomal RNA. These are all the genes. At the moment, I'm just showing you taxonomic data. But we can go into the same data set and look for functional genes as well, and that will be very interesting. We haven't done that yet. Um, so far, the differences are fairly subtle, but the two most abundant groups seem to be switched in their abundance. So these are actinobacteria, uh, gram-positive, mostly filamentous bacteria that are more abundant in the weed plots. Proteobacteria, the classic gram-negative bacteria, seem to be more abundant in the shrub plots. And when I at least, uh, if you look at each individually, it's marginally significant, significant together in a multiple ANOVA. Together they are significant, and this ratio of proteobacteria to actinobacteria has significantly changed in these two vegetation types, at least for this initial analysis. It looks like there are some changes. They're subtle, but these are probably uh, related in some way to the changes we're seeing in the metabolism. I would have predicted the exact opposite. The, for December, the weed samples seem to be growing more rapidly and uh, being more active. Most people would cla uh, generally classify the proteobacteria as the faster growing, uh, more active, more R-selected types, and these guys as being more slow growing, but it's hard to make generalizations in the microbial world. They'll surprise you. But, um, okay. So, there's a few other interesting functional differences that we've seen between these two vegetation types. One is there's a clear difference in the microclimate. You saw these exposed areas that have the weeds, and these, the shrubs provide a nice canopy. It's shadier. And so I have a student who looked at soil respiration continually, well, as continually as she could without the equipment breaking. And, uh, 
and you can ask Alex about this. He has a very similar thesis in mind to Marguerite's, but we found that we had uh, plots that were dominated by the shrubs, plots that were dominated by the weeds, and you can see um, a hotter microclimate in the weedier areas. So invaded versus shrub temperature differences of a few degrees. There's Marguerite. These are her robots. They, uh, she was actually separating out the components of respiration into uh, that produced by plant roots and that produced by the soil microbes. This was a just approach using these collars, these PVC collars that were hammered down into the soil to sever the roots. It's not perfect, but it gives us a, an idea of those two different components, the, the plant roots versus the microbes. And this is a busy graph, but in general, what Marguerite found, first of all, understanding the temperature response of respiration in a dry ecosystem it's very hard. You have to take into account water. Water is the most important thing, obviously. So it was very hard to figure out what the temperature response was because usually soil moisture was the overriding effect. So she divided up her different components, total respiration, which includes plant roots, heterotrophic respiration, just microbes, invaded plots, shrub plots, Respiration rates versus different temperature at different water content uh, regimes. So really, you only see a positive response to temperature when there's water in the soil. So these uh, blue and red clusters show you the periods of time when there's soil moisture. Otherwise, it's later in the summer, and hotter temperatures mean drier soils, and they're just stressed out. But what you'll notice here is that there's a difference in the temperature response between the invaded and the shrub. So if you compare this slope, this y equals 0 0.11, 0 0.085, at both of these moister water regimes. So there was a more rapid response to temperature in the invaded areas. This makes sense because the microbes are exposed to hotter temperatures. So um, perhaps they're acclimating. But again, that's something that could be a very important feedback. Altered temperature response that comes with a uh, change in the plant community. Okay, so to conclude, um, this part of the study. Altered plant litter and microclimate have changed the microbial community. And not just who's there, but what they're doing. So different growth rates, respiratory kinetics. So this means for the same amount of biomass, they could be respiring different amounts. So very important. This helps justify, you know, my job. If it matters that the species of microbes in the soil matter because they're altering the rates of carbon dioxide, then, then we need to keep studying it. Uh, so far, at least in December and in June, although this changes seasonally, there was a smaller, more active pool of biomass um, and altered responses of temperature. So the long-term soil carbon balance implications, it's harder to guess. Um, certainly, uh, there's the chance that the temperature response, for example, as we're getting both a warmer climate and more invasive plants, that could be a positive feedback because the soil microbes are respiring at more rapid rates at higher temperatures. On the other hand, uh, and also this more active pool of biomass could lead to higher CO2 per unit biomass. So maybe this means less carbon storage in the ecosystem. On the other hand, the plants are contributing all this litter. Um, these are annual plants as opposed to the perennial shrubs we have, and uh, short-term studies show that the litter seems to accumulate in the soil. But then there's one other thing, which is fire. Uh, these systems tend to be more flammable, and so if we have more fuel 
and then they burn more frequently, what happens to all that carbon? So hence the question mark. And overall, just to tie these two things together and to really amplify what, what Kathleen already told you, that soil microbial communities can be very important in mediating responses of ecosystems to climate change. Uh, and they can have very individualistic responses. So I will stop there and take questions. Gracias. Tenemos tiempo para tres preguntas. Si alguien quiere hacer una pregunta en español, aquí tenemos a alguien que pueda traducir al, al ponente. Any questions? Hi David. Hi Alex. Uh, well, my, my question is: you 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 just have told us that we can know who have been there with these genomist, genomist techniques, and we can measure uh, what are they doing with these soil respiration chambers. But how could we know who are doing the, the, the respiration, who is, who, is, who is active? Because with this, I don't know, with, maybe with viral sequencing, uh, you just take the DNA from the soil, and I mean, uh, there, there could be dead microbes or they, their, their leaves, but yes. how could we know who is, who is working? That's a really good point. In fact, just looking at this data back here, one thing that really struck me is I need to look at the RNA in addition to the DNA because uh, there could, it could be very seasonally dynamic who's actually active with this population. Now, you, you talked about dead microbes. I do believe that DNA really captures viable microbes, that if you have a genome, you have a more or less a viable microbe. The DNA does turn over pretty quickly. Um, so I, I think that uh, the DNA, all this study is based on the DNA, and it represents the potentially active community, and it's going to change relatively slowly. But I completely agree that, and, and I really hope to actually look at the expression of these genes to see who is active. And I think looking at ribosomal RNA, the actual expression of ribosomal RNA as opposed to just the presence of these genes is something that can really help us understand, particularly because there's such a high amount of seasonal variability in, um, in the metabolism of these soils. So I've been afraid of working with RNA a little bit because it's tricky. You know, RNA just, you look at it funny and it degrades, but, uh, but I think it's, it's important. Now, I did hear on the other side of that argument, someone pointed out to me recently that sometimes the RNA can be too labile, it can turn over too quickly, that there might be changes in a day, you know, that you, know, you might be looking at too fine of a time scale. And I thought that was an interesting argument. I never really considered that. I sort of figured DNA is on a year or month time scale, RNA on a day to week time scale. But um, I don't know if anyone has done a really fine time scale analysis with lots of RNA to see, does it change day to night, <laughs> uh, every day? Could you just, if you, and we're not going to have enough money to sequence the RNA every hour. <laughs> um, so. But, but in general, I agree that we need to look at the activity. But I do believe that the DNA shows us something very important. Especially now, I'm looking forward to investigating the functional genes. This is just the broadest analysis. Um, but this, again, defied my expectations of how the soil was acting and who was there. And so if we could actually see um, this might be a temperature response. The actinobacteria tend to be more extremophiles. They can grow in dry soils, more intense radiation, for example. And so that might be the largest selection here is that they're um, exposed to the sun more than in the shrub plots, and therefore we see more actinobacteria. But, but anyway, I think RNA is the answer. Really, what a 
compliment you for the attention to diversity in the talk. It was appreciated. And the use of the word was also appreciated, by the way. <laughs> uh, this is a technical comment about the means that you're using to make comparative assessments of diversity. Um, we can do better for you. Uh, Chow One is first generation, we've got third generation now, and it's just mean, it's great. <laughs> Chow One is full of biases, and some of them will affect the, re re the results that you actually got very deeply suspicious. Uh, you've shown in your own analyses that we ought to be suspicious of things like Chow One, and we ought to advance to the third set of Chow uh, measurements, which are all uh, available freely online. You know, I can show you, you know, a little bit about where to go. Can they be applied to uh, sequence data pretty easily? Uh, I, I, I'd have to look in detail, right. but if you can apply Chow One and Chow Two and stuff, you can apply these modern ones because they are quite parallel. They're meant to replace in a sequence one, two, three. She started and in in this work, and she finished in the middle 90s. Um, and I don't see how we can ever get better. But, but particularly with fungi, which I've looked at, there are some spectacular uh, insecurities because they are so diverse, they are so unbelievably diverse, that it's possible that none of them are any good. But we, <laughs> could t we can tell that too now. And the other thing was the Shannon Weaver, the Shannon Weiner function that, or d dense, uh, measurement that you used conflates the number of things with their equiabund with their, the with evenness. their equivalence, or their equivalents, as how evenly distributed are they in the census. And we've got tools to handle that too now. So talk to me later, but I, I'm saying this as a comment because there's students back there <laughs> and I want them to go looking, or I'll be glad to help them too, looking for the most advanced tools because I think what you're doing is so important and it it, it moves over into other people's work too, and they ought to be using those more advanced tools as well. Thank you, and this was a, a new area for me in that I hadn't really contemplated diversity. To me, it was almost magical because it's this emergent it property of the whole community, <laughs> and it was, it was popping up. You know, I, would, I assumed it would come from one group that just went crazy in the elevated CO2 treatment, but it was spread out over the entire tree at all these different levels, and so, to me, it just seemed like this, uh, yeah, almost a mystical property. I can say, uh, even though the Chow One is an ancient tool, I, I was using relatively recent software that, so uh, Caldwell makes this program called Estimate Yeah, I know Estimate, Caldwell. Estimate I know S. Estimate S, And yes. so, at least, uh, I used that program, and it would make suggestions about, based on your data, what were the most appropriate metrics. And so, yeah. at least, I used a, uh, it was a, Caveman technique, but in a revised version. <laughs> yeah, Rob, Rob does a great job with that, um, but he can't do a great job with Chow One. It's just biased. <laughs> it's heavily biased, and it has exactly the biases that, you do, that you've said you don't want to have. It, can, it retains those biases, and, and it's just as easy to use the others. If you can use one, you can use three. Well, thank you. I, I'd love to talk to you about that. Again, Great. like I said, this is, I, I was very happy I got this paper Pleasure. published because I knew I'd get hammered by people that knew more about fungi and diversity. Well, the worst and things so, uh, which you didn't do at all were just to count the raw data and report that. Um, and the second worst thing, I think, is to do the minimum, you know, cutting everything down to the smallest size, mm -hmm. the words for that, but they're, statis they're statistically efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially invite the ecologist to throw out most of the good data that he or she has spent years collecting. Right. And, and estimates, or estimate S, uh, does provide a, an extrapolation algorithm that Caldwell seems to be very proud of. <laughs> and so I have used that, I, in, uh, I believe, in this. It could be mine. I don't know. But maybe it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you that, too. All right. Well, thank you very much. Tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más. Are you entertaining the possibility that the microbial community will correct some of the uh, excesses caused by humankind? <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, I keep 
finding um, the lack of bad news in my studies. You know, often people are looking for positive feedbacks so will continue to cause things to spiral out of control. And uh, I think we have plenty of bad news. Like, uh, I, I, see, I don't see any of my results solving our biggest problems. But there are examples of, uh, so this is one nice benefit of elevated CO2, fungal diversity increased. Uh, is that going to save this ecosystem? Probably not. Uh, the, uh, it's just often to try to increase the impact of our work, we look for the most devastating possible consequences. And so far, I haven't found those in my work. Uh, like I said, there's plenty of bad news. I'm very worried about climate change as a whole, and we don't seem to be reversing it nearly fast enough. But uh, our ecosystems tend to be self-stabilizing, as long as you don't kick them very hard. So uh, will our soils, will the terrestrial ecosystems be able to absorb all the CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere? No, they, they can't. They, they're taking up a couple gigatons of carbon per year now, and over time, that's probably going to diminish. Um, there's limits to that. Ecosystems tend to be nitrogen limited, not carbon limited. So there's only so much that soil can sequester and that plants can sequester. There's plenty of time <laughs> for microbes to do the job. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I first gave a version of this talk to a, a group of conservation biologists, and one of them came up to me afterwards and asked if people were uh, angry at me for saying that anything positive could come out of climate change, like increased diversity, you know, and, because you know who knows someone could take this out of context and say, look, it's good for you, it's good for ecosystems. You know, there, there are people that promote the idea that elevated CO2 is great for agriculture, excuse me. And, uh, you know, so it's quite possible this could be taken out of context, but it's not going to fix the ecosystem. I'm interested in the biology of it, you know. But. Bueno, ahora vamos a agradecer a David Lipson por su plática, el Departamento de Biología de la Conservación del Centro de Investigación Científica y Educación Superior de otorga el presente constancia a David Lidson por su participación. Muy bien, ahora vamos a pasar a nuestro coffee break, si quieren pasar afuera, eh, ya está todo preparado para ustedes, volvemos en 20 minutos y les invitamos a no entrar a la sala con bebidas y galletas.
En verde se prende. Buenos días, pues vamos a reanudar otra vez las pláticas y para con, continuar con nuestro programa, eh, les voy a dar una breve introducción de nuestra siguiente invitada, ella es la doctora María Concepción García Aguilar, ella es bióloga de profesión con estudios de maestría en manejo de recursos marinos en el Centro Interdisciplinario de Ciencias Marinas del Instituto Politécnico Nacional, y doctorada en Ecología Marina en el CICES. Desde 2001 es investigadora adjunta en el Departamento de Biología de la Conservación, llevando a cabo estudios sobre ecología y conservación de mamíferos marinos, particularmente en pinípedos. Entonces, démosle la bienvenida a la doctora María. Eh, buenos días. Creo que ahí se oye bien, ¿verdad? Bueno, la plática que les voy a dar hoy, primero que nada, gracias por, por asistir. Ese es un esfuerzo muy grande que están haciendo los estudiantes del posgrado, entonces creo que es algo muy, muy importante que los estemos apoyando y que les agradezcamos la oportunidad que nos dan a todos los que estamos como ponentes y a todos los que están como asistentes de poder participar en un, en un evento como este, que además es la primera vez que se hace. Entonces, es una felicitación a todos los estudiantes del, del posgrado que se han esforzado tanto por, este, por organizar este simposio, este primer simposio. Bueno, la plática que les voy a dar hoy se trata sobre especies en riesgo, listas rojas y conservación. Ahí está. Bueno, eh, en, no alcanzo a ver allá, entonces mejor voy a ver acá. El convenio sobre la diversidad biológica, eh, en, en la edición del 2010 que presentan la perspectiva mundial sobre la biodiversidad, para los que no están muy familiarizados con esto, este es un convenio que firman más de 190 países en el mundo para tratar de frenar la pérdida de la biodiversidad y en el 2002 eh, se plantean varias metas para detener esta pérdida. 
En el 2010 se hace una primera evaluación, ya que se plantearon estas metas de 2002 a 2008. En el 2010 se hace la evaluación para ver qué tantas de estas metas se han cumplido y tristemente así es como empieza el reporte que presenta este, este convenio. Que no se han alcanzado las metas que se acordaron y que eh, sigue habiendo una reducción importante en cuanto a la diversidad a nivel mundial. Eh, desafortunadamente la mayoría de los países no han cumplido con las metas que se habían propuesto, eh, casi todos los indicadores que tiene la convención indican que no ha habido un eh, desarrollo significativo en las estrategias de conservación y reducción de la pobreza. Entonces de ahí derivan este problema de que seguimos con una pérdida muy grande de biodiversidad. Entre las cosas que menciona el, este, esta convención, bueno, eh, ellos plantean en grandes términos eh, la conservación desde dos puntos de vista principales, la conservación de hábitats y ecosistemas y la conservación de especies y poblaciones. En el primero, eh, los resultados, las conclusiones que ellos presentan, entre las principales, son muchas más, pero entre las principales, bueno, es que los hábitats naturales de todo el mundo se siguen deteriorando. Y además que las cinco presiones principales que están afectando a las tasas de pérdida de biodiversidad, no solamente no se han eh, reducido, sino que se han incrementado. ¿sí? O sea, estas presiones es el cambio climático, la degradación de hábitat, la contaminación, la, eh, especie, la introducción de especies invasoras y eh, la fragmentación y la sobreexplotación. Perdón. Entonces, estas cinco se han ido incrementando, no solamente han disminuido. En términos de las especies y poblaciones, dicen que de las especies de las que hay una evaluación a nivel global que estaban amenazadas, el riesgo se ha incrementado, o sea, no han bajado su nivel de riesgo de extinción, sino al contrario, se ha ido incrementando. Y que los anfibios y las especies de coral son los dos grupos animales más amenazados a nivel mundial y de aparte mencionan que cerca de un cuarto de las especies vegetales están en peligro de extinción. Y finalmente, hablando ya de vertebrados, entre 1970 y 2006, que es la evaluación que ellos están haciendo, dicen que las, la abundancia de las especies de vertebrados se ha reducido considerablemente, significativamente, hasta un tercio y sigue decreciendo a nivel mundial. Es decir, no ha habido ninguna mejora ni en conservación de hábitats y ecosistemas, ni tampoco de especies y poblaciones. Bueno, ¿cómo llegan a esa…? A, antes que eso, yo trabajo con mamíferos, entonces yo me voy a enfocar hacia vertebrados primero y después voy a usar a los mamíferos como un caso de estudio. ¿okay? Entonces, dentro de este reporte que presenta la, la convención, eh, presentan el estado de conservación de los vertebrados a nivel mundial y el, planeta, el índice del planeta viviente lo que indica, en esta gráfica lo que indica es que entre 1970 y el 2006 hubo un decremento del 31% de las poblaciones de vertebrados a nivel mundial. Esta tasa de, de reducción es mucho más eh, muy pronunciada en los trópicos, en donde alcanza casi el 60%, la reducción de los tamaños de las poblaciones. ¿Sí? Y en las especies templadas ha habido una, una mejora aproximadamente del 15%. Por otra parte, eh, en un trabajo que presenta Hoffman y sus colaboradores en el 2010, presentan ellos la, el estado de conservación de los vertebrados también a nivel mundial. Eh, aquí el, ellos se calculan el índice de la lista roja, que este índice lo que nos va a hablar es sobre eh, la tasa de pérdida de biodiversidad. ¿sí? Entonces, lo que están ellos mostrando es que entre 1980 y el 2008 hubo un decremento en el valor del índice entre en aves, anfibios y mamíferos. ¿Sí? Que este valor, que se puede ver claramente, este valor es mucho más marcado, este decremento es mucho más marcado en los anfibios que en los otros dos grupos. ¿sí? Y estas tendencias negativas, lo que nos están indicando es que se está incrementando la tasa de pérdida de biodiversidad. ¿sí? La, la razón a la que se están perdiendo especies en cada uno de estos grupos, ¿sí? siendo los anfibios el grupo en el que podemos ver una mayor tendencia negativa. En el mismo trabajo, Hoffman y sus colaboradores incluyen el estado de conservación de los diferentes grupos de vertebrados. ¿Sí? Estamos viendo los peces cartilaginosos, los peces óseos, anfibios, reptiles, aves y mamíferos. Entonces, en el análisis que ellos hacen, no solamente está la tasa de, de pérdida de diversidad se ha incrementado, sino que aparte estamos viendo niveles de amenaza sumamente altos, particularmente… Ay, perdón, son muy sensibles. ¿Dónde está el mouse?
Ahí está. Ok. Particularmente en los reptiles. ¿sí? Este nivel de amenaza quiere decir que el 40% de las especies de reptiles se encuentran amenazadas, ya sea en peligro crítico de extinción, en peligro de extinción o vulnerables. 40% de las especies, que podría ser más alto, ¿sí? hasta de un, los, perdón, los anfibios, hasta de un 55%. O sea, el intervalo de confianza, que son lo que está entre los paréntesis, eh, nos indica que podría ser que hasta un 55% de las especies de anfibios estén en peligro. Si nos vamos con los mamíferos, la tasa de, perdón, el nivel de amenaza es de un 24%, ¿sí? que podría llegar a ser hasta un 36%, o sea, son sumamente altos. Quiere decir que los niveles de amenaza de todas las especies de vertebrados están muy, muy altos. Bueno, ¿cómo es que se hacen estas evaluaciones de las especies y las poblaciones? Bueno, pues eso se hace basándose en las listas rojas que nos van a dar información sobre el estado de conservación, sobre el riesgo de extinción y sobre la pérdida de biodiversidad. ¿Sí? Y esta información que obtenemos de las listas rojas es la que se puede usar para plantear estrategias de conservación. Es decir, si sabemos cómo están las poblaciones, nuestras poblaciones, entonces podemos priorizar cuáles son los puntos más importantes, no solamente en términos de las especies, sino de sus hábitats. Entonces, esa es la importancia de tener listas rojas, que son una herramienta clave para poder priorizar las acciones de conservación. Bueno, México, eh, bueno, antes de eso, las listas rojas, entonces, ¿qué son? Son estos listados del estado de conservación de las poblaciones de especies que pueden ser a nivel global, como por ejemplo eh, la lista roja de la Unión para, Internacional para la Conservación de la Naturaleza, pueden ser nacionales, por ejemplo, tenemos el, el acta en estado de especies en peligro de Estados Unidos o la NOM 059 en México, pero también pueden ser incluso locales o estatales, hay algunos estados aquí en México que tienen sus propias listas rojas. Entonces, puede hacerse a diferentes escalas geográficas. ¿Para qué nos van a servir? Bueno, para establecer esas prioridades de conservación, para evaluar los impactos que están teniendo las estrategias de conservación, es decir, si nosotros sabemos que el estado de conservación en el tiempo 1 es tal, aplicamos medidas de conservación y vamos a ver si ese estado de conservación se mantiene igual, mejoró o empeoró, entonces nos va a decir, nos va a permitir saber si las estrategias están funcionando o no. Y finalmente, que esa es una de las eh, partes pues, en las que hay mucha… Eh, pérdida de objetividad es que muchas veces las listas rojas simplemente se hacen para dar cumplimiento a compromisos de Estado y acuerdos internacionales. Es decir, a veces no están ni siquiera bien elaboradas, pero se está cumpliendo. Bueno, México, como les decía, ah, todavía no. Bueno, ¿qué características deben cumplir las listas rojas? Este es una, un resumen de hay varios trabajos que se han publicado en, en literatura especializada en revistas de, de conservación, en los que mencionan las características que son obligadas en las listas rojas, que deben contar cualquier lista roja, y hay otras características que son deseables. Dentro de las que tienen que tener cualquier lista roja, tenemos estas, eh, estas seis. ¿sí? La primera es que tienen que estar basadas en, categorías de, en un sistema de categorización del riesgo de extinción. Segundo, la definición de estas categorías no debe incluir elementos subjetivos, es decir, tienen que ser sumamente claras, no deben permitir que haya lugar a dudas de lo que es lo que se trata cada una de las categorías. La tercera es que debe haber una relación clara y explícita entre las categorías de riesgo. Otra cosa muy importante es que las categorías de riesgo deben medir la probabilidad de extinción, de riesgo de extinción en tiempo finito es decir, en tantos años o tantas generaciones. Eso es una parte muy importante porque, a fin de cuentas, estas listas rojas deben estar basadas en análisis científicos, que es lo que sigue, que nos van a estar dando una proyección y nos van a devolver una probabilidad. Entonces, aparte de que tienen que estar basadas en criterios científicos, tienen que tener en cuenta la incertidumbre, es decir, darnos intervalos de confianza. O sea, tenemos que tener en cuenta eso. Y finalmente, es que se debe usar exclusivamente información referente al riesgo de extinción y no mezclarla con prioridades de conservación. Aquí no se trata de ver cuáles son las especies que nos gustaría conservar, se trata de ver cuáles son las especies que están en riesgo, que son dos cosas distintas. ¿Okay? Entonces, estas son las características que cualquier, cualquier lista roja bien hecha debe cumplir. Hay otras más que son deseables, pero estas son las obligadas. Ahora sí, como les decía, México es uno de los 
eh, países que forma parte de la, este convenio para la conservación de la biodiversidad y en el 2014, hace unos meses apenas, presenta su informe ante la convención sobre las estrategias que están desarrollándose para la conservación de hábitats y especies. Dentro de este, este informe, que obviamente lo hace el, el gobierno de la República, bueno, habla particularmente de las especies y hace referencia a la NOM 059 en su nueva versión, que es la del de 2010, y el listado que presentan en marzo de este año de las especies prioritarias, como las dos estrategias del gobierno mexicano para la conservación de especies y poblaciones. Y bueno, aquí le vamos a hacer una pequeña revisión de cuáles, qué tan funcionales son estas dos estrategias y, como les decía, yo trabajo con mamíferos, así que voy a usar los mamíferos como caso de estudio para evaluar estas dos estrategias. Bueno, primero que nada vamos a hablar un poquito, así rápidamente, sobre la diversidad de mamíferos de México. Es uno de los países que va a presentar una mayor diversidad en cuanto al número de especies. ¿Sí? En esta gráfica de acá, la primera, estamos viendo el total de especies de mamíferos, eh, de acuerdo, estos son de acuerdo a los listados de la, de la lista roja de la Unión para la Conservación de la Naturaleza. Y bueno, México ocupa el cuarto lugar a nivel mundial en cuanto al número total de especies, con más de 500. Se reconocen 500, entre 520 y 528 especies actualmente, dependiendo el, el listado taxonómico que estemos viendo. ¿Sí? En cuanto a los endemismos, también es uno de los países que va a presentar una mayor cantidad de especies endémicas, tenemos alrededor de 158 especies, lo mismo varía entre 158 y 162, dependiendo el, el autor y la lista taxonómica que estemos usando. Entonces, somos uno de los países que va a presentar mayor diversidad mundial en cuanto a mamíferos, pero no solo en mamíferos, sino en general en especies de, de vertebrados y de plantas también. Esta gran diversidad de México se debe en gran medida a su ubicación geográfica. México es el único país continental en el cual vamos a tener la unión de dos grandes regiones biogeográficas, la Neártica y la Neotropical. Entonces, estamos en una zona en donde vamos a, estar, eh, donde vamos a encontrar especies que tienen una distribución eh, boreal, Neártica y… Eh, perdón. Por favor, los celulares, me distraigo muy fácil. Este, entonces, les decía, ok, de la neártica, las que tienen la distribución austral, de las neotropicales, las que tienen la distribución boreal, y en el centro hay una zona de transición perfectamente definida, que es la zona de transición mexicana, entre estas dos grandes eh, ecorregiones. Y entonces, esta posición geográfica es la que va a favorecer la alta biodiversidad que tenemos en México y por eso es que se le considera uno de los países megadiversos. Bueno, eh, ¿cuál es, en cuanto al número de órdenes que tenemos, cuáles son los que vamos a encontrar en México? De los 23 eh, órdenes de placentados y los seis órdenes de marsupiales que tenemos, estos son los que vamos a encontrar en México. ¿sí? Eh, lo que les estoy representando ahí con las flechitas y ese 92%, quiere decir que son los cinco órdenes que van a aportar el 92% de la diversidad de México. Obviamente tenemos ahí a los roedores, son los que van a aportar la mayor parte, seguidos de los quirópteros, o sea los murciélagos, luego vienen las musarañas, los carnívoros y los cetáceos. ¿Sí? So, esos son los cinco órdenes, el 92% de las especies de México están ahí. ¿Okay? Bueno, vámonos con la lista roja, de que de eso se trata, eso era nada más para que se den una idea de cuántos mamíferos tenemos y por qué. Bueno, la lista roja, eh, el objetivo de la lista roja, si tal cual como aparece en el Diario Oficial de la Federación, es identificar a las especies de flora y fauna eh, que están en riesgo, especies y poblaciones que están en riesgo. ¿Ok? Bueno, eh, a lo largo de la historia de estos esfuerzos de conservación se han publicado tres versiones. Hay un proyecto que se elaboró en 1993, pero que no se publicó en el Diario Oficial de la Federación. Ya en el 94 se publica la primera lista. Para el 2001 se, hace una, se publica la revisión de la lista del 94 y en el 2010 la revisión de la lista del 2001, supuestamente con el objetivo de mejorar estas esta lista, hacerlas mucho mejores con cada año. 
Eh, en la versión del 2010, bueno, desde el 2001, pero lo recalcan más en el 2010, en la versión del 2010, se establece que la lista está basada en estas categorías de riesgo, que es la de probablemente extinta en medio silvestre, peligro de extinción, amenazada y sujeta a protección especial. Y también se especifica que para incluir, excluir o cambiar de categoría a una especie, se debe aplicar el, un análisis cuantitativo, que es el método de evaluación de riesgo, que se conoce como el MER. Entonces, esas son las condiciones que deben cumplirse para incluirla. Entonces, supuestamente debemos tener un análisis completo para poder decir si una especie está en riesgo o no. Bueno, eh, en el reporte que presenta el Gobierno de México ante la Convención, este es el total de especies que ellos están incluyendo de mamíferos, exclusivamente mamíferos. ¿sí? Aquí es muy interesante ver que de las 520 especies reconocidas, según el gobierno mexicano, 291 están en riesgo, es decir, el 56% de los mamíferos nativos de México están en riesgo según el gobierno mexicano. Y además presenta en el listado de especies prioritarias, ahí les, aquí eh, la redacción es extrañísima, pero es tal cual como aparece en el Diario Oficial de la Federación, publicado el 5 de marzo del 2014. Pero bueno, lo que les estoy resaltando ahí, eh, subrayado, es que de acuerdo con esta, este, la elaboración de esta lista, tiene que estar basada en que las especies que están ahí deben de ser especies que están en riesgo de extinción, es decir, que están dentro de la NOM. Otros atributos que consideran para considerarlas, que toman en cuenta, perdón, para considerarlas, es que sean carismáticas y de importancia para el hombre. Y que además, a la hora que se les proteja a ellas, se protejan especies asociadas y comunidades biológicas. Y después mencionan que hay que atender a especies de importancia crucial, pero nunca nos explican exactamente qué se refiere esto de la importancia crucial. Pero bueno, con base en estos criterios, elaboran esta lista de especies prioritarias. Para mamíferos se incluyen 41 especies. De las 520, eh, hacen una selección y quedan 41. Entonces, esto es lo único que está reportando México como sus avances en cuanto al estado de conservación, de la de estado de conservación y estrategias para eh, la conservación de poblaciones y especies ante la Convención Mundial. Bueno, pues a veces anda uno de ocioso y entonces surge la pregunta de si esto es real. O sea, realmente el 56, por más de la mitad de los mamíferos de México están en riesgo y realmente esas 41 especies son las mejores para proteger a todo lo demás, no solamente a otras especies de mamíferos, sino a otras especies de plantas, de anfibios, de aves, de lo que sea. ¿no? Entonces, surge esta pregunta, ¿no? si, si es real o, o no, hay en los ratos de ocio que tiene uno. Bueno, entonces yo en mis ratos de ocio me puse a contar especies y resulta que encuentro una primera diferencia en que lo que reporta, el reporte que está haciendo el gobierno mexicano ante la lista, hay que agarrar la lista y ponerse a contar especies. Ellos reportan 291 especies, cuando en realidad en la lista hay 242. Entonces, el porcentaje de especies que el gobierno mexicano realmente considera en peligro es del 46%. Pero eso no es lo más grave, es ahí como que bueno, el que hizo el reporte no contó bien, eso no es tan grave, aparentemente, ¿no? Lo que sí es muy grave es que cuando uno se pone a revisar las tres versiones de la NOM, digo que hay que ser ocioso para hacerlo, pero eh, se pone uno a revisar las tres versiones. Bueno, pues resulta que se han incrementado, el, eh, o más bien, el estado de conservación de los mamíferos de México, de acuerdo con las publicaciones del gobierno mexicano, se ha ido deteriorando. En estos últimos años, en esos casi 20 años, entre el 94 y el 2010, se deterioró. ¿Sí? Y eso lo vemos porque hay más especies listadas, o sea, si nada más vemos las listas, la, la, la impresión que nos da es, sí, se ha aumentado el riesgo, ha aumentado la presión para los mamíferos y por eso se están listando más. ¿sí? Entonces, ¿realmente está sucediendo esto o es que hay un mayor conocimiento? ¿O cómo es que se están listando más especies, no solo se están listando más, como pueden ver, de 37 que había en el 94 a 46 que hay en el 2010, sino además observen 
las categorías de riesgo. O sea, hay menos especies listadas en sujeta a protección especial, que es la categoría de menor riesgo, y más en las otras dos categorías, y por supuesto en las distintas. ¿no? Entonces, ¿realmente se incrementó el riesgo o se tiene un mejor conocimiento del de estado de las poblaciones? Bueno, pues para contestar esa pregunta, igual uno se pone a revisar las evaluaciones que se han hecho y con lo que nos topamos es que de las 242 especies que hay listadas actualmente en, el, en la NOM, solamente 27 se han evaluado con el MER. El resto no sabemos por qué está ahí. Ahora, ahí aparece un 5.2%, ese es el, quiere decir que solamente el 5% de las 520 especies de mamíferos de México se han evaluado. El del otro 95% no sabemos cuál es su estado. No hay ninguna eh, evaluación realizada, por lo menos no publicada, que nos permita saber si realmente eso está bien o no. O sea, si las especies que están incluidas en la NOM realmente están en riesgo de extinción o no. Y si muchísimas especies que no están listadas, probablemente estén en riesgo, pues no se han evaluado. Solamente el 5% están evaluados de todas las demás. Y les estoy señalando allá los cetáceos, ¿sí? porque ese gran incremento que tenemos, el número de especies listadas, se debe a que de, observen del 94 al 2001, de 8 especies listadas sube a 35. Y queda claro en, la, en el diario oficial en la publicación, que esas especies se incluyeron por eh, cuestiones de ordenamiento ecológico y para cumplir con compromisos internacionales, es decir, no se evaluaron, no es que estén en riesgo de extinción, simple y sencillamente como medidas políticas. Y eso obviamente hace que se dispare el número de especies listadas y por lo tanto se vea peor el estado de conservación de lo que realmente podría ser, que en realidad no lo sabemos y solamente 5% de las eh, poblaciones de las especies han sido evaluado. Bueno, aparte de este pequeño problema de que no han sido evaluadas, tenemos otro problema con la NOM. Cuando uno revisa las categorías de riesgo, se recordarán que uno de los atributos que debe tener una buena lista es que no deben incluir elementos ambiguos, las, los, las categorías de riesgo, pero tampoco, eh, y perdón, el riesgo de extinción tiene que ser evaluado en un tiempo finito. Bueno, cuando uno revisa las categorías de riesgo, ahí se lo señalé en amarillo, esa de probablemente extinta en medio silvestre, eh, dice que se considerará así hasta donde la documentación diga, o sea, hasta donde la documentación diga, ¿no? Si alguien después dice, ¿sabes qué? No, te equivocaste, sí estaba. Ah, bueno, entonces le cambio la categoría, ya no está extinta, siempre se había. ¿no? Y además eh, pone como condicionante que existan ejemplares vivos en confinamiento o fuera del territorio nacional, o sea, no existe una categoría realmente de una especie que se haya extinguido, por tanto, en una especie, si uno piensa en una especie, por ejemplo, endémica de una musaraña, que rara vez vamos a encontrar en un zoológico, en cualquier otra parte del mundo, entonces no puede estar extinta. O sea, no existe la categoría. La siguiente, en peligro de extinción, hay una disminución drástica. ¿Qué es una disminución drástica? ¿Del 10%, del 50%, del 70%? No sabemos, es solamente drástica. Para mí drástica puede ser una cosa, para cualquiera de ustedes puede ser otra. Entonces, totalmente ambiguo el término. Y eh, que ponen en riesgo su habilidad debido a factores tales y como entre otros. O sea, puede ser cualquier cosa. ¿No? Ahí tenemos este otro problema con la ambigüedad. Lo mismo pasa con las otras dos. Podrían llegarse a encontrar en peligro. Podrían. O sea, no es que se esté demostrando el riesgo de extinción, sino que podrían y a corto o mediano plazo, qué es el corto y qué es el mediano plazo. ¿Sí? Y lo mismo pasa en la siguiente, ¿sí? podrían llegar a estar amenazadas y por lo tanto hay que propiciar su recuperación y conservación, porque podrían, o sea, no es que sepamos, es que podría ser, o sea, están llenas 
llenas las categorías de riesgo de eh, elementos ambiguos y subjetivos. Entonces, ya no está cumpliendo con uno de los requisitos básicos de, eh, que debe cumplir cualquier lista. ¿sí? Entre eso y que las especies no han sido evaluadas. Entonces, realmente, ¿cómo podemos decir que la NOM nos está reflejando el estado de conservación? No solo de los mamíferos, sino de cualquier grupo. ¿sí? Bueno, para la inclusión de especies, exclusión o cambio de categoría. En el inciso 6.1 dice claramente que se debe aplicar el MER. Si no, no pueden estar. Ya vimos que solamente 27 especies de las 240 y tantas están, están evaluadas. Pero lo más interesante es el último inciso, ¿sí? que dice que determinar si la… o sea, si ustedes hacen, se ponen a la tarea y se ponen a evaluar aplicando el MER para la especie fulanita, y ustedes llegan a la conclusión utilizando el método que está exigiendo el Gobierno de México, llegan a la conclusión de que tal especie debería estar incluida en tal categoría, se les presenta en esa propuesta a la Semarnat, va a ser la Semarnat quien decida si entra o no. Aunque ustedes estén demostrando el riesgo de extinción o que no está en riesgo de extinción en este momento. Es la Secretaría quien va a determinar si acepta o no la propuesta. ¿Bajo qué criterios? No lo sabemos. ¿Quién dentro de la Secretaría? Tampoco lo sabemos. Es decir, la lista está armada, a fin de cuentas, lo que nos está diciendo este último inciso, es que esta lista está armada de acuerdo a los gustos de quien esté en la Secretaría. Se evalúe o no, se demuestre o no el riesgo de extinción, la Secretaría va a decidir si entra o no. Eso es lo que nos dice este último inciso. Entonces, si recordamos las características que debe cumplir una lista roja, vemos que sí, eh, cumple con la primera, está basada en un sistema de categorización del riesgo de extinción, pero con todas las demás no. Las categorías están llenas de elementos ambiguos y subjetivos, no hay relación entre las categorías, no se hace una evaluación de riesgo de extinción en tiempo finito, el análisis no está basado, el sistema no está basado en un análisis científico porque pues, decide la Secretaría si entra o no y no usa elementos eh, exclusivos para evaluar el riesgo de extinción. Es, esas especies son importantes para las cuestiones de manejo y convenios internacionales, entonces entran. Se está metiendo ya manejo y eh, prioridades de, de conservación para la elaboración de una lista. Entonces, en pocas palabras, la lista roja mexicana no nos está dando una idea del estado de conservación de las especies, no es una lista de riesgo. En cuanto al de las especies prioritarias, bueno, ahí nomás les decía que, ahí nomás para recordarles estos puntos importantes que supuestamente tienen que ser especies que están dentro de alguna categoría de riesgo y que su protección va a favorecer la protección de otras especies. Bueno, uno sigue de ocioso y se pone a verlas, ¿no? ¿Quiénes son? Aquí me encanta, bueno, no solamente el CLN, eh, lo de arriba es extinto, probablemente extinto, en peligro, amenazada, protección especial y el NL son no listadas. Bueno, pues de las 41 especies que están incluidas, cinco no están listadas, entonces ya no cumplió con el primer requisito. Pero lo que más me encanta es que una de esas especies, según el gobierno mexicano, está extinta. Entonces, ¿a quién van a proteger? ¿Cómo se va a proteger? Y si una especie está extinta, según la norma. Entonces, no hay una justificación para que esa especie esté ahí, si ya no existe. Por lo menos no existe en territorio nacional. Entonces, ¿cómo se va a proteger esa especie y cómo se va a proteger su hábitat si ya no está? O sea, eso, es, eso me encanta, esa parte me encanta, ¿no? La especie extinta hay que protegerla para proteger a otras. Eso es maravilloso. Bueno, aquí nada más les está el listado completo de las, son las 41 especies y nada más es para señalarles pues que de las 41 igual, ¿no? Solamente seis tienen MER. Las demás, pues quién sabe cómo están. Entonces, quién sabe si realmente esta lista va a servir para proteger algo. De que todas son especies carismáticas, todas lo son. Eso que ni qué. A todo el mundo le gustan los cetáceos, las ballenas son muy bonitas, están los primates, están los manatís, o sea, a todo el mundo le gustan, pero realmente plantearlas a ellas como especies prioritarias para la conservación nos va a dar un efecto de paraguas, es decir, que va a proteger a otras, o simple y sencillamente es una tendencia política es decir, así ah, estamos conservando las especies bonitas y llamativas. No lo sabemos, no sabemos tampoco cómo se hizo esta lista, porque bueno, dice que deben estar en la categoría de riesgo, que no, ya vimos que no están, pero además en el diario oficial dice que se hicieron evaluaciones y talleres de expertos 
pero ¿qué, ¿qué características tomaron en cuenta estos expertos para llegar a esta lista? ¿Quién sabe? En ningún lado lo dice. Bueno, para colmo de males, y si uno sigue de ocioso, se pone a, por, a revisar, en el calendario cinegético de este año, del 2014, estas son las especies que están incluidas, es decir, que tienen aprovechamiento para la cacería deportiva. ¿Sí? Bueno, pues resulta que hay especies que según la NOM están en riesgo, pero que se pueden cazar. ¿Sí? O sea, cinco son especies que la NOM considera en peligro de extinción y sin embargo se pueden cazar, ¿por qué no? ¿Okay? Y entre paréntesis, allá en rojo, que no sé si se alcanza a ver claro el rojo o no, espero que sí, pero bueno, dice cuatro y, y seis, eh, esas son aparte especies, que está, es el número de especies que aparte son especies prioritarias para la conservación. Entonces, son especies que están listas en las dos listas, la NOM y especies prioritarias, pero que se pueden cazar. Bueno, desafortunadamente, no solo México tiene estos problemas con sus listas rojas. ¿sí? En un trabajo que hicieron eh, de Gramón y Cuarón en el 2006, lo publican, se dieron a la tarea de revisar las listas rojas de América, de todo el continente, no, por lo menos las que están publicadas, no todos los países las tienen, pero eh, las que sí tienen sus propias listas rojas, se pusieron a revisarlas. Ellos, aparte de estas seis, de estas seis características que obligadamente deben cumplir cualquier lista roja, pusieron otras, otras ocho, que son deseables. Por ejemplo, que no sean redundantes, es decir, no incluir una, una especie en una lista roja solo porque está en la otra lista, sino realmente incluirla porque a nivel local está en, en riesgo. Eh, otra de las características que deben cumplir es que hay que poner quién hizo la evaluación y los datos, de dónde salieron. ¿Cómo se hizo esa evaluación? ¿Quién la hizo? Y la justificación de por qué debe estar en esa categoría. Entonces, es otra serie de, de características deseables. ¿no? Bueno, en el análisis que ellos hacen, eh, resulta que la lista roja de la Unión para la Conservación de la Naturaleza cumple con 13 de esos 14 eh, requisitos y las demás van para abajo. Ahí estamos viendo la evaluación que ellos hacen de la NOM 2001, eh, que es básicamente igual a la NOM 2010, nada más que en la NOM 2010 subieron, pusieron más categorías, pero dicen lo mismo, si ustedes leen el texto, dice exactamente lo mismo. Eh, bueno, para ellos cumple con menos del 50% de las características deseables de una lista roja y de ahí se va para abajo, ¿no? es decir, las listas rojas oficiales nacionales, solamente la canadiense tiene más del 50% de las características deseables, todas las demás están por abajo. Entonces, este es un problema que se está dando en, todas las, eh, en todos los países, no solamente México. No se está definiendo bien cuáles son las categorías de riesgo ni cómo considerar a una especie realmente en riesgo. Entonces, este problema de que nuestras listas rojas no sean claras y que no nos estén hablando eh, del estado de las poblaciones, pues entonces nos imposibilita a conocer cuál es el estado de conservación. O sea, realmente qué está pasando con nuestras especies. Entonces, surge la duda de, bueno, y entonces ya vimos que la NOM no me está dando información verídica sobre el estado de conservación de los mamíferos, entonces, ¿qué puedo hacer? Bueno, pues irme con la lista que tiene el mejor puntaje, la que aparentemente está cumpliendo con todos los rigores científicos para poder conocer el estado de conservación. Bueno, un problema… Bueno, antes que, que pasar al problema. ¿no? Bueno, la, la lista roja está basada en estas son las categorías de, de riesgo que, de, que considera, considera las especies en peligro crítico, las en, peli, en peligro de extinción y vulnerables a, ese tres, a esos tres, bueno, la suma de estas tres nos va a dar el total de especies amenazadas que considera la, la Unión para la Conservación de la Naturaleza. ¿no? Bueno, el problema cuando uno usa… Ah, todavía no era eso, bueno… No importa. De acuerdo, si uno baja los, las bases de datos de la, de la lista roja, puede buscar por, es, por países, por familias, por lo que quiera, ¿no? la información en cuanto al estado de conservación global. Entonces, eh, buscando la información para países, encontramos que según la eh, lista roja, Mexi, las especies de, de México, de mamíferos, entre el 20 y el 25% están amenazadas, es decir, están en cualquiera de las tres categorías, o en peligro crítico, en peligro o 
en, o vulnerables. Que si lo vemos, bueno, si nos acordamos de la NOM, ellos decían que eran 46. Y la lista roja dice que es entre el 20 y el 25. Aquí el problema que hay cuando uno trabaja con la lista roja es que el, el análisis, la evaluación del riesgo de extinción está hecho a nivel de especie considerando toda la distribución de la especie. Entonces, cuando uno trabaja con especies de distribución amplia, no puede hacer la evaluación a nivel local, porque la evaluación es a nivel amplio. Por ejemplo, pensemos en el, la especie, nuestra especie extinta, ¿sí? el lobo mexicano, que es la prioritaria. Eh, la especie Canis lupus en la lista roja aparece como una especie en eh, preocupación menor, porque a nivel global ese es el estatus que tiene. Pero recordemos que los lobos, Canis lupus como especie, está por muchas partes del mundo. Entonces, a nivel global no está amenazada. A nivel local está erradicada. Si a nivel nacional está erradicada, en México no tenemos lobos se erradicaron por completo. Entonces, ahí la, el estado de esta especie es totalmente diferente al global del nacional. Entonces, si nosotros consideramos una evaluación tomando en cuenta esas especies de esta distribución tan amplia, podemos subestimar o sobreestimar el, riesgo, el, el estado de conservación. Entonces, lo que se recomienda hacer para poder usarla es usarlas con especies de distribución restringida, porque ahí el riesgo de eh, extinción global y local o regional, es el mismo. Entonces, nos quitamos el problema de la distribución amplia, ese error que podríamos estar cometiendo por un problema de escala. Y se puede uno concentrar en especies de distribución restringida, porque ahí el riesgo es el mismo. ¿Ven? Entonces, aquí junto con Jaime, igual nos pusimos de ociosos un día a trabajar y eh, queríamos ver cuál era, eh, va a ser una evaluación del estado de conservación de mamíferos terrestres de México. ¿no? Entonces, lo que se nos ocurrió hacer fue, bueno, los mamíferos no van a estar, ni los mamíferos ni ninguna otra especie se va a regir por fronteras políticas. Entonces, no podemos hablar de los mamíferos de México nada más, o sea, tenemos que hablar, o sea, también hay que extendernos hacia, Sud hacia Centroamérica, perdón, y hacia Estados Unidos, y porque las especies no se van a limitar por fronteras políticas. Entonces, lo que hicimos fue, eh, consideramos la división, que bueno, no la división, sino esta, esta característica que tiene México de tener las regiones neártica, neotropical y la zona de transición, y lo que hicimos fue concentrarnos en especies que fueran endémicas de cada región. Entonces, tomamos a las especies que están únicamente en la región eh, austral, de, de la, eh, la región neártica, es decir, de las especies que están de los estados del sur de Estados Unidos hasta la zona de transición mexicana, las de la zona de transición mexicana y de las neotropicales, nos bajamos hasta las especies que están en Centroamérica, sin incluir las que tienen la distribución amplia que va de México a Sudamérica. Es decir, acotamos nuestra zona de estudio a esta parte. ¿sí? Entonces, ahí podemos hacer un riesgo, un análisis, considerando el riesgo de extinción, considerándolas a todas estas como endémicas de cada una de estas regiones. ¿sí? Bueno, lo que hicimos fue usar la lista roja, entonces ahora sí podemos usar la lista roja porque sabemos que esas especies solo están ahí, entonces el riesgo de extinción va a ser el mismo, el global, que el local. Y calculamos el nivel de amenaza eh, utilizando la base de datos del 2012 y el índice de la lista roja utilizando los datos de las bases de datos del 2008 y el 2012 y esto, aunque bien est estamos utilizando son especies de distribución muy restringidas, nos va a dar una tendencia a nivel local de qué es lo que está pasando con los mamíferos. Bueno, el estado de conservación rápidamente, como se… no sé si se alcanza a ver. Bueno, bueno este nos va a hablar sobre el estado de conservación de un grupo de especies. ¿sí? Entonces, lo que tenemos que ver es cuántas especies están amenazadas del total de especies y considerar las especies que de las que no hay datos suficientes para la evaluación. Entonces, a partir de ahí vamos a poder hacer un cálculo de cuál es el nivel de amenaza de nuestro grupo de especies y establecer los límites de confianza. ¿sí? El límite inferior de confianza nos dice que eh, sería el valor esperado del nivel de amenaza si ninguna de las especies sin datos suficientes en ese momento para evaluarse está amenazada 
y por el contrario, el límite superior nos estaría hablando de que todas esas especies que, de las que no hay datos y que no se han podido evaluar, estuvieran amenazadas. Y el índice de la lista roja, este de lo que nos va a hablar es de el, la proporción de especies que se espera que permanezcan, que sigan existiendo en un lapso entre 10 y 50 años, si no hay medidas adicionales de conservación. Entonces, aquí lo que tenemos que ver es, eh, aparte de calcular el valor exacto del índice para cada una, un conjunto de, de datos en un año determinado, lo que podemos saber es el movimiento de especies entre las diferentes categorías. Y este movimiento de especies nos va a permitir estimar la tasa de pérdida de biodiversidad. Si cuántas especies están subiendo de categoría de, de riesgo en el periodo, entre evaluaciones. ¿Sí? Bueno, de, entonces de las especies, de las 520 especies que hay en, en México, fuimos a revisar cuáles estaban en cada una de estas tres regiones y con estas características que fueran endémicas de esas zonas en particular y eh, nos quedamos con 295 especies. La W quiere decir que son especies que están en al menos dos de las regiones, bien pueden estar en la parte eh, sur de la Neártica o en la, y en la zona de transición mexicana o en la parte norte de la neotropical y en la zona de transición. ¿sí? O sea, eso se refiere a que tenga esa W, pueden estar eh, pasándose entre regiones. Luego están las que son exclusivamente neárticas, las que son exclusivas de la zona de transición y las exclusivas de la zona neotropical. Bueno, los niveles de amenaza que encontramos es que del total de esas 95, eh, 295 especies, el 32% está amenazada. ¿sí? O sea, es más alto de lo que estaba reportándonos la Unión para la Conservación de la Naturaleza, que calculaba que en México es de entre el 20 y 25. Bueno, considerando esas especies de distribución restringida, es del 32%. Mucho menor que si consideramos a la NOM. Eh, de las tres, las que van a tener la, la, los niveles de amenaza más alto es la zona de transición mexicana. Casi el 50% de las especies, que estas sí son endémicas de México, porque recuerden dónde está, están amenazadas. Es un nivel sumamente alto. Cuando vemos el índice de la lista roja, si consideramos todas las especies, aquí no se los puse, pero todas las especies, eh, es el valor del índice anda alrededor del punto 79%. Eso quiere decir que el, casi el 80%, perdón, casi el, un 20% de las especies actuales podrían extinguirse entre 10 y 50 años si no se toman medidas de conservación realmente efectivas. ¿sí? Y además estamos viendo el decremento. ¿sí? Las, recuerden, las tendencias negativas nos van a estar indicando que la tasa de pérdida de biodiversidad se ha incrementado. Entonces, tomándolas todas en cuenta, las 295 ese incremento entre 2008 y 2012, o sea, hasta en tan solo cuatro años, está hablando de casi el 0.5%. Y donde se ve más marcada esa disminución es en la región neotropical. En la región, en la parte de central de México, en la zona de transición mexicana, no hubo cambios en el índice, en los valores del índice entre estas dos evaluaciones, pero eso no quiere decir que se haya detenido la tasa de pérdida de biodiversidad, sino que se ha mantenido constante que no es lo mismo. Bueno, entonces, las conclusiones a las que podemos ver con este, este pequeño ejercicio que hicimos es que una de cada tres de las especies estudiadas está amenazada, sumamente alto, el 50% de las especies de la zona de transición están amenazadas, entre 30 y 40% de las especies neotropicales y neárticas también están amenazadas, más del 20% de las especies actuales podrían desaparecer muy pronto, 10, 50, 10 a 50 años, y la tasa de pérdida de biodiversidad se ha incrementado. ¿Okay? Bueno, ya, en resumen, para terminar todo esto, entonces, ¿qué es lo que estamos viendo? Con este pequeño análisis que hicimos, lo que estamos viendo es que hay un declive en el estado de conservación de los mamíferos de México en función de la tasa de pérdida de biodiversidad. Se está incrementando, ¿sí? o por lo menos se ha incrementado en estos, entre estas dos evaluaciones. Lo que nos está indicando que estamos fallando en las estrategias de conservación a nivel nacional, local e incluso internacional, porque recuerden que estas especies están en otros países también, no son endémicas de México. Y bueno, esto se está reflejando 
en una... Eh, se me fue la palabra, bueno, en, tanto en las especies y poblaciones, en el estado de especies y poblaciones, pero también de hábitats y ecosistemas. ¿sí? Entonces, usar, o sea, nosotros estamos usando aquí a los mamíferos como un caso de estudio particular. ¿sí? Si hiciéramos esto con otros grupos, probablemente encontraríamos los mismos resultados. ¿sí? Sería muy interesante ver qué está pasando con todos los vertebrados en México y si tenemos las mismas tendencias, que lo se puede hacer, ¿no? Entonces, eso se hablaría más sobre el estado de nuestros ecosistemas. Si se están deteriorando las poblaciones de mamíferos, es porque se están deteriorando en gran medida sus hábitats. Entonces, estamos fallando no solamente en las estrategias dirigidas a especies y poblaciones, sino en las estrategias dirigidas a, a hábitats y ecosistemas completos. Bueno, por último, ¿qué podemos hacer? Bueno, en primer lugar, reconocer que nuestros instrumentos actuales no están sirviendo. Eso es algo muy difícil, que cuando uno trata de plantearlo, generalmente te van a rechazar, te van a decir que no, o sea, que es lo que hay. ¿no? Entonces, muchas publicaciones, si ustedes ven, de estado de conservación de especies y poblaciones de México, están basadas en la NOM, es decir, los académicos están fomentando que se siga usando la NOM. Y mucho de ese fomentar es porque mientras es una especie está en la NOM, es más fácil conseguir recursos para la investigación. Si la sacan, entonces la cosa se va a poner más complicada pero a fin de cuentas estamos provocando un problema. Al no reconocer estas fallas, estamos provocando un problema en cuanto a pérdida de biodiversidad. Entonces, ¿qué debemos hacer? Pues desarrollar realmente instrumentos objetivos y basados en criterios científicos. ¿Sí? Hay un trabajo que presentaron Ceballos y Navarro hace ya muchos años, una propuesta para evaluación de, de, para, de riesgo de extinción, mucho más eficiente que la NOM, y sin embargo se ha rechazado constantemente, de que tiene mucho más características deseables que la NOM y esa ha sido rechazada una y otra vez. Lo mismo cuando se ha propuesto usar los criterios de la Unión para la Conservación de la Naturaleza que están diseñados para evaluar a nivel nacional y local y también se han rechazado, es decir, hay un rechazo a aceptar cosas que funcionan mejor. Y finalmente, pues desarrollar en función de que podamos desarrollar estos eh, instrumentos adecuados, entonces vamos a poder plantear ya estrategias de conservación que reduzcan esa pérdida de biodiversidad. Y bueno, espero no haberlos dormido y muchas gracias por su atención. Muchas gracias, ahora vamos a pasar a la sesión de preguntas, tenemos unas dos preguntas para la doctora y alguien quiere… Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, me imagino que en el caso de las especies vegetales ocurre algo similar, ¿no? Porque también están protegidas bajo la NOM. Eh, ¿Qué se podría hacer en este caso, siendo pues materia prima para los demás grupos? Me imagino que pues debe ser un punto importante también. ¿Qué se podría hacer al respecto? ¿Algún, algún ejercicio similar o…? Bueno, claro que se puede hacer un ejercicio similar, ¿no? yo trabajo con mamíferos, entonces me fui por mamíferos, pero por supuesto que puedes hacer este, este ejercicio con cualquiera de los, de los grupos que están eh, dentro de la NOM. De hecho, con, los, con las plantas, eh, al igual que con los que ocurrió aquí con los cetáceos, con los mamíferos, dentro de los mamíferos, eh, que se meten todos, o sea, no se evalúan, es simplemente metámoslos todos, algo similar, hasta donde tengo entendido, pasa con las eh, cactáceas. Entonces, si tú ves la NOM en cualquiera de los grupos que viene, al fin, la última columna dice cuáles han sido evaluadas y vas a encontrar así números bajísimos. De hecho, yo creo que tal vez los mamíferos sean de los más evaluados dentro de los grupos. Entonces, claro que se puede hacer un, un ejercicio similar y yo creo que algo que se tiene que hacer es realmente eh, presentar una crítica constructiva, tanto en foros nacionales como internacionales, de que estamos haciendo mal las cosas, reconozcámoslo y ponernos a trabajar para realmente hacer listas que nos puedan servir para eh, priorizar acciones de conservación y manejo. Este… Aún, o sea, la falla todavía es más grande porque aunque todas las especies que están en la NOM fueran evaluadas por el método de evaluación de riesgo, el mismo método de evaluación de riesgo está mal empleado. No 
no toma en cuenta las los amenazas en poblaciones locales con todos los este, desarrollos turísticos que está viendo los proyectos mineros y también hay especies que a lo mejor están distribuidas muy ampliamente en el país pero en sitios locales las poblaciones se están perdiendo y de algunas ya se, se extirparon completamente las poblaciones entonces yo creo que ver a la NOM como una estrategia de conservación para nada es una estrategia de conservación, si de nada va a servir tener un listado que no se va a respetar para hacer actividades que dañen al ecosistema donde vivan las especies. Entonces, aparte de que, o sea, que, que empezáramos a hacer el MER para todas las especies, yo creo que tenemos que empezar a impulsar otro método de evaluación de riesgo, porque el MER no me parece que esté funcionando, es muy ambiguo lo que cada quien quiera decir de su especie, estudiar de su especie objetivo y por lo menos yo por ejemplo si estudio reptiles le voy a dar más ímpetu y más importancia a los reptiles a lo mejor que un mamífero y eso no quiere decir que va a ser bien utilizado para conservar todo un ecosistema o toda la población. Claro, el, eh, mira cuando se hace un análisis de riesgo de extinción, o sea tienes que pensar o sea, es tal cual como están las cosas, ¿no? y decir, bueno, sí, a lo mejor yo trabajo con mamíferos, tú con reptiles, y pues el riesgo, me, el análisis me sale que no está en riesgo, bueno, pues ni modo, no está en riesgo y no lo voy a poner, nada más para asegurarme de que entre en una lista, ¿no? Eh, un problema que tiene el MER es que es subjetivo, bueno, ahí no lo, solo, no lo dije, Solo ¿no? el primer paréntesis, que es el que te dice es el porcentaje de, de distribución que tiene la especie, Solo ese es cuantitativo, todo lo demás es subjetivo. el investigador puede sí, poner. Puedes poner lo que sea, entonces no es un, un análisis de riesgo de extinción cuantitativo, es cualitativo, sí. para empezar. Entonces, ahí ya es un problema con el MER. Sí. Y además no incorpora la incertidumbre no. en ningún momento, obviamente. Diversidad genética. Si no es un estudio cuantitativo, no va a poder incorporar la incertidumbre. Entonces, de entrada el MER no es funcional, pero por alguna razón que yo todavía no acabo de entender, se niegan a utilizar los criterios de la lista roja de la Unión para la Conservación de la Naturaleza, que ahí sí son muy claros y que se pueden aplicar al nivel local, regional, nacional. ¿Listo? Muchas gracias a la doctora María Concepción. Es por alguna otra pregunta, ya me voy a estar acompañando en la comida. Gracias. Muy bien, para continuar con nuestro programa, ahora voy a proceder a la presentación de nuestro siguiente invitado, el doctor Robert Singh. Él estudió en la Universidad de Minnesota y obtuvo su doctorado en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Ha sido profesor de Ornitología, Ecología, Evolución y Comportamiento en la Universidad de Minnesota en donde labora actualmente. Su investigación es en el área de sistemática y filogenia. Está interesado en la aplicación de las técnicas moleculares y sus investigaciones han provisto de nuevas perspectivas en la conservación de especies raras y en peligro. Demos la bienvenida. I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here. It's exceptionally well organized and very interesting. For the first 25 years of my career, I've published 100 papers in scientific journals, and the sum reaction of the general public to all of them was, hmm, hmm, interesting. And then, by accident, I became involved with studies of the California gnat catcher. And I found the public was suddenly more interested than I thought they could possibly be. So today I'm going to tell you a little story of my involvement with conservation and politics of the California gnatcatcher. Once upon a time, 
there was a species called the black-tailed gnatcatcher. But in 1988, Jonathan Atwood published a paper and said, the black-tailed gnatcatcher is two species, the black-tailed gnatcatcher and the California gnatcatcher. The California gnatcatcher became under intense scrutiny because of population declines, and it was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in the United States. It was challenged in the courts by environmental developmental companies, and the court ordered Jonathan Atwood to release his data. In 1998, Rochelle Blackwell and I published a paper on the species limits of these gnat catchers. In 2000, we published a paper on mitochondrial DNA variation within the California gnat catcher. In 2010, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service denied a delisting petition and maintained the California gnat catcher as a threatened species under our Endangered Species Act. In 2013, last year, we published a paper on nuclear DNA variation and differentiation in California gnat catchers. A delisting petition was filed last summer, and we're currently awaiting to see what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service might do. So that's a brief history of where we're going in this talk. In 1998, Rochelle Blackwell and I confirmed Jonathan Atwood's suspicion that the California gnat catcher was a species distinct from the black-tailed gnat catcher. The California gnat catcher itself, then, is distributed from about the latitude of Palos Verdes in Los Angeles County, south to Cabo San Lucas. In the northern part of its range, it lives in coastal sage scrub, where it's fairly rare. South of the coastal sage scrub, the bird is quite common. Over time, three different researching groups studied the geographic variation of California gnat catchers and concluded that there were separate subspecies, Miller et al., Atwood, and Melnick and Rhea. And they each placed at the northern end of the range of the California gnat catcher a subspecies called Californica, which was the same for Miller et al. and Atwood and was much shorter for a much narrowly, dis more restricted range from Melnick and Rhea. Right? So this then provides the potential to say that this one species consists of three or more distinct evolutionary units. And if that were true, and one of them were to become threatened, you might want to consider listing it separately. And I also have to point out, my academic great-grandfather was Alden Miller, the one on the left, and I can only imagine them sitting in a tavern in Cabo San Lucas, drinking a margarita, saying, what should we call that subspecies? <laughs> but I don't know. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about bird subspecies. They are very controversial. Uh, this is James Van Remsen from Louisiana State. And as you see, he said that the long-standing dissatisfaction with subspecies derives from the historical fact that most bird subspecies were described in an era when quantitative methods were unavailable to assess their validity as entities. My colleague George Baraclow from the American Museum made an interesting observation. He said, when people study geographic variation in a widespread species, they take lots of individuals, lots of localities, lots of characters. They do quantitative studies of geographic variation. They rarely, if ever, describe subspecies. Whereas, it was curious to George. I just realized I just said curious George in this same thing. <laughs> it seems curious to George that people who take a look at a few specimens from a small part of the range are quick to describe subspecies. Right? Remember, subspecies are important. Subspecies are important because they might actually represent historically significant units of biodiversity. But having this said nonetheless, Baraclough said, 
This strongly suggests to him that subspecies were not to be taken very seriously. And this is not something new that just arrived in the literature. In 1953, the year I was born, Wilson and Brown said the subspecies concept is a mess. Okay? What has happened since then that would change our opinion? In North American birds, there are 781 subspecies. Most were described very early, the early 1900s, from a few specimens, from a few localities, no statistics. Okay? You could argue that many of them were described simply to call attention to the fact that somebody looked at a series of specimens and said, hey, they show geographic variation. Some have a different wing shape in one area, some are colored a little differently, and that they did not intend these subspecies to be the same as evolutionarily significant units. So as a consequence, if you just look at this list of 781 subspecies, some will be arbitrary divisions of single character clines, others will be discrete historically significant units, but you can't tell necessarily. And this is important because if you're going to use subspecies, in most endeavors, like a unit in a biogeographic analysis or a speciation study, in a phylogenetic study, for listing in conservation, the understanding is that these subspecies are discrete elements of our biodiversity. They are not arbitrary and subjective names applied to part of a distribution. Whereas if that's all you want to do is to say, hey, I looked at some specimens and they show geographic variation, and maybe you want to study that and maybe find some adaptive reasons, then that's fine. Okay. And I would ask you, what results today do we accept at face value that were arrived at in the 1930s and 40s without modern testing? If you go to the doctor with a bad case of DEPA, and he's not too sure what you have, and this is his solution, you should find another doctor. If you have to have surgery, and this is how everybody is dressed, go somewhere else. The same is true with subspecies. Things that were described in the 40s and 50s, 1940s and 50s, do not necessarily mean that they are proxies or substitutes for historical units of diversity. So back to California gnat catchers. The US declared them to be threatened in 1993, and in particular, what they declared to be threatened was the California and Northwestern Baja California gnat catchers. This, this segment. In 2010, they were listed in the Mexican list, as, uh, as you just heard about. BirdLife International, however, recognizes the fact that the species has a range that extends beyond the coastal sage scrub, and the population south of there is very large, and so their categorization of the conservation status of the California gnat catcher is least concern. So the issue at hand is, are the populations in the coastal sage scrub, whether they're a distinct subspecies two or two, are they real? Are they actually significantly independent evolutionarily? Because the stakes are high. In Southern California, city planners are hoping that more land can be developed because building homes like this, and these are way nicer than anything I live in, um, cost a lot of money, they provide a lot of jobs, they provide a lot of taxes. Mm -hmm. So people really want to know, is the California, California gnat catcher valid? Not only jobs are in, in, uh, at stake, but entire developments, entire industries are being influenced by the listing of the California, California gnat catcher. So this is Jonathan Atwood. Um, this doesn't usually happen in scientific work, right? 
So he was called before a judge in a federal court and said, give us your data because that's what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based their decision on and other people want to evaluate it. And, you know, in science, if your data aren't available to the public, then who, why should we believe you? Um, that's the judge. It's actually, that's actually a judge. <laughs> Um, Atwood could not find the exact data set that he used. Okay? I don't fault him for that at all. If you start doing multivariate analyses of data sets, you constantly tweak one little parameter and you change another one and you write over your data file and then you publish it and then later, five years later somebody asks you, well, what did you really do? And you're like, well, I don't know, let me find it. And he couldn't. What he did provide was reanalyzed by statisticians, and they were unable to replicate his results from the morphological data that these subspecies were actually real. There were several biases that were taken into account, such as the age of the specimen. Bird, some bird specimens in museum drawers change color over time. And so if you had specimens from different places at different times, they could appear differently simply because they were collected at different times. Nonetheless, the Fish and Wildlife Service in the US uh, did not, and the court backed them up, said, no, we're gonna keep the California gnat catcher. So, by accident, I happened to get some DNA from California gnat catchers from Baja, California, where they're common, and Jonathan Atwood had some DNA from nestling birds from Los Angeles. I said, oh, well, you know, okay, so we could address this question. So we published a paper in the year 2000 on mitochondrial DNA of the California gnat catcher, and we had samples spaced more or less throughout the entire range, right? It's very important to have equally spaced samples. If you have big gaps between your samples, and there's a decline in genetic variability, then you will wrongly infer that there's a genetic gap as well. So we had these individuals, and we said, what is the geographic pattern? And that figure in the upper left illustrates that there are not two, three, four, or more historical entities. From a DNA sample, I could probably not tell you if the bird was from Palos Verde, or Cabo San Lucas, even if it came in a margarita. <laughs> the overall level of genetic variability was very small. So not only were the subspecies described previously not recovered by mitochondrial DNA, um, none of them were, and there was no other groupings that maybe would suggest, suggest significant evolutionary divisions that weren't captured by previous subspecies schemes. Instead, there was the tree on the left. And so this is actually consistent with statisticians' reanalysis of California gnat catcher morph morphometrics in that if you look at all the data in concert, you see a cline, you see a gradation from north to south. You do not see discrete boundaries that would suggest evolutionarily significant units. Now you might say, well, mitochondrial DNA is just no good. Well, here are three examples of birds that show a deep genetic division at the Viscano Desert. DNA, mitochondrial DNA is absolutely 100% on these, so there's actually two cactus wrens, two Leconte thrashers, two verdans, right? So if you gave me a DNA sample, I could tell you unambiguously where they were from. Okay. They're from north or south of that line. However, here's the California gnat catcher tree again, and it does not show this break. And yet it's distributed across the same region that those other three species, including lots of other mammals and, and some uh, amphibians, show a distinct evolutionary break. We did find more genetic variability in the south than in the north. So this measure on the vertical axis is nucleotide diversity. It's the, it's the analog of heterozygosity. So there's more genetic variability in the south than in the north. And when I constructed niche models, as you expect for most species, at the last interglacial, 
120,000 years ago, they have a distribution very similar to that today. The last glacial maximum, their distribution has shifted southward. And then after the glacier, the last glacier receded, their range shifted northward again. Right? So given that scenario for the most recent glacial cycle, and remembering that glacial cycles have been going on for a long period of time, species kind of respond like yo-yos. They go down, they go back, they go down, they go back. And we think we captured the genetic signature of the most recent expansion northward. And so we suggested that this was an expectation that you would get if the California Natchitcher had relatively recently moved northward across that region that was once maybe a mid-peninsular seaway that isolated populations of those other three species. But since the bird was not distributed north and south of that seaway and only recently became northerly, it did not show the same genetic division as the other species did. Well, these inferences are based solely on mitochondrial DNA. And it is easy to go to the literature and find disparaging comments about the sole use of mitochondrial DNA. In a paper in a very prestigious journal called Molecular Ecology, Gaultier et al. said it's the worst marker they can think of. So now we're left wondering, does our mitochondrial DNA data mean anything? Or is it simply not informative? Well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was involved in this whole episode, and they said that in 2000, we do not state, Zink et al. did not state, that it should have no subspecies, but rather that currently recognized subspecies may not be equivalent to ecologically significant units. So this is what the Fish and Wildlife Service said after reading our paper. This was a surprise to me. This is what we actually wrote, verbatim. Comparison of mitochondrial DNA sequences from throughout the range did not support any subspecies scheme either previously described or unforeseen. So I'm not sure which, what the Fish and Wildlife Service was reading, but it wasn't my paper. And then they went on to say, in line with the Gaultier et al. comments, that, well, they did, their paper was based just on mitochondrial DNA. Never mind the fact that it's been used in tens of thousands of studies and provided us with a whole host of interesting evolutionary insights. But it's far too narrow and limited a technique to answer an, such an important question as, is the subspecies valid? And that the mitochondrial DNA data alone don't present substantial information that the current taxonomic scheme uh, is in error. So they use this sort of reasoning to say, well, it's just mitochondrial DNA. Right? So we're going to stick with the California, California subspecies being real. Well, from 1989 to 2014, in 100 other ESA decisions, the Fish and Wildlife Service relied extensively on mitochondrial DNA. I can provide this list to anyone that's interested. And I asked myself, what do you think would have happened if we would have found a single base substitution that supported the gnat catcher? Everybody would have said, well, it's just one base pair, but it's the California gnat catcher, so it's different. Mm -hmm. So the Fish and Wildlife Service said, well, what they really need to do is analyze nuclear DNA loci, because everybody knows mitochondrial DNA isn't any good. It's just a single locus, and it could be biased for any number of reasons, which I agree it could be, but usually isn't. So we did what they told us to do. They said, look at nuclear loci. So we sequenced seven nuclear introns. Uh, we asked, OK, so what did our mitochondrial DNA data set show? Was it the same or was it different? I mean, if somebody's going to prove you wrong, the best case is if it's you that says, oh, uh, sorry, I was wrong about that. 
Um, is there north-south pattern of genetic diversity? Um, and what does the genetics of the gnat catcher look like if you use nuclear loci? And so we published a paper uh, last year in the AUK. The map on the left shows the pattern of genetic variation at an exon, melanocortin, the locus often responsible for coloration differences in vertebrates. It's rooted with the black-tailed gnat catcher, the, the sister species of the California gnat catcher. And um, if you look at the colors, um, there's no geographic pattern to it. There's no support for a subspecies there. There's no support for any division. If you take all of the loci and make a population tree, there's also no support. So in blue, I have highlighted the populations from Atwood's California, California gnat catcher. If they were distinct, then all of those blue populations should be in a cluster. They should be in a clade. And they're dispersed across the tree. Okay? You know, I'm sorry, I can't help it. But that's where they are. If you plot genetic distance on the left, on the vertical axis, as a function of geography, and ask, is there isolation by distance? No, not really. Right? There's a little bit in the... Um, the sex-linked locus that we looked at, the Z-linked locus, which might suggest there's a little bit of male phylopatry, so males stay put more than females do when they breed from relative to their hatch site. But there's so much scatter that, you know, I wouldn't make anything out of it. On the top is the pattern we reported earlier for mitochondrial DNA, where we said that the south was more genetically variable than the north. This is the pattern from the nuclear loci. There is none. And so you might say, aha, conflict. And so I thought about that. And I simulated the situation that would, that would, would ensue if a southern population south of the mid-peninsular seaway that isolated those other species expanded to the north recognizing that mitochondrial genes have an N of 1, nuclear loci have an N of 4. So when individuals move, more nuclear genes spread than mitochondrial genes. And so when I did this simulation, I discovered that the mitochondrial DNA genetic variability was maintained, but there was no difference in nuclear DNA variability, which I argue is a fact, is a, is a consequence of when individuals move, they move more nuclear genes and they would erase any evidence of that mitochondrial pattern um, than you would, than, as you would predict, and therefore um, I don't see any conflict. The Endangered Species Act in the U.S. has a default, and that is if the subspecies isn't distinct. You can list a distinct population segment. Interestingly, this is a category created not by biologists, but by the U.S. Congress in the language of the Endangered Species Act. Biologists have been talking about management units, evolutionarily significant units, and then for a long time, nobody faced up to the fact that you could list a distinct population segment because we didn't know what it was until we read the description in the 1998 language in a Federal Register document that said that it could be something separated by physical, physiological, ecological, or behavioral factors with the caveat that if you do list a distinct population segment, you must do it sparingly, right? Sparingly, which was undefined, kind of like, um, you know, vague terms like that. But I was interested in knowing whether or not the gnat catcher, the California, California gnat catcher, and the coastal sage scrub exhibited ecological differences. Here's a couple simple plots from the bioclimb data of the variation geographically in annual precipitation and temperature across the Baja Peninsula. Coastal sage scrub 
is a different environment than the Sonoran desert-like vegetation south of the coastal sage scrub, where gnat catchers are common. My graduate student who went down there with me once said, you know, you could swing a dead cat and hit a California gnat catcher. I've never understood where that saying came from, so if anybody knows, let me know. But because the coastal sage scrub is different ecologically, at least appears to be different, then you might ask if there is a significant ecological adaptive difference in gnat catchers living in the coastal sage scrub and to the south, and if there was, then forget the genetic stuff, the morphological stuff, it could be ecologically distinct. And that would satisfy the criterion for a distinct population segment. So I used ecological niche modeling. Uh, the points are shown on the right. I entered them into Maxent, the standard um, uh, program for building a niche model using the 19 bioclim variables that are mostly temperature and humidity and variations thereof. And I conducted two different tests, the identity test and the background test. The identity test basically says, okay, let's figure out the ecological distance between your two sets of samples, the observed distance, and then let's throw all the localities into a pool and randomly sample them and ask how different they would be. And if the observed is way outside the range of the random, then you say, well, okay, they're using different aspects of the niche environment, of the climatic niche. But that's not necessarily significant because it doesn't allow you to know if an animal is just ecologically plastic and it can exist across a wide range of environments without any special genetic adaptations or if it really is genetically adapted to these different environments. And that's assessed using a background test, which tries to ask, given environments and environmental parameters in common, do the two groups, in this case, the, I guess I'm partly colorblind, are they blue and red? I guess they're the little dots. Okay, they're blue and red. Um, are they significantly different in their niche dimensions? So this is this identity test, and this is the distribution that you'd expect if gnat catchers just used climatic niches willy-nilly, and they don't. So it's much less than you'd expect by chance. But of course, we already knew that they live in the coastal sage scrub in a very different environment to the south. It still doesn't answer the question of whether they're ecologically plastic or truly adapted to these different environments. In other words, could a bird from the coastal sage scrub if it were transplanted down to La Paz, do just fine and vice versa. So the background test is what I used. This is the distribution of this background test. You take all the observed localities from one area and compare them to random localities in another and vice versa. If the observed niche divergence, the real one between the blue dots and the red dots, is to the left of this distribution, then you say, they're actually using common resources less often than you'd expect by chance. If it's to the right, then their niches are conservative. They're actually using common areas of the niche space more often than you'd expect by chance. And the result was right in the middle. So the California gnat catcher at least does not show ecological niche divergence that could be used as a criterion to make it distinct and listable as a distinct population segment. So do the available data support the California, California gnat catcher, the coastal sage scrub one, as valid subspecies in the US or northern Baja? No, 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 no. Okay, so that's what the results show. I would say then that they're northern populations of a fairly widely distributed species that are not evolutionarily distinct and therefore, they're inappropriately listed because the Endangered Species Act is supposed to list significant historically distinct units of our biodiversity, not arbitrary divisions of clines. The reason is there are millions of them and they're subjective and it would be chaos if the groups we listed weren't really historically significant. Well, when you find no evidence for something, negative evidence, you are always subject to the criticism that you didn't try hard enough. 
right? Now, the Endangered Species Act clearly says you have to use the best available scientific and commercial data. And I know we have some language issues between us. Not very many. Well, more for me than you. Um, but available has a clear meaning. Right? Available means it's available. So what's available? There's mitochondrial DNA, morphology, nuclear DNA, ecological data. And yes, you could do something in the future. You could imagine a new technique that would find support for these subspecies, but we're being asked right now to do something that biologists hate to do, make a decision. Everybody wants to say, well, I don't want to make a negative decision like that. I want to wait. You know, and maybe, maybe a fairy will come down and, and subspecies will be real. I think we, in fact, have a subspecies crisis. At the last meeting of the American Ornithologist Union um, in September in Colorado, uh, George Baraclough and Joel Craycraft and I organized a symposium. Lest you think this is a, an odd event, the California, California gnat catcher is not unique. My estimate from molecular data is about 90% of bird subspecies are not distinct historical entities. In other words, Wilson and Brown 61 years ago were right. However, we have lists of subspecies. Government agencies, they're not taxonomists. They're supposed to follow these lists that official groups like the American Ornithologist Union put out. But the American Ornithologist Union hasn't published a word on subspecies since 1957. And so we are left with subspecies taxonomy that was done in the early 1900s. My boss, Scott Lanyon, president of the AOU, said that the null hypothesis for listing ought to be that subspecies are not listable unless someone has done a modern assessment or the subspecies is recent and was based on solid molecular data or strong morphological data or ecological data or behavioral data. Well, in 2014, this, uh, this summer, a few months ago, a petition was filed in the U.S. court to remove the coastal, so the coastal California gnat catcher is what I've been calling the California California gnat catcher. Um, these are lawyers, so you, know, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, but they, uh, they, wanted to they petitioned the courts to remove the coastal California gnat catcher from the list of threatened species. I would like to point out I did not write this petition. I am not one of the petitioners. I did not get paid to do this. I did not do this. This precipitated some very negative press in the popular realm. In the Los Angeles Times, John McCormick from Occidental College said that our paper in the AUK was shoddy science. It was second rate. Now, I'll, I, won't, I won't comment anymore. No. He says, our study was developer funded. So we did get some money from developers. I actually don't know who they were. But it covered basic lab costs, like on the order of $40,000 for a study that took way more than that if you counted everybody's time. But this amounts to a claim of scientific malpractice. This claim can only mean that we wrote our paper to satisfy our funding agencies and not what the data said. That was quite astonishing to us. Right? The only purpose of this is to introduce a red herring so that maybe the Fish and Wildlife Service will say, well, OK. Um, they got some money from uh, you know, these developers, so we don't have to believe their study. If you get money from the Bureau of Land Management in the United States, does that mean that no matter what your data say, your interpretations will be consistent with their hopes and expectations? Of course not. People get funding from all sorts of sources. Barakal and I responded, no one other than the authors had any say in the analyses, interpretation, or writing of the paper. 
We stand behind our peer-reviewed conclusion published in the top-ranking American Ornithological Journal that the California population of gnatcatcher does not represent a genetically distinct subspecies. And that McCormick fails to mention the larger issue, the exploitation of the subspecies category for political rather than scientific purposes. We support environmentalist wishes to preserve tracts of coastal sage scrub, but they have alternatives to using shoddy taxonomy. My university will not accept a grant from any funding agency in which the contract has any language that the funding agency has anything to do with the final written product. They will not accept it. Nothing. So I can't spend anybody's money unless it passes through a chain of bureaucrats who actually read the contracts. And if they see anything that <laughs> smells of me taking money and maybe going to say something that somebody likes, they cut it off. You're not going to get it. And if you think about it, developer bias in our study would be if we had found that all of our data sets s supported the coastal California gnat catcher, but we said, yeah, but we don't think it's real anyway because, uh, you know, our, our funders didn't like it. And, and um, well, you know, it's not. Eh? So what are the next steps? Um, I don't know how long people want to wait. Uh, genomics is on the horizon. We're involved in genomics. Um, maybe we missed a locus lurking in the genome that would support sub, some, one of the subspecies schemes. That, however, wouldn't be enough. You would have to find, make sure that there weren't other loci that supported other contradictory groupings of populations. Now, mitochondrial DNA has been used so prevalently in these sorts of questions because it has a very fast coalescence time, four times faster than the average nuclear locus, irrespective of how you survey it, whether you sequence it, whether you use microsatellites. A mitochondrial DNA has a four times greater chance. However, if you look at tens of thousands of nuclear loci, it's possible that you will find one or two that by chance coalesced as fast as a nuclear, as a mitochondrial gene, and therefore you would have something available to actually test the mitochondrial structure, which we are doing. Okay, it matters that subspecies are valid. Okay? Even if we could identify lots of valid subspecies, there's not enough money to save them all, even if the only thing that mattered were birds. Okay? Like there's other people, like mammalogists, and apparently they care about their things too. Okay? McCarthy in a paper a couple years ago said that a billion dollars is needed annually to reduce the threat level of globally threatened birds. That means from endangered to threatened or threatened to least concerned. That's a billion dollars annually. Mm -hmm. There are far too many weak subspecies, right? And the consequence is because they're on formal lists and haven't been even basically addressed for a half a century, that they mislead conservation efforts and they erode public confidence in science. And in fact, I think in this area, we have a full-blown credibility crisis. As a scientist, you have an obligation to state objectively to the best of your ability what the data show. And the answer can no longer be, ask me tomorrow. Answer the question today. Make a decision based on the available evidence. So I would say, what am I supposed to say when I look at the mitochondrial tree and the nuclear tree that the California gnatcatcher really is real, but let's, let's assume and pretend that it is, and maybe someday somebody will get uh, evidence to support it? If that were the true, then I would change my mind. That's what scientists do. Right? They try to interpret the evidence the best they can in light of what's in front of them. And when that's in front of me, it would be scientifically dishonest of me to say anything other than the genetic data don't support 
the coastal gnatcatcher. However, here are three examples I showed you earlier of valid taxa. If cactus wrens south of here became threatened, I'd be the first one saying we need to support them. We need to save them. Right? Same with Leconte's thrasher. Leconte's thrasher, there are very few Leconte's thrashers in the Viscano Desert. And by the way, I really need recordings of vocalizations of Leconte's thrashers. So if anybody has any and would like to share them and be an author on the paper, um, this is an invitation. Right? It'll just take you a little while. Go down there, get a recorder, and get some Leconte's thrashers. Right? These are examples in which they're not at the species level, so they're below the species level, but there's evidence, there's strong evidence that within these species there are two distinct groups. Not three, not ten, like there's lots of subspecies in these, but there are two distinct groups. These qualify as historically significant evolutionary units that could be listed. So the mitochondrial DNA, nuclear loci, morphometrics, niche modeling, I'll agree that the California gnat catcher is one historical entity. The California California gnat catcher is not valid, in my opinion, and it's not a listable unit. And it's not unique in being that way. It's like most avian subspecies that were described in the 1940s and 50s. And for those of you that follow my role in mitochondrial DNA debate, I can't help pointing this out. So politics. If the California California gnat catcher was found in an area without high economic value, no one would care. No one would be writing letters to the LA Times saying, this is an abomination, this is terrible. If there were, there's a double standard. If there was a single nucleotide difference supporting the subspecies, everyone would say, whoa, whew, the subspecies were right. If they were in a place where nobody cared about, then they would say, well, you just can't have one character. So there's a double standard. If the California California gnat catcher is listed in the U.S. or Baja, it should not be because it's a valid taxon. It should be because it's somehow ecologically significant or for some other reason. If you want to do that, that's fine. Make an argument. But hiding behind this as a significant evolutionary unit that's listed, I do not think is scientifically the honest thing to do. This is how our paper ended. Right? Unfortunately, in the US, we're stuck with the Endangered Species Act. And we've used it in some slightly not completely straightforward ways to preserve habitats. And so at some future time, it would be really nice if we could add a component that said the coastal sage scrub has 100 endemic species in it. Now, unfortunately, the most charismatic is the California gnat catcher. Have you heard one? They go, psss, psss, psss. Like, ooh, it's not like a panda, it's not a tiger, it's not a lion. And it's sage scrub. If there was ever a habitat I wanted to plow under, it would be scrub, right? <laughs> Especially yours. But, so it's got a lot of bad things going for it, and in California, because it's coastal, the price of the land could be $3 million an acre, or $6 million a hectare, plus. So it's got a lot of bad things going for it, which I think refocuses attention on the importance of looking at habitat level alternatives. Well, I want to thank some of my colleagues uh, in the center there, is um, one of the main figures in Mexican ornithology, who has given up his career as a bowler, uh, Adolfo Navarro Seguenza from UNAM in Mexico City. On the right, Octavio Rojas, who wants to be an ornithologist, but he keeps getting confused. Um, Hernan Vasquez Miranda, my recent PhD student in the bottom right, we took him ice fishing. The two boys on the right are my hijos, and that's how you dress if you're Minnesotan, and that's how you dress if you're not from Minnesota. And three other gringos that helped me out. Um, thanks for your attention. Ahora es tiempo de preguntas, no sé si alguien quiere empezar.
Um, hi. Um, my name is Rocio, and sorry for my English, but um, I think that uh, it's very important because uh, many species uh, has the same problem that you explain in this moment. Uh, I'm working with the California choir, and the preliminary results um, uh, indicate that uh, it's the same problem. Eight subspecies, but um, maybe it's only one uh, or two Look, for... Thank you. Look at the consequences. If the northern populations of the California gnatcatcher went extinct, let's say they were gone, we would not lose much evolutionary diversity. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's a bird in the southwestern part of the U.S. and northwestern Mexico called the Southwest Willow Flycatcher. Exact same thing. It's not distinct. However, people have said to me that they know it's not distinct, but they're listing it because it helps preserve riparian habitats. I understand that. You know, I like to go out in nature. That's how I got into this business. But saying that is... A, is the public is going to pretty soon not take us seriously. If we say, well, we're going to save the coastal sage crab because the gnat catcher is a subspecies and no bit of shred of evidence supports it, then when we ask them something else that's really serious, they're going to go, well, why should we believe you now? You lied to us in the past. So I think we need to face up. And if the evidence says what it says, don't be ashamed as a scientist to say it. Your colleagues will hate you. <laughs> right? Because you're not saying what they want to hear. They want, we want to save everything, but we have to be realistic. Do you think, um, the question is, uh, do you think that it's more correctly to say that only our geographic variation, not species, when you have uh, the evidence? What did she say? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I like to, uh, thank, thank you. Um, I like to say, as I said at the end, maybe it's ecologically significant. Maybe if the gnat catcher goes extinct from Southern California, the population of Southern California will be attacked by gnats, right? Little tiny insects. Um, and maybe that it provides some ecological service that's critical. And that's fine. Make that case, right? Bring the evidence and make that case. But it's listed now because taxonomically it's a subspecies. And I don't think that that's scientifically credible. Amen. Amen. Uh, I give that same message. I gave it in front of the American Museum of Natural History. And I was just attacked. There was nothing else that they wanted to attack in my talk. But that, it's very difficult for passionate scientists to say, when we're wearing our white coats, we have to be dispassionate. They want to have the ability to twist, and I can, I'm sure you have a thousand examples and I have another thousand. They are, they, it's very difficult for them to, to, to cleverly twist the message into the data and into the scientific interpretations um, without eventually being uncovered by the public and attacked by the public. And at, at, so that's one issue that's absolutely crucial. The other one is the, the Endangered Species Act itself, which is you know, nice in a lot of ways, but it's misguided. Uh, and the organization that, that works out of Tucson, the Center for uh, Biological Diversity, uses that act as their sword and their weapon. Uh, and they look for examples where they can legally work in an attack on whatever is going on, which they see is for the benefit of a species. And it has en engendered a lot of displeasure in the minds of a lot of the public, not everybody. And yet, it's the act we have. What do we do? How do we as scientists who appreciate what you said and try to live that way get that thing to change, get the, 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 the preservation of ecosystems to become an 
an increasingly important goal, get the Endangered Species Act itself reformed. I think that um, you're exactly right, and I think the results of yesterday's election have delayed that uh, for a, a long bit, yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Two days ago. You're, you're Two days ago, yeah. Yesterday. Everybody wants to go to lunch. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Thank you. Muchas gracias al doctor Robert Singh. Muy bien, hemos llegado al momento de, de pasar a la comida. Esta se va, se va a estar sirviendo en el... Zoom se llama, es el espacio que está al lado de la cafetería, no sé si todos lo ubiquen, sino eh, ahorita a la salida les damos direcciones de cómo llegar, quien no tenga el papel para el boleto para ir a la comida se puede acercar a la mesa y también tengo un recordatorio extra, no sé si alguna de las personas les entregaron una constancia con nombre en su folder y si es así, eh, que si pueden pasar a, a la mesa del frente para regresarla. Gracias. Quiero recordarles que las actividades se reanudarán a las 3 de la tarde en este lugar.
Buenas tardes, estamos a punto de comenzar con la segunda sesión de pláticas de esta tarde. Muy bien, para continuar con nuestro programa, voy a hablarles un poco de nuestro siguiente invitado, el doctor Andrew Bohomack. Él estudió la carrera de Biología en Allegheny College y obtuvo su doctorado en Ecología y Biología Evolutiva en la Universidad de Cornell. Actualmente es profesor de Biología en San Diego State University. Su investigación está enfocada en genética de la conservación y ecología de poblaciones. Está interesado en la biología de los camarones, los fairy shrimps, en la estimación de flujo genético y la dispersión y el análisis de su genética poblacional. Entonces, démosle la bienvenida. All right, so thank you to the organizers for inviting me, as well as all the other speakers. Um, never quite know if it's better to give the talk immediately before lunch or immediately after lunch, so thank you to Dr. Zink for taking the before lunch talk. I'll talk today a lot about vernal pools in Southern California. It's an ecosystem that we also find down here south of the border, although the conservation challenges are very different in San Diego County. I think than they are here. This work represents some uh, research done in my laboratory and a lot that was done in collaboration with Marie Simovich at the University of San Diego, which is a small private college in San Diego. So uh, just to keep things clear within San Diego, we have SDSU, San Diego State University where I am. We have USD which is where Dr. Simovich is, and then of course there is UCSD, University of California at San Diego. SDSU, USD, and UCSD. <laughs> I'll give a brief outline about vernal pools. It's an ecosystem that a lot of people don't know a whole lot about. I'll discuss biodiversity from the, persp from the perspective of the crustaceans in vernal pools. Talk about just touch on some of the genetic work we've done on population genetic structure and genetic variation within one particular species, the San Diego fairy shrimp, and then concerns we have about hybridization in this species. Vernal pools are ephemeral wetlands that fill seasonally with winter, spring, and rains. Anywhere in the world where you go, there is some type of freshwater ephemeral wetland, and in these habitats, in these climates, it happens to be vernal pools. The timing and duration of these bodies of water that we call vernal pools vary regionally, even within the state of California. The vernal pools found in Northern California and the Central Valley are much, much different than you have in Southern California. They vary among years. There are some areas in which the precipitation patterns are predictable. In San Diego County, like here, the precipitation patterns in the winter are highly unpredictable. We get many winters in which there's not enough rains for these habitats to fill at all. In a winter where you get average to above average precipitation, you might get multiple filling events within one season. In the dry phase, the vertebrates that might exist in these habitats are gone because they uh, colonize it, um, let's just say opportunistically, or in the case of amphibians, they're estivating. Most species of plants and invertebrates will persist as dormant seeds or cysts down in the sediment. So in the same way that deserts have a seed bank, vernal pools have their own cyst bank. During the aquatic phase, which happens uh, from now anywhere through late spring, the pools will, will fill. The predictability is very, very low. Again, in San Diego County where we work, although it might be um, much more predictable in temporary ponds and vernal pools elsewhere. You will get rain events that fill the pool only for a day or two. You might get later rain events that fill the pool for a matter of weeks. To combat this challenge from the environment, most plants and invertebrates have evolved an incomplete germination or hatching fraction. When a rain event occurs, only a small fraction of the available propagules will hatch. 
That way, if it turns out to be a short filling event, the entire population is not lost. And then in terms of vertebrates, these pools are used opportunistically by uh, waterfowl, terrestrial vertebrates, and amphibians. Although I will say that in the pools that we work in, it, they're, not, they're not big habitats for migratory waterfowl or anything like that. They're really focused on terrestrial vertebrates and the plants and invertebrates. They're restricted to specific soil types that have a layer like clay pan, which is poorly permeable. This is a, a map of the primary soil types in San Diego County where you would find vernal pools um, for those interested in, in soils. They differ in many, many ways, and what I'll do is go through biotically how they differ, but before I get into the, the animals, first I'll just tell you about some of the abiotic differences. So the distance from the coast varies, and that uh, correlates with elevation, that correlates with precipitation. The duration of vernal pools varies, and even within one small area, you can get a very small, even on a gradual slope, a small watershed with headwater pools and terminal pools that will hold water for different lengths of time. The underlying soil, as I mentioned, is different as well as the way that these so uh, vernal pools are formed. The water chemistry, turbidity, and salinity are different. The surrounding upland habitat can vary. Obviously, extremely different going from coastal chaparral through the desert playas. And so, as an example, on the left we have uh, a vernal pool that's in a kind of an open grassy plain. Over to the right we have a vernal pool such as you might find up in the Central Valley of California or out further in San Diego County in the desert, these large open habitats that in many cases are much more turbid. So they are patchy in space. They only occur locally on areas that have the correct lay of the land, the correct slope, the right impermeable layer underneath. But when you do find them, they will occur together in small clusters. So this is a map showing in the foreground a cluster of pools on Marie Corps Air Station Miramar, which is one of the places where we do work. And then from there, the nearest vernal pools are off back in the distance labeled with the small blue flags. In the United States, about 20 of the specialized flora and fauna are named as endangered or threatened species by the federal government and also by the state of California. And uh, for those of you like Dr. Zink who are more familiar with the U.S. Endangered Species Act, animals carry a, a different weight, shall we say, in terms of protection than plants. So the flagship species for vernal pools in Southern California really is this creature over there on the right, this crustacean. That's the San Diego fairy shrimp. Uh, if you're not familiar with fairy shrimp, uh, they're relatives, distant relatives of Artemia, uh, brine shrimp, or sometimes uh, we call them sea monkeys if you're ordering them from the back of a comic book, right? These pools differ hierarchically. As you move from geographic to geographic region, from ge I'm sorry, from geographic region to region, you get different types of pools. These are going to be separated, you know, often by hundreds of kilometers, sometimes by less than 100 kilometers. And the water chemistry and the soil chemistry, the temperature, the elevation, the precipitation patterns are going to be quite different at that scale. But even when you get down to a local area, you can find these clusters of pools that are perhaps hundreds of meters apart. And these clusters or complexes of pools have both above ground hydrologic linkages when there's sufficient, sufficient precipitation, but also below ground water flow. And when you get within a pool complex, you'll get clusters of vernal pools separated by tens of meters or less with, again, potential surface flow connections and the size and the depth varies. And then even when you follow one pool over many filling events from year to year, those vary in duration and timing. So there's a rich, highly diverse uh, set of plants and animals found in vernal pools, but poorly studied. Two strategies that these plants and animals would use to persist, as I mentioned earlier. You have facultative species that actively colonize, like burns and amphibians. And then you have the obligate species that really have nowhere else to go. Um, there's sort of two phases in terms of colonization or dispersal. The first is if you had a brand new habitat, how would things get there? 
So for that initial colonization phase, probably if it's a long distance, it's going to be something like a bird, either that's um, consumed one of these plants or animals and has resistant propagules inside of it, or stuck to its outside, stuck to its feathers. You can get large mammals that will move these things around. But to be frank, in these habitats in San Diego County, I don't think that's a, f a frequent long distance dispersal mechanism. Nonetheless, once things are established, annually they're going to keep coming back from this resistant cedar cyst bank. Um, the genetic data we have and the species distribution suggests that dispersal and gene flow is not high once you get beyond the scale of these pool complexes. It, these vectors for transport aren't moving plants and animals across the landscape at high rates. And this leads to high genetic drift or local adaptation, and I'll show some, some data for that. So these are data from a variety of surveys that Marie Simvich had done in different places. In Southern California, circled uh, with the red at the bottom, 23 of these pool complexes, and within them, just looking at the crustacean community, 30 morpho species, and I say morpho species because especially with the ostracods, a lot of these species don't have a name. Um, about half are undescribed, and many of them are endemics. The blue oval shows a different survey that she did up in Northern California, which includes clay pan pools, hard pan pools, uh, volcanic mud flow, and so forth. 67 morpho species across that survey, and about 44% undescribed, about 50% California endemics. And so when you compare species diversity within and between these scales, we can move from the southern part of the state up to the northern part of the state and look at a species accumulation curve. So on the left, how many species would you have if you just started in San Diego County? As you move then and go up through these various sites in Northern California, which represent the last four clusters of bars, you keep adding more and more unique species. Those unique species are indicated with the sort of dark yellow or green um, bars. And so by the time you get up to Northern California across this series of surveys, you've got 90 crustacean species in total with local endemicity in all of these regions. Within a complex, the species that you have are different. Again, I'm sorry, between complexes in a local area. So within, let's say, coastal mesa pools in San Diego County, you still see species differences. And when you get to any particular individual complex, a, a cluster of pools, it could be two, it could be five, it could be up to 10 pools, even if you sample them for every filling event for multiple years, you'll you still won't get all of the species that are found regionally. So these species distributions vary. It's like a lot of other habitats. You have some species that are ubiquitous, so those first uh, five to six rows in the table, as you move across pool to pool, and this is just within one small area, one complex of pools that are, again, less than 100 meters apart. You've got five or six species that are found everywhere. As you move further and further down the species list, you find species that are restricted to smaller and smaller subsets of the pool. But one thing that's true, a pool that stays full longer will have more species every single year than pools that don't hold water as long. And that's because there's a progression over time as species replace one another. And this occurs not over a matter of, of months, but sometimes over a matter of days or weeks. Here's a single pool. Here is the number of species that you would see from filling events from 1998 through 2003. And so in any particular year, you would see anywhere from nine up to 16 species. But it, across the whole data set, the total number of species is 18. There's no single year in which you would see all the species present. So 
in terms of trying to really understand the biodiversity of these patterns, it's a long-term investment, which is why Dr. Simvich has spent the majority of her career working on this. Um, the true underlying diversity patterns really can't be seen from a single, single sampling event. In San Diego County, the biggest threat we have to vernal pools that have not already been lost to development is continued development. So by the time we were in the late 1990s, already estimates are that more than 95% and probably 97% of these habitats that were historically present had already been developed, and we know that more have been lost since then. In fact, at this point, to go find vernal pools in San Diego County to work on, the only really ones that remain are either on military bases where they're protected or else owned by the city of San Diego or the county of San Diego. Uh, perhaps they're in a fenced off area that was set aside as a preserve. Perhaps they're in a fenced off area that surrounds a watershed that's used to protect a drinking water reservoir. And the types of disturbance and loss vary. So just as an example, um, oh, so in the bottom left, there's a black and white picture, which is an aerial photo of the area near San Diego State University, where I work, from the 1930s. And uh, you probably can't see it in the back, but there's a bunch of tiny little white dots that might look like noise, but each one of those is a vernal pool that you can see as an opening in the vegetation from an aerial photo. And then the development on the right is what it looks like now. So all of the mesa tops that are easy to develop had large numbers of vernal pools on them historically. Um, how, in addition to the loss of pools, how else are they modified? A lot of it has to do with destruction, physical destruction of the habitat by vehicles. And there's a variety of vehicles. There are military vehicles that frequently are on or near these vernal pools on a variety of the bases for training exercises. There are recreational vehicles. People will take their truck or their ATV, ATV out from place to place and like to drive through the mud. There are utility vehicles from, uh, let's say, the, the phone company or other utility service vehicles that will move through these open spaces from time to time. It destroys the physical structure of the pool. It kind of grinds it down. And so instead of having these coastal vernal pool habitats with cobbles in them and a highly varied uh, plant community, they basically become pulverized uh, road ruts. They resemble the inland desert playas, which tend to be cloudy um, and have a very different water chemistry than they do the original vernal pools. And in addition, if these vehicles are moving back and forth between vernal pool complexes or even across the entire county, they're homogenizing the underlying biota. They're erasing this unique genetic signature, the endemicity that's part of the habitat. And so Marie calls this, uh, this is her homogenization cascade hypothesis. You have at the top homogenization of the landscape, which is both loss of habitat area, but also the disturbance of the physical structure. So it all starts to look the same. This leads to the loss of different types of pools under abiotic homogenization, different uh, lower uh, I'm sorry, fewer pools, lower numbers, and also pool variability differs also. Instead of having pools that are both shallow and deep, pools that might have a variety of different upland uh, plants near them, they all become much more similar. The plants and animals get homogenized. The species composition gets homogenized. The generalists tend to expand their ranges. Communities become more simple. And then at the bottom, this can lead to genetic homogenization, I'll show some data for in a moment, and also taxonomic homogenization when the endemics are lost locally. And so, you know, if, if the species area curve looks something like this, which is this typical species area curve, as you add more and more pools going from left to right, you get more and more species. You know, if we're already down in this section that's got a blue box around it from past losses, there's a whole suite of species that were present in the past that we don't even know about now. The communities that exist with every uh, continued loss become more similar. And so the numerous species um, 
that are already listed continue to be in peril because most of them are endemics and not generalists. So this is the San Diego fairy shrimp, Branconectus sandiganensis, uh, the same species that you have here in Baja California, at least in the northern part, along the coast. Um, that's a female, and you know she's a female because she's carrying eggs in an external oversac. So the species has only been recognized relatively recently. It was only named in 1993 by Mike Fugit at, the, at UC Riverside. It has rapid development. It can mature when these pools fill in 10 to 14 days. And if the pool does not dry out, it might live for uh, up to three weeks, uh, perhaps four, but usually two to three weeks. It produces, as I mentioned earlier, these desiccation-resistant cysts, which are not, um, you know, they're embryos is what they are. They're fertilized embryos. They've undergone actually many stages of development. Under the microscope, they look like little golf balls, and they're actually fairly, fairly hard on the outside. It's not chitin. I don't know what complex polysaccharide thing it is, but it's some complicated molecule that probably even the fungi can't uh, break down. It was federally listed as an endangered species in the United States in 1997, um, in part probably, as Dr. Zink alluded to, for political reasons, to get an animal listed as a flagship for these pools. When you find undisturbed vernal pools, it will be present in coastal San Diego, but the main reason for its listing is because, again, more than 95%, perhaps 97% of the habitats that originally existed are now gone. Um, only in these coastal mesas and these coastal foothills. Once you move further inland, it's replaced by a different species. And I just, I have to show, you know, I hate to, I hate to just show sad pictures, but okay, here's a sad picture. This is an area, it's a suburb of San Diego called Mira Mesa that when it was developed was completely covered with uh, vernal pools, you know, and so Right there, there's this one tiny little plot. You know, it's, I don't know. It, it's bigger than the stage I'm standing on, but not much. And they put a fence around it. And so that's, that's the vernal pool that they saved from this entire landscape that you're staring at. One fenced in little thing, completely surrounded by suburbia. And, and then, like a year ago, I'm out there in this part of San Diego. And you see anything different? There's like a big line under it now. And then they just like build a, an on-ramp to the freeway right there, right next to it, as if insult needed to be added to injury. So these threats, even in areas that have fences around, continue to exist. That's 15? That's Interstate 15 running north-south that goes uh, up to, if you go far enough, we'll take you up to Riverside. Uh, again, here's the picture I showed earlier of this aero photograph from the 1920s or the 1930s on the left in an area that on the right is now San Diego State University. And interestingly, I, I don't have a lot of data on habitat modeling or climate modeling, but there was a really nice paper by Chris Pike back in 2004 where he did hydrologic modeling of vernal pools from Northern California and considered the compounded effects of both loss of these vernal pools in the future, but also climate change. And he made a, an interesting point that uh, I've also seen others discuss. Let's imagine that you have a species that exists within some sort of environmental range, and that's in green, labeled with A. And that could be precipitation, it could be temperature, it could be elevation, whatever it is. Climate change is going to shift that environmental range over to the right, and that's B. But then, in addition to the effects of climate change, what you've got to think about carefully when planning is where will addition, ha additional habitat losses occur within that curve for B? So is it going to be a, kind of a random sunset right in the middle of curve B, which would, you know, be, um, sorry, I'm looking here, which would be actually not represented here. So what they have represented here in the top figure on the right is that the random subset that's not going to be lost to further development is not in the middle of B. It's actually skewed off to the right, and it exceeds almost entirely the original range of species A, whereas in the second panel down, if, the, if after climate change, 
the proportion of the habitat that's retained occurs in the part of the distribution that's skewed left, now it actually might remain firmly within where habitat A is now. And again, in this paper, Chris Pike applied this conceptual model to some hydrologic models of vernal pools. So a little bit of uh, genetic data. Uh, probably more than 10 years ago, I did some sequencing of uh, mitochondrial DNA, and then more recently we developed microsatellites, and we have some genomic markers in development from transcriptomes at this time. And this is from, again, San Diego County. We don't have any samples from Mexico, although I'm hoping that my new collaborator, there she is. I'm hoping we'll be able to work together in efforts to complement these data with more from south of the border. Um, so in sequencing 340 individual fairy shrimp from 31 different pool complexes, we recovered what you might call a reasonable amount of variation for this particular gene, 53 unique mitochondrial DNA haplotypes. And the take home message for the next set of slides that I'll show you is that undisturbed complexes all contain unique mitochondrial DNA haplotypes that you don't find anywhere else. At the biggest scale within this species, there's these two very, very divergent mitochondrial DNA clades. Within each of them, I don't have a name for them, so we'll just call them A and B. Within each of these two clades, A and B, there's less than 1% divergence, and there's about 2.5% divergence between A and B. And this is still much, much less than divergence for this gene from the nearest uh, other branchia species that we have. So it's, they're, they're not two species. It's definitely one species if we were going to go on genetic distance. The other interesting thing is there's one haplotype right in the middle that's labeled with the short red um, mark. And that one, depending on the analysis, kind of jumps around from place to place. It, it's, a, it's an early divergent um, mitochondrial DNA allele that I'll come back to in a moment. So then you look at a map and you kind of expect all of the reds to show up in one place and all the yellows to show up in a different place, but that's not what we find. We find that these red and yellow haplotypes, the ones from clade A and clade B, are separated out in some unusual pattern on the landscape. It's not simple. Um, and to this point, I still don't have a nice clean explanation for these patterns. You know, we looked at soil type and other environmental factors, you can't easily find something like soil type or precipitation or water chemistry that correlates extremely well with these A and B haplotypes. But back to the fine scale analysis. So let's just take these two sister haplotypes up at the top labeled in red. Those are only found in one particular pool complex in one particular area down there near the border between the US and Mexico, and they're found nowhere else in the species range. And here's another haplotype over here that's only found in this one little pool that I mentioned before adjacent to the freeway, and it's found nowhere else in the species range. And there's case after case of local endemicity where you find these genotypes present only in one area. These are two haplotypes that are found only over here from clade B in a different area of San Diego. And then I mentioned when I started this, there's this one strange haplotype with deep divergence, and depending on where they do, we do the analysis, sometimes it shows up with clade A and sometimes it shows up with clade B. And that's an outlying population. It's, it's a remnant population from an area up there in Orange County that hasn't been developed yet. And so my suspicion is perhaps at least a portion of the species range um, was up in this part of California, perhaps when sea levels were higher, this was a refuge for this species, and this is the last remaining remnant of it, but it's something we need to model and look at further. And then if you get away from pools that are inside fenced areas, and you go look at pools that are more open to human activities, recreational activities, you find something different. So here I have circled in yellow an area, this is a, an urban park in San Diego, you can go out, take a walk on the trails, you can walk your dogs. And there, there are some vernal pools immediately adjacent to the trail. And they have not one haplotype, but they have many haplotypes, and they have many haplotypes, including representation from both the red and the yellow clays. So this pattern, areas that are open to human activities tend to have more diversity, shows up again and again. So this is just a matrix, not this time of species 
by pool, but this is a matrix of mitochondrial DNA haplotype by pool. So the names of the pools go down row by row, and then across the top, we have all of these haplotypes listed. And you can see they mostly fall out on a diagonal. Sometimes there's a common haplotype found in more areas, but there's a lot of genetic endemicity from place to place. Again, the exception being some of these populations that are open either to human activities or on the military bases that receive a lot of disturbance from training exercises. And from the red clade, you can see, again, the majority of all these haplotypes falling out in the diagonal. So every number represents a particular number of sequences found from a particular, particular place. Uh, we quantify genetic differences in all sorts of ways. This is one of the most common. It's a Phi-ST. It's an analog of FST, which is one of the most commonly used differentiation statistics. Zero would correspond to uh, no genetic differences among populations. And so if you just take pairs of pools within the same complex, that's the first box plot, you know, the median for those contrasts is right around zero. And then as you move up to contrast between regions, or I'm sorry, within the same region, between regions, or between those A and B clades, it just increases. And there is some isolation by distance. Now, we recently developed microsatellites, which was not easy. Um, for whatever reason, microsatellite development with crustaceans, and especially freshwater crustaceans, just never goes well which is why we just stop at this point and go do genomics, because there's no point in doing any more microcellites with them. But in any case, these results qualitatively match up with the mitochondrial DNA. Um, if we take all of the different contrasts we have between pools with the microsatellites, nearly all of them are statistically significant when we look at FST. And that's even after you correct for 1,225 multiple tests. And Divergence among complexes of pools is statistically significant as well, and for those of you who look at these numbers, it's, it's reasonably high. And um, one of the analyses we come in, commonly do in molecular ecology is to take all the genetic data when we have microsatellites and allow the data to dictate what gene pool structure might look like. So the software, in this case, is structure. It, assembles gene pools from individuals under the assumption that within a gene pool you've got random mating and all of the markers are unlinked. And depending on whether you run the analysis with two gene pools across the entire data set or all the way up to 14 consistently, this pattern of genetic endemicity is qualitatively represented, but there are some exceptions. So um, I'll show those exceptions in a minute, but just to summarize. Undisturbed vernal pool complexes have high genetic endemicity, as they did with species diversity. They're genetically distinct. Whenever we find pools that have access to human activities, rather than seeing a loss of diversity, you know, that's what you would normally expect, right? Conservation genetics. There's example after example of human disturbance leads to a loss of diversity. This is not that situation. Here, human activities homogenize the landscape and actually increase diversity from background levels. Um, including microsatellites and mitochondrial DNA. And so this landscape homogenization fits in with this conceptual idea that Dr. Simovich has about a homogenization cascade. And so one final thing about the genetics. Um, if we take this analysis with structure, again, this is the analysis that assembles gene pools from the microsatellite data, and we overlay that on those mitochondrial DNA clades, there is some uh, concordance, it's not perfect, but really there's an area that, you know, you could almost interpret as some kind of within species contact or hybrid zone. You can see that this gray, um, I don't know, it's not an oval, but the gray outline, which indicates the, mito the mi microsatellite cluster, overlaps with the underlying gray dots, which is the mitochondrial DNA data, data almost perfectly, but with a few exceptions right around there. And so with our new sampling, that big gap in the species distribution is right in the middle of Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, where we have a new project starting to look at that area in more detail. Okay, final thing I want to talk about is taxonomic homogenization, but from the perspective of hybridization. So we can key out these fairy shrimp either from mature males or from mature females. Um, the male characters are very, very subtle. 
The female characters are a little more obvious if you get the lighting uh, just right and you have samples that are well preserved. So this is a simplified diagram of what it looks like if you take Branconecta lindeli, which is a widespread species found in uh, primarily in inland habitats all throughout California, down here into Baja, over a lot of the western United States. And it has these small protuberances, you know, these small little spine, they're not really spines, but these outgrowths on its back. Branconecta sanaginensis female on the right, and they differ in terms of the placement along the body segments and in terms of the shape, whether or not it's fat or skinny, whether or not it's a double spine or a single spine. And we went through and we developed a morphological hybrid index because we started to notice some individuals that did not seem to cleanly key out to one species or the other, especially in disturbed areas. We, uh, we heard anecdotal comments from environmental consultants doing work on endangered species that they were seeing the same thing. We know that in the lab, uh, someone ran some experiments and you can hybridize these two species in the lab, even though in nature they're not found sympatrically, they're found allopatrically normally. So, Branconecta sandiganensis, again, this endangered species only in coastal vernal pools. This other species, Branconecta lindeli, is a widespread generalist. And in San Diego County, you don't find it in these coastal pools. You only find it inland, desert playas, the cloudier, uh, more turbid habitats. And you find it closer to the coast only in road ruts and other disturbed areas. Um, as I mentioned, uh, two different people have tried experiments to see if you can get them to hybridize in the lab and you can, whether or not the offspring are viable and can go through another generation. That experiment has not been done. Um, we developed a morphological hybrid index based on scoring one for each of these segments if the if lack or presence of these um, features on the backs looks like Branconecta lindeli or a score of three if it corresponds to Branconecta sandiganensis. And those scores correspond to the published species descriptions. We didn't make them up. Um, and so just maybe the last data slide here. So this is a sample data set moving from pools on the left that are typical Branconecta sandiensis pools, typical pools in coastal San Diego undisturbed where you expect to find the endangered species. And you can see on the box plots when you look at um, these characters, the score, the average score across all the segments is three, which is what we expect for a pure San Diegoensis. It's very, very close to three. If you go out into the deserts of San Diego County and you sample playas, which is the typical habitat for Branconecta lindeli, you get scores down around one. And then we have a variety of uh, populations in the purple box. These are coastal pools, but they're disturbed. They're either uh, the site of active military training or road ruts with a lot of vehicle activity. And they have this wider range of scores uh, with an average somewhere in the middle, which indicates to us that it's likely to be hybridization. And so again, this homogenization cascade we've kind of worked through from the top, what goes on at this level of the landscape with disturbance and with uh, other human activities that might move these cysts around from place to place down through biotic and genetic homogenization. Um, so I'm taking these last two slides from, uh, from Marie, so prepare yourself for a real, uh, I don't know what to say, but she's got a real nice point she likes to make at the end, so I promised her I would make it. So number one, more than 97% in San Diego County of these habitats are gone. Um, undoubtedly, we've lost a lot of species and genetic diversity. The disturbed pools, especially those disturbed by vehicle disturbance, resemble these desert plies. They've lost a lot of their biotic integrity and they've become just abiotically very, very simple. A heterogeneous system, which is what we would normally have on the left, becomes more sim simplified. And so Marie likes to say, instead of having minestrone, this nice assemblage of plants and animals with 20 or more endangered species, we get pea soup on the left. So. That's it, thank you. And I can take questions if there's a minute. I have no idea how much time there is, but. Uh, 
So for uh, not all, but for some of the projects we've worked on, we have sampled the same pool for every filling event across two or three years. And you do see different species present. Some of it is predictable. There are certain species that show up first and others that show up later, but it's not all predictable. There are rare species that only show up every once in a while that you really only get a handle on after, after again, sampling every single event for many years. Is that, is that what you were asking? Just like ephemerals in the desert landscape. This is very similar system to having uh, yeah, desert, uh, desert ephemerals with, with seed banks and the whole thing, yes. The question I wanted to ask was to refer back to the work, I think, of Marty, worked on the grazing of cattle and its effect on the plants of the vernal pools, mm -hmm. which of course are also specialized. Right. And her conclusion, if I'm remembering this right, was that, that uh, devoting some of this territory to grazing uh, was of great benefit to both the cows and the species, various species of specialized plants. Right. Is there anything like that can, that you can pick up here? So there are, as I mentioned, vernal pools are extremely different as you move uh, from Northern California down to Southern California, and even as you move down here from Southern California into Baja California. Uh, in Northern California, they occur in agricultural landscapes, and they are frequently not, they don't look like this nice, uh, you know, vernal pool on the left. They're, they're, they're large, in some cases, cattle wallows. They're much more predictable in their hydrology. Um, in areas where you have grazing and where you have invasion by exotic grasses, grazing will help keep the grasses down and keep the, bio, the native biodiversity in the vernal pools high. So when that, that's, it, that's one of the, in addition, after we get through habitat loss from development, invasive grasses taking over pools is a, is a big problem. In Southern California, that gets alleviated every once in a while when we have a wildfire. But we don't have, um, we don't have active cattle grazing in these areas like they do in Northern California. So yes, there are some cases in which left alone, once the invasive grasses have set in, they thatch in the entire pool. It basically won't even hold water. And grazing or going out there with a weed whacker is a reasonable management strategy in some places. Mm -hmm. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Okay. Have there been any experimental studies of, of pools, making pools, filling pools up artificially with water and, and See so, what happens in, in so most of my experience is in San Diego County, but uh, also elsewhere in California. Creating new pools is a mitigation strategy that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does allow in some cases when pools are being lost. Uh, in Northern California, they do have mitigation banks uh, in some places set up where somebody, just a private uh, company, has dug a bunch of vernal pools and is getting ready to stock them with whatever species it is that you're going to, you know, um, lose from your particular development project. And in Southern California, we do have places where they have done um, created pools or uh, either de novo or taken pools that are um, damaged and try to re repair them. The hard part is getting the hydrology right. And um, if the hydrology can be done correctly, in some cases those newly created pools are successful. Um, but it's hard to know because when you have these long-lived propagules, these cysts and seeds that can sit dormant for many, many years, perhaps a decade, you can create a new pool, you can stock it, for lack of a better term, with, with uh, seeds and cysts from a nearby pool, and it looks fine for a year, and it looks fine for two years, and if those organisms aren't completing their life cycle and reproducing, it, it can actually take many, many years to realize that it's failing because there's a, that time lag, if that makes sense, because it's incomplete hatching or incomplete germination. But it, maybe you had a different question about creation. No, that's, that's part of the question. In other words, if in um, experimental studies in filling the pools. In filling them. Drive your own hydrological cycle. You know, it, it, no, because it's kind of hard. Because of, advantage of a dry winter and yeah, own. the problem is unless you were to surround them artificially with some kind of um, underground containment, 
you know, you could get out there and fill it with a lot of water, but it would just kind of seep out into the surrounding soil and down through the landscape that way in terms of subsurface flow. So if you were going to do an artificial experiment to increase hydro period, I guess you'd have to go out there in the landscape and, and just get a big plastic something and surround it so all the way down to the to the hard pan layer. No, nobody's done anything like that. It's an interesting idea, though. The other questions are taking up on, on your comment on the artificial pools, the problem in identifying species, which aren't there very often. Can you do the genetic study based on cysts? We've done genetic work both from cysts, but also from adults, both. And, and the cysts are tiny. I mean, it's the size of uh, a grain of salt, you know, and so it's you can get out just enough uh, material to do genetics on it, but not more. So you can do genetics of the soil, and yeah. So that's that's uh, that's sort of a project that's always in the back of my mind that we haven't done yet to be to do a um, a big survey, let's say a hundred cysts from the cyst bank, and then look at the genetic diversity in the water column from a particular hydration event, like what actually hatched out and then go out to another one and go out to another one and see if it's a random subset. And I'm fairly sure that people have probably done um, things like that with desert plants in terms of species diversity. And we've done it in terms of species diversity, but then no, we haven't done that yet with genetics. Ahora vamos a tener a Jeffrey Kirby. Eh, you can come Él tiene que instalar su computadora antes de la presentación. We can get started. Yeah. Les voy a hablar un poco de su trayectoria. Él estudió biología en la universidad. Él estudió biología en la Universidad de Richmond. Actualmente se encuentra cursando su doctorado en la en ecología en la Universidad de Penn, es ecólogo de comunidades con experiencia de trabajo en campo en Groenlandia, Etiopía, Mongolia. Su investigación se enfoca en el efecto indirecto del cambio climático en las poblaciones de grandes herbívoros en Groenlandia y cómo afecta eso la fenología de los recursos de forrajeo. Se encuentra desarrollando un programa de investigación que incorpora los vehículos aéreos no tripulados y fotografía cuantitativa time, time lapse para examinar cómo la fenología varía en escalas relevantes para los grandes herbívoros. Okay, thanks for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and to um, talk to you today. Uh, the first time I've talked about some work I've done in Greenland primarily um, using UAVs or drones. And when you think about Greenland, uh, which might not be that often, uh, you probably think about this place in the far north 
uh, place that's covered in ice uh, where there's not a lot of ecology going on. And for about 80% of the country, you're right. Uh, the surface of the middle of the country is covered by about two kilometers of ice that is um, hundreds of thousands of years old. However, along the edges, uh, in about a 100 kilometer wide band of green, and by green I mean green for about three months of the year, uh, is Arctic tundra. And that's where I do my work. I'm a community ecologist that studies caribou and their relationship uh, with the, the plant community there. Uh, so caribou are also called reindeer in European areas. And fundamentally, I'm interested in uh, the reproductive success of these caribou. And so what does that mean logistically, going out to the field in Greenland? Well, it means uh, going out with a spotting scope uh, and sitting on a hill and counting caribou. <laughs> How many do you see in this picture? 57. Uh, and then the rest of my time, I'm um, spent kind of hunched over looking at the ground, counting plants. You know, this is the life of an ecologist. This is what we do. We count things. And I'm fundamentally interested in when caribou are giving birth, how many of their calves are surviving, and then what the state of the plant community is like um, when all this is going on. However, if you look at this, there's kind of a fundamental disconnect between the space that these caribou are inhabiting and moving through and making decisions in, and the space that I'm extrapolating from about the plant community. Uh, one is rather extensive, their entire ca calving ground, uh, whereas the other is just a few plots that are about a meter square. So this is where I decided I needed a new tool, and that was a drone. Uh, but so when you say the word drone, you know, usually the lights dim and smoke comes into the room. Cause it's, it's a bad word, right? Uh, it's a very political word at the moment. And in the media, you know, it's often associated with war or spying. But I want to detach you from that word a little bit. Usually they're talking about um, actual airplane-sized vehicles that cost millions of dollars and require a real pilot uh, to fly. I uh, don't have access to any of those things. Uh, real pilot training or millions of dollars. But uh, I found a model um, that has been set up by this organization called Conservation Drones, uh, where it takes a much smaller scale approach to acquire new data using a relatively simple system. And that's just comp uh, composed of four parts. Uh, one is a small model aircraft or a, a, a multi-rotor helicopter kind of device. And you see that in the upper left there. I mean, these weigh maybe two or three kilograms uh, made out of styrofoam and have been part of the hobby community for many years. The big advance that has allowed this to kind of be um, brought forward as a tool for ecologists is the autopilot system. And this is just a small computer, um, often either based on Arduino or uh, one of its um, Similar, uh, similar computer types that has a GPS integrated with it. It has a barometric altimeter, um, accelerometer sensors, all packed into a very small area. And that hooks up with the navigation system on the airplane. Add to that a small uh, payload and open source software that you can program in uh, the flight route that you want, and you have the conservation drone model. So, we can just break these down into their constituent parts. Um, and again, very simple. These aren't things that you have to go to NASA to, to dig out of their, their research and development program. Um, for video systems, GoPros work great. If $400 is too much for you for the new Hero 4, um, there's many other alternatives like this small Mobius camera. Um, there's nothing special about them. Uh, for my work uh, in relatively complex mapping um, missions, I use a Canon S100. Uh, I bought refurbished from the factory for $150, and I found a great community online uh, called CHDK, uh, which is a software development team that people have figured out how to hack into these cameras um, and write your own scripts to allow either this small computer I was telling you about to control the shutter 
or to write your own interval timer so you have a pulse of pictures every few seconds and a wait, a delay, all these things, just very simple coding and it's all loaded up on your memory card which you can take in and pull out, doesn't affect the camera at all. If you want something um, a bit more complex, there's alternatives out there. Uh, Sony makes some great mirrorless cameras that have larger megapixels, which are good for certain mapping missions, overkill for others. Um, just what I'm getting at is that these are affordable, over the counter, um, remote sensing devices if applied properly. And those are the physical components of a conservation drone. So, how does one fly a conservation drone? Well, the, the big secret is that you don't actually fly it. It flies itself. Uh, you can pre-plan all of your flights with open source, freely available software uh, that integrates imagery from Google Earth. Um, so this is an example uh, from Sumatra. But there's all sorts of different missions you can plan just by clicking on the map, setting out waypoints, and determining the elevation that you want the drone to be at at that place. So you can do a quick scout of an area or survey specific geographical locations that you've identified in Google Earth, like bends in a river or scanning an area for land use changes. Or if you know there's an area with the potential for um, poachers to be there, you can send it over there. Either on an out and back mission or just have it circle, taking pictures, sending back video, um, even a live feed. My primary missions are a bit more complex and all of this is handled in this open source software um, and you can set out a carefully measured pattern that ensures there's sufficient overlap between the pictures that are taken by these um, you know, regular over the counter cameras um, to allow for more um, in detailed systematic uh, photogrammetry analyses uh, once you're back in the lab or back in the truck, whatever. Uh, this also allows for images to be stitched together into a large mosaic and used as kind of a, a stand-in for a satellite image. So with all those components, the only remaining element is just getting out into the field, um, getting an excited field assistant and uh, launching your conservation drone. It takes off and you can sit down, read a book, worry about if it'll come back or not. Uh, it usually does. And before you know it, it lands automatically or manually depending on how you feel comfortable in the wind conditions and you have about 500 pictures sitting in your lap. That's where it gets interesting. Uh, so all of the components I've described so far um, are just simply concerned with gathering images from above. You know, you could be taking the same kind of thing from an airplane. Um, for some projects that's sufficient. Uh, but often there's more post-processing that you can do to produce and create your own useful data products, build covariates that have more broad applications for an ecologist like myself. So primarily I use this one program called PhotoScan Pro, uh, which is a photogrammetry suite and I process my images um, using techniques called structure for motion. And it has the ability to generate 3D structures of environments. Um, mosaic the images together and then ortho rectify them as you would get from a satellite image. And then export them into ge uh, geospatial analysis software like um, ArcMap or Google Earth. Um, the downside is that uh, you need some serious computing uh, power to get away with this sometimes. It's very simple processes repeated millions and millions of times. So um, just processing about 70 or 80 images at a high resolution can take you know, six or seven hours on this computer. So it's worth uh, investing in RAM if you're going down this route. This isn't your only option, however. There are open source programs available. Uh, they're a little less user friendly at the moment, but there's a lot of work um, going on online to make them more accessible and um, powerful. But one of the positives with PhotoScan is that you also get um, error quantifications in what you're doing. So you have an idea about um, data quality in your product. Um, and this is automatically generated by the program. Uh, it gives you data quality metrics like the amount of overlap that you have for each image, um, the amount of relative error in how the computer guessed where the camera was when it was building the structure for motion model. And it can, you can make decisions about you know, whether you want to tweak, add in more pictures, take pictures out and rebuild your um, model later on 
um, based on the desired level of accuracy. Some of these images you can get uh, pixel size of two to three centimeters um, and an error of you know, around five centimeters in the XY and maybe six centimeters in the Z depending on what type of GPS you're using on the drone and then on the ground if you use ground control points. So uh, a, few, a few months ago I was just out testing some of this stuff on a farm in central Pennsylvania and this is the type of data that can come out of it. This is a combination of an orthophoto and a digital elevation model um, generated in about half an hour of flying. Just drove up my car, pulled out uh, my travel golf bag that has my drone inside of it and sent it up and brought it back. Um, oh, I should have, you can also count sheep in this picture too if I blew it up if I had the original but you'll have to take my word for that one. And the processing took about six hours. So now you have a general idea of this conservation drone model, what you can roughly do with it. And uh, now I'm going to tell you some of the things that I'm doing with it. Um, have tried up in Greenland and sometimes succeeded, sometimes failed, ideas I'd like to pursue further. Um, while at the same time giving you a, a brief uh, overview of some of the themes of my ongoing research there um, in ecology that doesn't um, exclusively rely on drones. But uh, I can always go into more details later too if you're upset with my lack of methodologies. So the ecology of the Arctic, perhaps more so than any other region, is defined by seasonal temperature changes, changes in daylight, changes in precipitation. And um, having an interest in community ecology, I'm particularly interested in how this annual abiotic cycle uh, influences primary productivity, uh, which in turn has the effect on um, population level processes in large herbivores like caribou. Um, so this is a nice satellite composite, um, I think from the MODIS satellite, showing kind of the breathing pulse of you know, arctic greening and then whitening, which is kind of the norm. What's the scale? Oh, so each um, of those white dots in the upper corner is one month. Um, so. And the scale is the whole globe. So uh, our field site's located in southwest Greenland, just north of the Arctic Circle, about 150 kilometers inland from the Davis Strait. So we get 24 hours of daylight in the summer, and then in the few trips when I'm up in the winter, we get 24 hours of darkness, and uh, it's not as much fun. We fly up with the Air National Guard on these C-130s so I can bring as many drones with me as I want without having to worry about cargo. We also brought up car engines and all sorts of strange things on these. So this location of 150 miles inland is a caribou calving ground area that we found, well not we have, but other researchers have found evidence that caribou have been calving there for about the past 4,000 years, right since the ice left and caribou again came onto the west coast of Greenland. And so it's a highly conserved area where the caribou migrate to um, from the west to the east uh, in May each year. So based on uh, you know, many hours of counting plants um, and daily changes, so this is at a daily time scale, uh, changes in the life history development or uh, the phenology, uh, of plants on a series of meter square plots. Um, my advisor first, and then he got wise and, and brought me in, uh, have spent a lot of hours counting and observed a pattern in the annual timing of plant emergence at this site. And that's what I'm showing here in this graph. Just a time series uh, on the bottom. This one goes through 2011, but this pattern does continue to present. Um, and then on the y-axis, we just have the day of the year when 50% of the plant species that we ended up observing uh, were emerging. And you can see that there's an advance of about two to three weeks in the timing of when plants are starting to grow in this environment, uh, which is you know, pretty significant to me as someone who's um, been out there and is, as you'll see later, significant to herbivores. So what does this mean for herbivores, specifically in the context of caribou reproductive strategies? Well, for most of the year, uh, plant nutritional quality in the Arctic is pretty poor um, because it's, uh, 
close to being dead or covered in snow and not much growth is going on because there's no sun. Um, how herbivores eke out a living there uh, in the winter is fascinating to me, but a big part of their annual success is restocking up on nutrition during the annual period of emergence when plants are most nutritious, packed full of protein, and not defended well either chemically or structurally um, from herbivores. And so you can visualize this as kind of a peak in forage quality that happens quickly with emergence. Emergence happens very fast and then dissipates as this protein gets spread out in plants and they become more defended. An advance in the timing of spring is essentially moving this pulse of available nutrition earlier in the season. So caribou have resource needs that vary throughout the year and the peak of their energetic demands, um, like most mammals, come during periods of reproduction. So I'm talking about females uh, right now. And I've just overlaid the phenology or the timing of when caribou are giving birth at this site uh, with that same advance in the timing of spring. And you can see that there's very little change over this um, about 10 year period uh, that we've been out monitoring. And also looking back in the literature, there were some Danish teams uh, in the 1970s looking at when caribou were calving and the dates are almost identical. So we have about a two day range over a 35 year period of when caribou were giving birth and it's a relatively um, fixed trait based on what we've seen uh, empirically. Uh, whereas the advance in plant phenology is not that. So we can visualize this again with another kind of model where in some years, um, particularly um, around like 2003, 2004, uh, there seems to be an overlap in when forage quality is peak and when forage demand is highest by these female caribou that need to provision their young by making high quality milk and recover the body mass that they've lost over the winter. In other years, uh, we see a, a temporal gap between these two or, or a mismatch between resource um, quality being high and resource demand being high. And we call this a, a trophic mismatch. So this is just a visual model. And we've quantified uh, these differences um, by using our um, plot-based measurements of plant phenology and then our field-based measurements of just counting when caribou are giving birth and um, how many of those caribou are surviving the first month of their life. Um, this is a critical period in their life history where in some populations there's up to 90% mortality of caribou calves um, during this first month. So it's um, an important determinant of kind of population level processes. So um, on the y-axis, we have caribou calf proportion after the end of this um, critical period. Um, and it's, it's a ratio, so it's not, um, um, I think it's the, it's the total number of calves to the total number of individuals we saw, both females and calves. And if we regress that just against our index of trophic mismatch, uh, there's a very clear relationship in uh, low caribou calf survival and therefore productivity in years of high mismatch and vice versa. So this is a very, um, you know, interesting story. Uh, it's a clear example of trophic mismatch, um, but there's still a good deal of residual variation there as well as, you know, some spatial scale issues with some of our data. Um, and so what about the spatial dimension? And when you talk about large herbivores, um, particularly caribou, they're a highly mobile animal. Um, that's one of their defining characteristics. They migrate annually hundreds of kilometers, if not more, and even in a single day, they'll move around um, dozens, if not more, kilometers. So given this ability, if vegetation phenology is temporally mismatched or unsuitable in one area, uh, they may just have the ability to move somewhere else where forage quality is better. And if we don't have that information on our plots, you know, it's lost to us. So here's uh, just a, a GIS map showing all of the locations and uh, the group sizes of, of caribou that I spotted in June of 2011. Um, and this data takes a long time to collect, uh, a lot of walking up and down hills, and it's really fun for like the first week, but we've been doing it for years, you start wondering like, all right, like what else could I be doing with my time? Not that I enjoy doing this. 
Um, and so we're currently exploring uh, with UAVs or drones um, other ways to gather this information. And so last year we brought um, this model up to Greenland. Oh, sorry, this is two years ago. We brought this model up to Greenland uh, to see if we could sense some animals with it. So I set up a nice uh, airport up on the frozen lake. I uh, figured I couldn't run into anything out there. Uh, and it's fortunate that stays frozen until about July. So we have some leeway there. Uh, this is from May, however. Uh, programmed up a mission. I uh, was pretty confident about it. And then uh, just flicked the switch and uh, put on a show for my lab mates. And drone takes off, flies around, kind of disappeared behind a hill, came back, and it's like, that wasn't necessarily the exact flight plan that I planned on it. And I noticed that there was some grass stuck in the front of the plane. I was like, how did that get there? We, we took off from a frozen lake. Uh, and I looked through the flight log later, and I had, you know, this being my first time, I, I did a bad mission plan, and I didn't factor in the winds right. I guess over on this hill, it came down, bounced into the ground, but it was at a nice shallow angle, so it just took off again, and then completed the mission, no problem. So one of those little, uh, you know, thank yous for, for helping me out there, whoever was in charge of that one. Um, but this is the kind of data that we get from it. Uh, clearly, that is a juvenile caribou. Uh, if you zoom in, you can get a bit more information about it. But uh, we're looking for more uh, demographic information. We get uh, distribution information because all these pictures are geo-referenced. Uh, we get information about reproductive phenology, if animals have calves with them or not. Um, and also some information about abundance. And it, it saves us some time. We also get information about other species. Anybody know what those are? <laughs> uh, so those are musk oxen, uh, another large herbivore uh, from the Arctic. So it collects ancillary data while all of this is going on, which is great if you're going to go back you know, a few years from now and be like, oh, maybe I should have done a project on musk oxen, just didn't take notes. They're all there now. So this is kind of a crude level of um, census thing that I'm doing. Um, others at other universities are making more progress and hopefully, you know, for the rest of us we'll have this kind of be a common technique soon. So this is from, uh, this was shared with my colleagues at Conservation Drones, um, some researchers at Monash University in Australia. Uh, we're using a quadcopter at 75 meters above the ground to survey frigate birds. And they wanted to compare counts from the ground, counts in the air, just kind of develop a new method. And you, know, you can understand why, uh, when you look at the density of frigate birds on this beach, it might be appealing to them. However, what's exciting is about um, bringing in um, new computer analyses that are able to run algorithms to do the counting for you. Um, and so you can run the algorithm, see how many birds um, it identifies, compare that with your own counts on the ground in the air, and then eventually gain enough trust to just let it go on its own. So that's the, the census angle. Um, but you know, herbivores are only one part of my drone work in Greenland. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, all of those long-term pa patterns in plant phenology that I was talking about are derived from these meter squared vegetation plots. The landscape in Greenland, and this is our camp right here. Uh, you can see that's an eight-person tent, so it's a pretty big tent. Uh, all of these plant phenology plots um, don't capture the variability in the landscape of terrain, slope, aspect that are all important factors in determining what um, you know, plants do in their development and how they time it. So I uh, turned to this um, other kind of near surface remote sensing technique um, that was um, developed or at least popularized by Andrew Richardson, uh, who's now at Harvard, uh, called a phenocam. And so I've been doing this for the past three years, um, augmenting our human-based observations. So what a phenocam is, at least for my purposes, uh, is just a very small time-lapse camera that um, is designed to be put in people's gardens, but I'm putting up on the tundra in Greenland, and they're somehow surviving these cold winters. Uh, it takes uh, five pictures a day, runs on AA batteries, and I just point it at the ground and then come back a year later. And this is the kind of data that comes out of it. Uh, you get 
nice flower phenology information. Um, you, know, you can see the segregation there. Um, but you also get uh, quantitative information in the digital numbers of these images. So every pixel in a digital image is made up of three numbers. Um, it's digital numbers. It's red, it's blue, and it's green digital number. And these range between 1 and 255. And what you can do is select a subset of an image, a region of interest, um, either this birch patch, like in red, or this um, willow patch in blue, uh, the blue ones on top, and do an analysis of all of the green digital numbers in that and do a ratio of those to the other digital numbers to control for illumination differences, and then just plot them through time. And what you have is a nice uh, phenology curve that you can fit models to and derive indices from. Um, and at a species-specific level, doing, um, pulling out information from various parts of a single image. So this is just comparing the birch and the willow from 2011. So I've, you can tell I'm looking for ways to avoid counting things myself. This is kind of my MO, I guess. Um, I didn't have one of these cameras. I set up 50 of these cameras over a 40 square kilometer area. Uh, in, a, in a way designed to kind of maximize the variability in landscape and terrain uh, that was available out there. Um, and it also corresponds to the core calving area of the uh, caribou herd. So this is just um, kind of up against the inland ice um, about 40 square kilometers. And right now this is pretty preliminary and I have a bunch of uh, logistic curves that I can extract phenology information from. That's great. I have point estimates at sub-daily resolution at 50 different places, and now I want to interpolate all of those. Uh, I want to know how the landscape kind of breathes um, for these caribou, and so then it's time to bring out the drones again. I want some nice covariates to go along with this. So, you know, make sure it's all balanced. You don't want it crashing again. And you just send it up, and it flies its mission. This is flying over uh, some of our long-term plots in, uh, near our campsite. And throughout this whole time, taking hundreds and hundreds of pictures, uh, and then returning again. And you can put a GoPro on the top of it, too, if you just want some nice views. Like this. this is June right here. So here's one of the images. You can see for scale, it's me standing on the ground in the kind of upper middle part there. Uh, you can uh, map out caribou trails, um, all sorts of you know, clear distinctions, species-specific um, uh, plant groups, and mosaic them all together in this photo scan program I talked about uh, to build high resolution, a few centimeter resolution, um, real time of the day that you want it to be, Orthomosaics mosaics or surface models. And this is just a picture draped over the top of one of these surface models. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested in hydrology or, you know, kind of micro habitat scale um, measurements um, of topography, this is just a great tool to have. And it even modeled a little bit underneath the lake surface because it was, the water was clear enough, you could see what was going on there. So now I have a bevy of um, covariates that I'm using in my phenology models and you know, maybe I'll talk to you about the results of all of that in another year or so. Other projects that we have going on are some historical imagery comparisons. Uh, recently, uh, the US government declassified some old satellite pictures that were, and old um, airplane pictures that were very high resolution of an area near our field site. Luckily, there was an old US Air Force base nearby, and so that was, I think, part of the reason why they were taking pictures of the tundra in the 1960s. Uh, we looked at Google Earth to see you know, what kind of imagery might be available there. We looked into purchasing some satellite photos, um, and then we're like, oh wait, we just have our own kind of near-surface satellite equivalent that we can use. Let's go run some missions in the areas where those old satellite uh, photos were good. So that's what we did, planned some missions, ran them. Uh, you can see one exported into Google Earth up here, um, much clearer than what we had uh, available to us just looking at. And we're looking at uh, shrubification of the Arctic right now. So we're looking at how um, carbon sequestration uh, 
can be affected by an increase in shrub biomass that we've seen throughout the Arctic, and we're trying to figure out, you know, is it happening here? Where is it happening in Greenland? Um, and that is something I'm collaborating on with one of my lab mates um, at Penn State. Another uh, within Penn State collaboration is looking at uh, vegetation responses to treatment. Uh, so here's another um, kind of drone map that I made, except this time I didn't use the airplane, I used a small quadcopter that was flying uh, about nine feet above the ground. So very low to the ground, taking hundreds of pictures. We have warming cones, we have herbivore exclosures, and I wanted to see where in these exclosures are we seeing uh, volumetric changes in um, plant growth throughout the year. So our plan is to go back and do a time series of this throughout the year, and you can look at the underlying volume of any of the you know, geo-reference plants in this to see and start subtracting layers on top of each other and look at, at change curves there. Another possible advantage to having drones, and this is more just for fun, is taking them to places that's too dangerous to go to, um, you know, as a grad student at least. Um, this is the face of the Russell Glacier, which is just next to our camp, and it's a really pretty place, but it's often calving, and it almost uh, killed two researchers this summer that were doing some, some water measurements right there. So drones offer the ability to allow you to get close to a dangerous place in a really intimate way, whether it be for nice visuals like this or for attaching some sort of sensor to it um, and you know, gathering scientific data. So, I've been showing you all the good stuff so far. There have been some lessons learned along the way, um, and particularly avoiding mayhem wherever possible. You know, and there's some kind of straightforward and obvious lessons to take from this, but they bear repeating. Um, permits can always be an issue in some places. Other places it's not an issue, but it's something you need to factor in when you're doing this. Um, the regulations are pretty convoluted in the U.S. right now as they apply to research. Um, as long as you're doing it for fun, it seems like you can get away with a lot more in the U.S. Uh, sounds like Mexico is very progressive here. Um, Ethiopia is not progressive. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Uh, keep it simple. Don't shoot for the moon right when you're starting uh, because you'll just crash. Um, and if possible, try before you buy. Um, there's a very frequent story that I've heard from um, my colleagues at Conservation Drones that have been doing this much more in depth uh, for a few years. Um, where people will get excited, they realize the potential of drones, which are very clear. They buy one and they buy the wrong one. They drop a few thousand dollars. They don't realize what kind of time investment they have and then they end up just shelving it. Um, so it's worth doing you know, your research, just like buying a car or something just a lot cheaper um, before you, you invest in this. Um, these are just tools, you know, drones aren't science to me, it's just a tool to get science so, you know, it's not the end-all solution. You still have to uh, come up with some new questions. Um, however, it's just wide open, uh, getting information at spatial and temporal scales that logistically before were just totally unfeasible and now we can get at some, you know, fundamental and classical questions with these and, you know, apply this in any ecosystem, you know, the Arctic, um, around here, Ethiopia if they give you permits, anywhere. Um, and then understanding limitations, which I kind of touched on. So I would hope to give a talk um, about where I've been for the last six weeks. I've been in the highlands of Ethiopia um, with um, this herd of monkeys. Uh, this is about uh, 3,400 meters in elevation above the tree line. And uh, I've been working on and off in this region for the past seven years. And some collaborators at Michigan called me up and said, hey, you know, we have no idea how many monkeys, how many gelada monkeys there are um, in Ethiopia. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of land use change going on here. There's a lot of problems um, with kind of human wildlife conflict. It's time we do a census of them. Drones would be a great idea, wouldn't they? And I said, yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea. So we got our permits together um, from the Ethiopian um, uh, security agency and dealing with customs, brought everything over there and then just kind of fell apart. Um, 
you know, just different agencies not working together and just not having a clear um, plan on how to bring drones into the field as a research thing because they are pretty new. Some places just don't have it worked out whether they want them or they, they don't. Um, so just bear that in mind. We did make some great um, connections while we were there, so I'm going to try again in February um, or March, and I think um, we'll make some progress. But all I got out of this trip was some lousy pictures. So. In, uh, in Greenland, you know, I told you about my first near escape uh, with the drone on my first flight. Um, there's some issues uh, we found out flying in the Arctic that um, not many people had run into before because there weren't that many people um, flying up in the Arctic. And that's when you combine a GPS system uh, with a magnetic compass and you don't write the software to account for magnetic declination in the compass. So magnetic north is somewhere in the middle of Canada and true north is you know, at the middle of the Arctic Ocean. And so when my drone, as smart as it is, uh, it's trying to figure out where north is and it's getting two different norths in those. It, it, it tends not to do well and it, uh, it pancaked a couple of times. Luckily uh, for something that's made out of styrofoam, it's pretty easy to fix. Uh, you just put some glue on it and tape it back up and it doesn't look as pretty as it used to, but uh, they still do fly. Um, this one eventually, I think I, I ran through its, its usable lifespan. I gutted all the components out of it, which is the expensive part, and um, I had my colleague, Brendan, who is very skilled at building these, just build me another one in $100 worth of styrofoam that he had lying around. So the investment passed on to the next generation. I had the same problems with the magnetic issues uh, with this uh, quadcopter that I have. Uh, this one's kind of over-the-counter quadcopter you can get pretty easily, but it, it does a great job. They've since fixed the software, so now it does work in the Arctic, if you're curious. So I, I, I'm often asked, um, fundamentally, like, you know, what drone should I get? And I respond, you know, well, what do you want to do with the drone? Because there's many different um, positives and negatives to different designs, like you'd expect. And so the common conversation is about multi-rotor or fixed wing. And you can kind of look at it in these three uh, general categories. Um, fixed wings, the little airplanes, they fly for much further, um, but they don't do so well when you're trying to survey a very small area. Quadcopters are great for that, especially if you're kind of going over, um, you want really high resolution digital surface models or something like that. Uh, the quadcopters can carry a larger payload, um, but for not as long. Oh, to mention flight endurance, um, some of these just styrofoam planes now can fly up to 100 kilometers on a single battery charge, um, which is incredible. I mean, most of that um, distance is covered in grid patterns, so you, um, if you're flying at 100 kilometers away and back, you might not see it again. I feel like something might go wrong, but if you're flying a 100 kilometer grid, uh, you can just cover immense amounts of area. Uh, the multi-rotors have larger payloads, so if you want to bring a DSLR um, up into the air or, you know, your own sensor that you build, you know, they're just platforms. Come up with an idea, you put a sensor on it, and, you know, you have some fundamentally fresh ideas um, about what you can measure. Uh, planes, great for um, open areas. Uh, the takeoff and landing is kind of the limitation there. Uh, you can do automatic landings, uh, but you need about 100 meters of uh, wiggle room on either side. The quadcopters, you can just pop up through a canopy, and as long as you have good um, uh, telemetry connection, no problems flying that around. Um, the quadcopter is also much easier to fly uh, if you're doing it manually. Um, Whereas with the fixed wing, it helps to have some experience flying either an RC plane um, and just understanding the different types of um, you know, potential trouble you can get in with those. So there are alternative platforms to the two that I've discussed. And people have been experimenting with these for many years. Uh, I think this is a war pigeon. I think those would have benefited from the advent of digital cameras. But um, I primarily want to just bring up the, the possibility of using um, this alternative aerial platform from 1906. 
This is before you know, there were airplanes. Uh, this was not a balloon. And if you've read further down on the slide, you'll see that it was a, a rig of kites. Um, this is a 49-pound camera taking a picture of San Francisco after the large earthquake there um, in one of the kind of early famous aerial panoramas. This is 2,000 feet up in the air on a rig of kites carrying a 50-pound payload. Maybe these ideas are not as new as you know, I'm kind of selling them to be right now. In fact, that's how I got started um, thinking about this. I was uh, reading um, an archaeology journal. Uh, one of my former housemates was an archaeologist, and he's like, oh, yeah, check this out. People have been using this in archaeology for years to uh, monitor um, um, changes in like uh, burial areas or map out dig sites. They attach a camera just by this small rig to the kite line, hang it down about 10 meters from the kite itself, and this is a 2,000-year-old design kite, and uh, just have it take an interval time where it's snapping pictures away, and uh, you can build all sorts of you know, great data products out of something like this. Um, here's some of my early you know, kite work from Greenland. This is three or four years old, and uh, for a big open space like this, I started realizing that a fixed wing was probably a better option, um, especially once I got a little more funding. But I just don't want that to take away from the kite because you know, it matches up in these other categories with the multi or the fixed wing, but it also has some fundamental advantages of it's a lot cheaper. It's really easy to carry around with you into remote areas. You don't have power that you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about airplane baggage rules. Um, and you're not going to have any permitting issues with a kite. Um, no one cares. They're pretty excited uh, when they see one. They're like, hey, cool. Like, you're an old man playing with a kite. So keep that in mind if you know, these ideas are of interest to you and you want to start exploring them without having a big outlay of cash. There's some great resources online for all of these different technologies, um, either the kites, the multi-rotors, or the fixed wings. Um, and so then you know, the important question that many were asking is, you know, why not use satellites or airplanes for some of these? these tasks? And you, know, you should when it's appropriate, um, and you shouldn't when it's not. A lot of these satellites have great uh, resolution but cost a lot of money or they don't have the temporal resolution to match the spatial resolution or, or vice versa. And so this is just another layer in you know, the, the plot based to this kind of intermediate drone um, bespoke imagery uh, that I've been talking about to these nice broad scale patterns that also have a good time series associated with them. Um, all of them uh, should be integrated together and they, I think they will be in the coming years. Um, also, um, safety is another thing too. If you're in an area you know, where you're monitoring for poachers or um, you're near a volcano or something, uh, it's not that big of a deal if you crash your $2,000 drone, whereas you know, if there's a loss of human life or the risk of loss of human life, that certainly changes the type of data that would be worth risking for. So um, that's pretty much what I have to say. Uh, it is a very... Uh, kind of narrow series of examples of what you can do with this, focused on my experiences in Greenland. Um, the team at Conservation Drones, uh, they have a website called conservationdrones.org, uh, have a great um, kind of intro to what other possibilities exist for this technology. Um, it, they're helping it spread all around the world. Um, so that's our little flag up there in Greenland. But uh, it's just really exciting, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about um, you know, thermal imaging, uh, NDVI cameras, whatever you know, you're thinking about. I'm sure there's a way to make it happen. And I uh, just want to thank uh, my lab mates and my um, field help and, and my funding sources for what I've been able to do. So with that, uh, take any questions. Yep. I think a specific question, not about the drones. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if you have to call it a drone. If you don't call it a drone, do you still need a permit? That's the thing, yeah. I think we, we kind of uh, sunk ourselves. We should have used UAV you know, when we were talking to the... Model airplane enthusiast. Yeah, That's right? That's all you really are at heart, right? Exactly, yeah. No, another lesson learned there. I can add that to the bullet list.
Now, here's my question. It's about these guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the mismatch that uh -huh. global warming is beginning to cause between their calving and what's available in the plants. Yeah. What kind of, I, I think there's here a, a scale issue, a time scale issue mm -hmm. with the data. Yeah. It is the animals are running how many generations per century or per decade? Well, so the average female will have about seven reproductive events um, in her life every other year, so 14 years. So, okay, so it, but it's on the order of, order of magnitude, 10 years, Yep. right? Yep. Um, and your censuses and surveys were about that amount. Uh -huh. So there hasn't been a whole lot of chance for evolutionary adjustment to the global warming phenomena that are occurring. Um, and I just wondered how that could be approached. I think that an evolutionist could look at the variance that was available in the, um, the reindeer, in the caribou, uh, and, and find out what proportion of the females were, were calving very early, which would have been a bad strategy, you know, a long time ago, and then calculate for you how long it would take for the caribou to come up with an evolutionary answer to the amount of, of global cha of, of, of change in flowering and, uh, that, that exists already. Yeah, no, absolutely. These are questions um, that I've thought long and hard about, about where can we get more of this information? Um, who should we talk to? A couple of things. I was a little sparse on some of the details of that when I was rushing through. Um, we also have, um, I mean, not that it's that much longer. Uh, we have information on the caribou um, spanning, but not yearly for about 35 years. Um, so we've seen um, no significant shift, um, just a two-day variance in the calving of, I think that's 99% of individuals are within this area. Um, at this site, uh, there's been a lot of work in Norway trying to figure out um, what is the kind of cue that gets, um, or that's responsible for this highly synchronized calving um, or non-plastic trait of calving in some populations there. And they've been looking at the lack of a uh, circadian clock in uh, caribou and linked that up with some brain chemistry saying that if effectively it takes a, a long time for them to have an evolutionary change in the timing of when they're reproducing. Um, they do change uh, clearly uh, because um, there's multiple calving times of caribou and reindeer throughout the Arctic. However, um, there have been some kind of incidental uh, experimental tests of just how plastic or non-plastic this trait is, where they've taken reindeer that are semi-domesticated from Europe and brought them to Alaska, and then they've released them out with the, the wild caribou there. And you know, despite sharing the same latitude um, and the same habitat, um, the caribou from Norway are still calving three weeks later um, than the Alaskan car uh, caribou are, which is the same as when they would have calved in Norway. And this has been multiple generations, been about 50 years now. Um, so I think it's an issue of rate of change um, and directionality of change in the plant community. I think, uh, you know, the Arctic has always been very variable in its seasonality. You know, one year is early, one year is late. Um, if we continue seeing this rate of change that is unprecedented in the evolutionary history um, from what we've been able to tell of these animals um, and the directionality of it, then you know, who knows what will happen. And this is only looking at reproductive success. We don't have a population dynamic kind of model yet, but I don't know. I kind of talked a lot in response to that. Hopefully something... Has anybody taken a, a, some caribou from a population that calves earlier? already and try to interbreed them with some of your guys to see if you can increase the genetic variation that would be really to, to evolve faster that'd be really cool i no, no one has done that to my knowledge but uh i hadn't ever thought about that but now i kind of hope those shanghai and evolutionists to join your team <laughs> yeah cool <laughs> Hi. Oh, um, hey. I was wondering, how do these drones work in a windy situation? 
uh, so they can work either very well or very poorly depending on how you plan to use them and which one you're using. So the, the helicopters, they don't work as well in um, very heavy winds. However, that being said, I've flown one in maybe uh, 25 mile an hour winds and it was fine, I was just nervous. So it's, it's a risk strategy, you know, the windier it is, the more likely something will go wrong. Uh, with the airplanes, as long as you're flying perpendicular to the wind, so if the wind is coming at you this way and you're going sideways, they're very good at um, being stable. They just kind of crab or change direction into the wind and go sideways. And I've flown in, in heavy winds in some parts of Greenland where I probably shouldn't have and, and they were good. But when I plan a poor mission and I fly you know, with the wind at my back and try to make a turn, um, the airplane will dive to the ground and I have to do a, like a manual override to save it from crashing. So part of it is planning, um, but it's also they're robust if you're careful. Or you could just get a kite, I guess. Hi. Uh, uh, do you have uh, any experience with NDVA camera? Um, and uh, is there a cheaper way to, to do that? I mean, you can hack a regular camera or something like that? Yeah, no, I, that's uh, high on my list of things to do. Um, NDVI is just a great thing for linking up um, these kind of medium scale measurements with the satellite record um, and also with what's going on, on the ground. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of options for just true uh, multispectral cameras out on the market. There's something called a TetraCam which costs about $4,000 and does not do a very good job because its sensor is pretty slow. So when you're moving at a high rate in this drone, it gets a little bit wobbly. Um, they're working on a new one right now that, because many people want NDVI cameras in these drones, um, that has promise. Or you could just take a, um, like a regular point and shoot, like I've said, and remove the infrared shield uh, in front of the sensor. Uh, all, cameras have a little shield that filters out the infrared light because we don't want to see things that our eyes don't see when we're taking pictures, I guess. And so that's um, a way to get kind of a NDVI loose equivalent. It's not as um, you know, tight as you could be, but it's a way to get in that direction. And then you can, uh, so this is actually a picture of one where the sensor has been taken off. Uh, this is uh, from Saba. Uh, was one of my uh, colleagues at Conservation Drones is doing it. And then you can kind of model um, photosynthetic activity or vegetation stress uh, using that. So you have kind of the, the quick fix by taking the shield off or in, I think, within a year or two, there'll be some pretty good models available for NDVI cameras. Thanks. Antes de continuar con nuestro siguiente ponente, vamos a tener unos minutos en lo que ponemos todo, montamos todo para su plática. Entonces, les pedimos no se alejen mucho de la sala. Volveremos como unos tres minutos, cinco minutos.
Saúl.
Antes de presentar a nuestro siguiente ponente, quiero eh, invitar a las personas que no tengan su constancia del evento todavía, que pasen a la mesa de enfrente cuando termine la plática para recogerla. Y bueno, nuestro siguiente invitado y para terminar con esta serie de conferencias es el doctor Michael Rosenzweig. Wait. <risa> Él obtuvo su doctorado en la Universidad de Pensilvania. Actualmente es profesor de Ecología y Biología Evolutiva en la Universidad de Arizona. Es fundador del Journal Evolutionary Ecology y editor de Evolutionary Ecology Research. Autor de libros como And Replenish the Earth, The Evolution, Consequence and Prevention of Overpopulation and Win-Win Ecology, donde introdujo el concepto de la reconciliación. Su investigación combina los campos de la ecología, evolución y teoría matemática en temas como diversidad, ecología de mamíferos desérticos, selección de hábitat óptimo y dinámica de depredación. Así que démosle la bienvenida. Muchas gracias. I'm so pleased to be here, and I thank you all of you who have worked so hard to make this happen. Um, this is a very beautiful place uh, with some very exciting people working in it. So thank you. Um, as I'm actually in the middle of my 60th year of teaching. I said that right. I can't believe it. You know, they, 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 my wife says, when are you going to retire? I said, I tried already. They gave me a pile of paperwork to fill out. I don't like to fill out papers. I'd rather die. So I'm going to keep working because I'm having fun. And I hope to show you a little bit about just the kind of fun that I'm having. Um, we are, I think, as scientists in a, a very special place because we have a problem We have a problem, and we know very well what we need to do to solve it. Okay, there's a problem, there's a solution. We can go work uh, at a bar somewhere on the latest good beer. We don't have to worry about doing science anymore. In fact, not only do we have a problem whose solution we know, we can prove that it's a problem. Hello? Yeah. Where are the Republicans in the audience? <laughs> There's no question about it. And, and so what I would like to do today um, is to talk about this problem in the light of biology and biologists. And we've heard a lot of that today, an awful lot of that, surprisingly and, and excitingly great amount of it. And that is, for biologists, the threat of global warming is loss of diversity. For a century, we know that society has been defending life forms against habitat loss by using reservations. Uh, this, this one happens to be a poster from Argentina, um, a very, very great national park, which is doing a fine job of conserving the plants and the animals within its borders. And that's what we've been doing. And we need to do that and keep doing it and do more of it. There's no question about it. But I'm afraid that in our century, this tactic of reservation ecology won't be enough. Won't be enough. It needs to be supplemented. And it needs to be supplemented by a radical change in our strategies as conservation biologists. It needs to be supplemented by having us adopt a new set of strategies to add to the old. Not to replace, but to add to the old. And I'm going to develop those for you um, uh, today. And I'm going to show you an example of what we are trying to do in the city of Tucson. Um, but for now, uh, let me just point out to you why we worry about global warming. You know this already. This is extreme South Africa with its great variety of plants. It's a separate animal kingdom down there. 
uh, or realm, whatever the plant biologists call it, I'm not one, so I don't really know, but it's, it's got three times as many species as it ought to have for its area. And what you hear in the background is sugarbird, one of the two species of sugarbirds lives only there, uh, and the other one also lives in South Africa. Now imagine what's going to happen with global warming. It's not hard. You just turn around and look in the other direction, and what you see is the Cape of Good Hope. So where are these plants going to go when the earth warms and the appropriate temperatures exist in the Southern Ocean? Where will they take root? Another very neat little example here, which is so obvious, um, comes from Australia. If we look in the south northeastern part of Australia, there are some fairly small mountain ranges, 1,000 meters, perhaps maybe a little more. And in those mountain ranges, kind of close to the top, are species of mammals and amphibians and other things that absolutely require the special environments and special temperatures that they find in those mountain ranges. One of them is the green possum. I think you can see it peering out from its leafy habitat here. We know from experimental physiology work that this animal requires, absolutely requires, a minimum and maximum temperature that are fixed. And when its temperature range is found in the air several hundred meters above the top of the mountain, where will it live? These are the things, or among the things, that make us worry about the effect of global warming on biodiversity. And they're very well known and they're very, very obvious. Now, one of the, pro the, one of the places um, which is more mainland situations where we, have, we think we have a strategy for, for working on this uh, results in, in what is called assisted migration, the strategy of assisted migration. Uh, and that is, if you can find a way to take the threatened species and actually establish new populations of them so that they can track the changing climate. So in the northern hemisphere, you move populations north, for example. Assisted relocation. Why do we care about that? Because the animals and the plants can no longer move by themselves. Their habitat is too fragmented. We've got these fairly small places, reservations or whatever, and it's been known, starting from work in Australia in the 1980s, uh, it's been known that these habitats that are preserved and protected will vanish into places where there are no preserves, and preserves are identified with particular parts of the land. This hectare and that hectare, that's what's preserved. Not the environment that they contain, but the hectareage, the actual identity of the plots of land. And so they're gone as well. So what do we do if they're fragmented? We go and we move them to a different patch that's preserved, but that now experiences a new kind of environment that, uh, that's given to them by global warming and allows them to persist. So that's a good reason, but they're obstacles. There are good reasons also why this particular strategy is of very limited use, in my opinion. One of them is we, this sort of thing gets done one species at a time. There are a lot of species, folks. You know there are a lot of species. And um, it may make us feel good to save one or two of them. It makes me feel good. But I would like to be able to say we can do better than that. Um, the second problem is it requires experts real experts, and there aren't enough of us to go around to handle all the patches that need to be treated and to handle all the species that need to be treated. And the third one is it requires immense resources, in other words, money. There is one species of salmon which has assisted migration in the Columbia River 
of, that separates um, Washington State from Oregon in the northwestern United States. And every single year, millions of dollars is spent to move these fish upstream to their old breeding grounds so that they can breed successfully again. Millions of dollars on one species in one salmon run. That's it. We cannot do that for the diversity that we know exists on the earth. We just don't have the resources. OK. We, however, face this immense problem that not only are we losing habitats qualitatively, but we're losing them quantitatively. And all of us who say the problem with the loss of diversity has to do with loss of habitat, there's, we're saying two things. We're saying some of those habitats are disappearing utterly, like the land for the flowers in South Africa going into the, uh, the climate, going into the Southern Ocean, utterly gone, no hope, finished. And that's what we've turned our attention to with our reservations, with our parques. Um, but there's another problem, and it's quantitative, and it's the loss of an amount of habitat, which is typified in this particular series of maps that were drawn of, a, of the richest tropical rainforest in the world, in eastern Brazil, the richest place. Um, I have to admit that I was alive when every single one of these circumstances was mapped, so it's my fault. I should have been able to do something about it, and I didn't. Uh, but here you see this region covered in tropical rainforest in 1945, and here in 1960, and here in 1974, and here in 1990, and I have to tell you that sometime in this particular part of the, of the clock, the people of Brazil passed a law that said, this is a national park, it is protected, and you mustn't do all kinds of bad things to it. The result was the change from this map to this map. Nobody paid attention. All this wood was shipped off to Japan, um, it was stripped of the legacy and the heritage of the people of Brazil and of the world, and I don't know what happened to it, but it's no longer trees and alive. Yet, we see no loss in diversity yet. There are, in one hectare of this forest, people have counted 450 species of forest trees. It's the world record, 450 species. And you can still find them all, even in this tiny remnant. And so loss of area appears to be a problem. But at what scale? And how do we predict the problem? And how do we measure the problem? These is, this is where I'm going to take you now in the next few minutes. But before I do that, I want to show you a more uh, jocular view of the problem. Here we have the habitats that we've saved um, and the attitude of the animals living in them toward what we're doing outside of where they're living. Uh, and this, this one just killed me when I saw it. It blew me away because um, it is so, so true, not in terms of the emotions of the animals, but in terms of the biology of what's going to happen into these places that we've saved. So we decided to, to take the world's vertebrates, their terrestrial vertebrates, using the data of the World Wildlife Fund, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a second, um, divided up into its true zoological regions, and I use that term the way it was intended to be used by Slater, who in 1858. It's an old rule in science. Somebody invents a term, you keep using it. And I apologize that I didn't know it when I drew this graph and been too lazy to redraw it. But it's Slater's term, and it's zoological regions. And it means the areas of the Earth where species evolve and become extinct utterly, not locally, but utterly, globally, in their particular region. 
Those are the true endemics, and it is within those provinces that we must seek sustainability for biodiversity. Now, I love island biogeography, and I was in the next room when Robert MacArthur said Eureka and jumped up and ran out to show me what he'd just done. I love biodiversity as it's studied with island biogeography. But island biogeography is not an appropriate kind of model to be testing here because in island biogeography, every island has a big daddy. It has an uncle that's, that's capable of giving it back the species that it loses. These biogeographical provinces or zoological regions don't. They have to reinvent through long periods of evolutionary time every species that they lose. And they find their sustainable balance, their steady state, in the balance between the rate at which they gain new species through evolution and at which they lose species because of global extinction within them. There are nine of these for vertebrates. There may be a few more, uh, but they're so problematic that they're difficult to use for any kind of a test or measurement, and so I left them out. Uh, I'll give you one example. You won't see the Philippines in this map because for mammals, there are at least two zoological regions that are independent generators of diversity all by themselves. Uh, so what do we do with the Philippines? Because in the same places, that is not true of the birds. Uh, the birds don't even have one biogeographical province um, in, the, in the Philippines. So these are the more clear-cut cases where we have lots and lots of, of diversity to work with, courtesy of the World Wildlife Fund, again, um, and we can ask the question, what is the sustainable balance? How many species are there in these zoological regions, and is there anything that we can use to predict those balance numbers, those sustainable numbers? Many, many years ago, I generated a theory which says that one thing you need to look at is the area of the zoological region, the, just the gross area. And many people have also felt that there's something about the climate that you have to use. Um, and we studied this problem and we confirmed those, as I'm going to show you in a second, but not, uh, not a nanosecond, because first I want to show you the extent of the data. Uh, this is the number of species that we looked at in the nine zoological regions, and you'll notice that we've separated some that the world wildlife people did not. We did that by analyzing for endemicity um, and saying that's a separate endemic region, Madagascar for one. A um, huge fraction of all its terrestrial vertebrates are in fact endemic, and it's its own zoological region, no question about it. Hawaii is another case, its own zoological region. New Zealand, which is lumped in with Australia by World Wildlife, we split it out, and we, we accumulated the data separately for New Zealand. Um, and these are the nine that we were left with, uh, and you can see the number of species of amphibians, birds, mammals, and reptiles, all terrestrial, um, uh, except bats are in there too, even though, I don't know whether you call, well, birds fly too, but bats and birds are in there, we counted them. And you can see the very large number of species, um, but some of these species live in more than one zoological region. There is some overlap. And we had to take account of that, and I just want to show you um, what, we, what, we, what is left behind in terms of the number of things that we were actually looking at. 24,992 separate unique species, 4,416 unique genera, 755 ecoregions, and it's been said today quite rightly that political boundaries do not make good ecological boundaries, and so we use the world wildlife designation of ecoregions in which there's an attempt to make ecological, not uniformity, but a similar amount of variation in each ecoregion, regardless of its size, regardless of the fact that some of it may lie in Malaysia and some of it in Thailand and some of it in Indonesia. That's one ecoregion and it goes in separately. There's 755 global ones. We left the ones off that are um, pure ice sheets because their diversity isn't high enough to study. Uh, 
And in addition to that, we had a suite of 102 climate variables, because we did not have a theory for how climate should do this work, but we had a lot of climate variables and people have had a lot of ideas. Okay, so now we test this. First, we test it at the species level. And um, hold on, because you're not gonna believe this, at least if you're me, you didn't believe it when you first saw it. This is the result of trying to come up with some variables, um, in fact, and also trying to test the prediction that area is one of those variables. And you can see here that it kind of sort of worked. It worked. Um, here's the Hawaii and New Zealand, here are the Neotropics, here's Australia, New Guinea, Indo-Malaysia, Palearctic, Africa, Sub-Sahara, etc. The R squared is 0.973. I've never gotten an R squared in my life that high. I was sure that having, when I published this, people would simply think I was having a late life joke. Uh, and, and trying to fool them. But no, this is quite real. And furthermore, if you look at the variables here, one of them is the area of the bio, of the zoological region, sorry, and the other one is the average annual bio temperature. It works beautifully. But I could have substituted for temperature a measure of productivity, which is a very good predictor of productivity, and that's actual evapotranspiration. I, sh I showed that a long time ago in my PhD thesis, and I thought everybody had forgotten it, but then when I went to the literature, I found that people were still measuring actual evapotranspiration and taking it to the low point right down here. And so we used actual evapotranspiration. And when we took actual evapotranspiration instead of temperature, we got an R squared of 0.974. Not significantly different. So we thought, well, we'll look at this at the level of the genus. We'll see if genera give us a similar account of what's going on, and they do. Here's the genus level. Now we've got the actual evapotranspiration in here. And you can see that the R squared for genera is 0.972. Mathematically, it had to be less, but it's shocking that it was only a thousandth less or 2,000 less. These two graphs are remarkable for me because they provide us a telescope that we can use to say, if this is the steady state nature of our influence on a biogeographical province or a zoological region, this is where its diversity will wind up. We can't tell from this how long it will take but we can see where it's going. And we can decide whether we as a society or a set of cultures are willing to live with that eventual outcome. I personally am not, and I think most of you or all of you are not, but this is, this is something that society will have to decide. Meanwhile, we get to wear our white coats we get to be scientists, we get to tell the truth, and then we get to shut up as scientists and, t and play our role as citizens, which is different. It's hard to separate those things, but we have to do it, or as Professor Zink showed, we're in trouble. Nobody will believe us. Well, in this case, I hope people believe us because <laughs> that's a lot of data. And it's remarkably true um, to its regression line. It says some other things I might point out. And one of them is that maybe subspecies aren't very good designations for taxa, but genera are. They seem to follow very close patterns to species. And in the paper that this is published in, we talk about that a lot. It's off the topic today, but, it, but I, was, I was amazed. I, think, I thought of genera as constructs of taxonomists um, and things that were hardly reliable. But it looks from the worldwide data that they are very, very important designations of diversity. 
and that we can trust them and we can ask questions. How do we save this genus that are just as relevant to as how do we save this species? There's more, there's a lot here, but I'm going to pass on to the sad news. Um, and the sad news is calculating what happens based on those graphs to the steady state in biodiversity if we do this or we do that. Um, I've calculated this in two steps because it's mathematically necessary, but that's okay. The percentages hold even separately. And the first step is if we destroy the barriers that separate the zoological regions. So the elephants can march all over from Africa or Asia to all the other biogeographical provinces, uh, including South America, and they can come back and they'll be the same species, and the same with the carnivores. And the question then becomes, okay, fine, how does that change the prediction of the number of species and the number of genera, if it's 100% homogenized? And here are the answers. There are nine regions with 24,992 species, okay? Um, and in the new Pangaea, where all the barriers are down, 100%, maximum loss, 47% of them die out just because of the loss of barriers. And 49% of the genera die out just because of the loss of barriers. If the barriers are not lost entirely, those numbers are smaller, of course. But here's the area loss. Suppose we lose no area. We keep the area for nature that we have. Then these are the numbers of species. These are the numbers of genera. That's after the new Pangaea. That's why these numbers are smaller, because we've now accounted for the loss of barriers. But it's a separate calculation. So I emphasize that even though the numbers are, are too low, because we won't lose all the barriers, uh, the percentages are spot on. And you see that if we lose half the area to nature, we will lose 35% of her species and 29% of her genera. A very serious loss at 50%. And so far, the goal has been to save 20%. In other words, 80% loss. That's going to cost us 64% of species and 54% of genera, which is much higher, I think, than most people have been willing to face. This is the most serious threat to biodiversity. There's no question about it. And if we go to the point where it looks like we are headed at least, which is a 95% loss of species, we're going to, I'm sorry, of area, we're going to lose 85% of the Earth's species, even if we don't do anything to the region separations. 85% of the species gone, and 77% of the genera. It's an extraordinarily serious problem that we face. It is much more serious than conservation organizations have been willing to admit so far. But it comes directly from the data that exists today, from the results of what are probably hundreds of thousands of years of give and take in these separate zoological regions, and we have to learn to report them and live with them. So in sum, um, we are facing quali qualitative and quantitative habitat loss. And these are two distinct threats of mass extinction. The qualitative remedy has been reservation ecology, which we need to keep, of course. The, qual the quantitative remedy we haven't talked about. How do we get back the land for nature that we need for ourselves? And I've been calling that reconciliation ecology, the method by which we get back the land the method by which we make sure enough habitat exists so that we don't face the quantitative problem of habitat loss as much as we have. Um, and here's a definition for reconciliation ecology. I'll leave you to read it because if I read the Spanish, uh, you'll laugh at me. Uh, I hope I haven't mangled the Spanish, but you know, there it is. 
Uh, that's what reconciliation ecology means. I'll pause. Okay. Any questions? Or is it clear? Should have asked for help from my colleagues, but I didn't. <laughs> okay, can I go on? Yeah? All right. Reconciliation ecology has some special features. It's not restoration ecology, okay, which has a great, great importance, a moral importance, in fact. Here are the special features. This is what makes it different. First, it doesn't set up a naturally occurring ecosystem and say, let's rebuild it. It says instead, we have human ecosystems. We're not going to get rid of ourselves from those ecosystems. How can we re-engineer the ecosystems to make them good for us and good for wild things at the same time? How can we learn to share our space? It therefore preserves human uses and human benefits. And it also respects human environmental preferences. If we re-engineer an ecosystem to look like hell, nobody's going to want to live in it. It's got to look like kind of like this. Then we can sell it. Because people will be doing this in their own places, in their own land. The second set of features in this list points out that reconciliation ecology works locally because you have to know about the natural history of the organisms that you're trying to create new habitats for. You have to know about the local environments, the local climate, the local needs, the local economy. So it's an example of think globally, act locally at its best. Old, old expression from the 1970s. And in every single project, it doesn't work at all by accident. It says, here's a list of species we want to make a habitat for. Let's design the new ecosystem. Oh, here's another list of species in the same city. We want them, too, to have a habitat. We do a different habitat for them. We preserve habitat heterogeneity in the new ecosystems. And I'm going to show you uh, the example of how we're trying to do that in Tucson. And most important, actually, is it is not restricted to rare and endangered and threatened species. They count. But the things that aren't on those lists today will be on those lists tomorrow. That's what we learn from the, from the telescope. That's what we learn from looking at those horrible fractions of species that are doomed. And that's what we learn from the rapidly declining fortunes of some of the things that we thought were very common 30 and 40 years ago. Look at the results of the, of the American Audubon Society in their censuses and the very large number of things, birds, that were common 30 years ago that are now very hard to find in the same places. Every species has to be perceived as doomed. And therefore, it makes sense to create new ecosystems that can handle them, even though they are not on the red list today. OK, so what are we doing in Tucson? We have a new ecosystem project, which is to design plant communities so that they preserve diversity in the built-up environment of the city. Schools count. Factories count. We don't make much. But we have a lot of airplanes. And so the Air Force Base counts. Any place where people are that they use, even the parking lot, of a mole counts. How many species does it have? How can, is it possible to imagine a new ecosystem that will have more species, and what will those species be? Well, Tucson's a good place, actually, to do this. 
Um, and it's also got some disadvantages, I must tell you, but I won't tell you about what they are. Uh, but we actually have a very green citizenry. Uh, in this project, which we've run, which is called the Tucson Bird Count, we are actually counting the breeding birds every year. We've been doing this for over 15 years. Hundreds of volunteers have been involved. It's a citizen science project. They are trained in the protocols of the census that we have. They go over regular routes. It's, it's based in many ways on the breeding bird survey, but it's done in a city. And it's done because when we looked at the breeding bird survey, we couldn't get the results from inside the city, and we wanted them. So we have a green citizenry, which we've already tapped into. We have more than 100 formally organized neighborhoods, which, if they want, are capable of getting involved at that level and having not just one person, one landowner, but groups of them cooperate together, get excited together, make choices together, get involved, get trained, and get going. We also have robust NGOs, like the Tucson Audubon Society, which is helping very much with the Tucson bird count. Um, and we have local governments that really care about the environment in the city. Uh, this is a ceremony that I was involved in a few years ago that, it, that, it that was involved uh, with environmentalism in this project. And you will see a picture here, not only the president of the university, um, that's not working out too well, okay, but uh, you see me in kind of on the right, and here is Regina Romero, who's our city councilor, uh, and this is R Richard Elias, who is the chairman of the County Board of Supervisors, and this is Raul Grijalva, who is our congressman. So at the U.S. level, the county level, and the city level, they're all involved. They all love the city, they love its environment, they love its greenness, and they want to protect it. They are a tremendous resource. Now we actually work, I'm the director of Tumamak Hill, uh, we work in a place where we have over a hundred year record of the plants. So we have a lot of data to bank. Uh, and those plants, those native plants, have been picked up by commercial growers and also non nonprofit growers, and people can go and buy the seeds and sometimes even the shrubs or the cuttings. We have 81 species that we can supply if, if neighborhoods want them. And finally, we are Tumamak, the National Historical Landmark on which the science of ecology was largely born in the world, the place where the first 22 volumes of ecology were published, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on about the place. Um, um, it's, it's a habit of mine. Uh, but we, ha we are Tumamak Hill National Historical Landmark, and people expect us to do good things for the environment. Okay, fine. So, the first thing we do is to take advantage of the bird count. And here's the result for one species, to give you an example. That's Gamble's quail, close relative of California quail, but if you see the black on the belly of the male, you can tell that it's not a California quail. But uh, Gamble's quail, and it is found in abundance around the city. But you'll notice in the Tucson bird count censuses this big hole where most of the built up area of the city is. There's very low densities, very low occurrence of Gamble's quail. What's going on? Well, by matching the census with aerial photography and satellite imagery, we were able to get this picture which tells us what's going on. And if just, you need to look at the yellow line in the top. There are, three other, there are two other species that have been analyzed here. But this is Gamble's quail. And you can see that what the data tell us, that if the place has approximately 12% cover by desert scrub plants, it has a population of Gamble's quail, which is equal to the density of population in native Sonoran Desert. 
Now, 12% is not a lot. That gives you 88% left for your home, for your little garden, for your driveway, for your road, and for all the other things that make you a human being. If you can only find 12% for the quail, we're now in a project with uh, Tucson Audubon to encourage people to find 12% for the quail. We've also looked at the scale at which this involved, and you can see that it only it, it appears that we need to have um, 178 meter radius. If it's too small, then it's not enough. So we've got to get neighborhoods involved. That's why the neighborhoods are, are, are so important. Um, and they have to do this voluntarily. So that's how we're handling the birds. The plants are more difficult. And, uh, and yet that's supposed to be Tumamak Hill's most important prod prod product, which is plant ecology. Um, and here's sort of, sort of what the general picture of this very complicated scheme is. It's taken me seven years to put this together. Um, the Tucson bird count is feeding in bird information for the design of the new ecosystems. The Tumamak plant database, I'll show you an example of it in a second, is feeding in information. The Audubon Society is helping to establish these things. So are the neighborhood associations, the native seed growers. Um, but we're not done yet because we need software to process these many species of birds and plants and come up with reasonable, num reasonable sets of species that we can design into new ecosystems. And then finally, a step which most everybody's left out. When we're done, and it's five years later or 10 years later, how do we tell whether we've succeeded or to the, uh, the extent to which we've succeeded? How do we evaluate scientifically our results? I'm gonna show you all that right now. Here's our database. That's a tiny bit of it. It goes on to the right. When do they flower? What kind of soil do they need? It, um, et cetera. Uh, and the list of species is about 300 that grow on the hill. We are, we are as I say, about 350 hectares and a lot of different habitats established because we have a lot of different habitats. The people who established the place counted 12. And whether that's right or not, they put it there. And here's some of our plants, which we've now already transposed into our website so that people can see them and get used to them. We've got a whole lot more that just have to be loaded. All the work of producing the software has been done. But let me just try to show you one of them, and you'll see how this works. Ah, so of course I picked one that's no good. Very good, okay. All right. There we are. So you click on that. If you're a neighborhood person and you want to find out whether you like this plant that's come up for suggestion, you get pictures of it. Um, a lot of characteristics may tell you whether it has allergy properties or not, whether it's poisonous, how many thorns it has, when it grows, when it flowers, uh, and then there's some scientific information that we keep to a minimum because this is not intended for scientists. Lots of places will give you this for scientists. And we've had the, the, the great cooperation of Beth Kinsey, uh, who runs her own site called Firefly Forest. It's fun to visit, um, so go to Firefly Forest and I'm not going to click on that because it will go to Firefly Forest if I do. And, and Beth Kinsey has allowed us to use her pictures and some of her text as well. And we now have um, all the perennials done. They're not all loaded onto the website of the hill. But this is the website of Tumamak Hill. And if I clicked on one of these things, you'd be, you'd be transferred to the website and you'd see all the neat stuff about Tumamak Hill. But I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to take you now to a room where the neighborhood association comes to sit at a computer with a guide. Um, none of this has happened yet, I must tell you. This is planned. Uh, but I can show you the software in its current state. I hope we'll see what happens. Here we go. Okay. Now, all the, all the plants are loaded in here. 
And you can see them, their names, in various orders. You can get them out, and it goes on and on and on and on with all of their, their various features, etc. And we're developing this more. The flowering seasons, and, and then you say, okay, well, in our neighborhood, we would like to have some desert grasses. Okay, so you go to the filter, and you type in the word grass. And then you click on this box, and all the grasses are there. There are 22 grasses that were listed out of the 317 plants in the database that's attached to the software. And then you go down and say, well, um, I don't want all 22. I would just like to have, say, 12. I hope this works. And then you click here, and you see a pre and there it is. There's a set of 12 plants that have certain properties that have been pre-selected by the software, and these are then reconnected to the pictures of the plant. So if you forgot what they look like, you can click on these things and you can find out what they look like. And um, that's not going to work. That's probably not going to work. Yeah, that one's not loaded yet. But you've seen, you've seen a couple of pictures and that's enough. Um, so we'll do control at four. There we go. They still have nat non-native species included in them. They will be taken out very, very soon. No problem. Then, in addition to that, we get some scientific data, which we're going to use in a second, that have to do with the distances between species in hypergeometric space. And we're going to use that in our evaluation. Okay? Um, so all of this is done, and they take it back to the meeting of the neighborhood and they say, folks, here's some pictures. We've got these eight, eight species or 20 species of plants. We would like very much to make this our new ecosystem. We have reason to believe they will grow together. They will support the following birds. Let's get to it. And then somebody raises his hand and says, I don't like that one. I don't like green. Uh, I want a yellow flower instead of a green flower. And then there's a debate and people decide. They get involved, in other words. They get caught up in their own neighborhoods in an environmentally active way. And then, with our help and the help of other people like the Audubon Society, they actually get to work. They're not given this. They are bound, if they want it, to put it in themselves. And we've discovered over the course of a few years that if they are not going to do it themselves, if they are given it, they sit on a lawn chair, they watch the um, gardeners installing the plants in the neighborhood, and then they, they clap, <laughs> fold up the lawn chair, go inside, and all the plants die. That's actually what happened. Okay. So they must get actively involved themselves. Um, and that's what we're doing. And I'm going to try to do this without turning everything. That's, that's better. OK. So now, how do we evaluate this? Well, I, there, there are many ways. Um, but one of them is just to pick a species that you think is in trouble. And we call that model the bell of the ball model. Uh, for example, this species, which is Tumamoka macduli, discovered on Tumamoka Hill, still quite rare. It's not threatened. A few populations in Sonora are known. A few other populations in Arizona are known. But the population of these plants on Tumamoc Hill is down to about 10 individuals. That's all that are left. This is a fairly rare plant. But there's no reason for it. We know how to grow it. We could give it to people, and then we could say, OK, what are some plants that could grow with this and make a new ecosystem? And we were able, using the database, to select some. Here's four of them. Come on, guys. There we go. And here's four more of them. And if the neighborhood would plant Tumamoka and those eight species, it would have a brand new ecosystem that would serve to pr protect 
a very rare plant, whose berries, by the way, make very good jam. In general, however, that's not what's going to happen. We're not going to be going after only the rare and endangered or threatened species. Uh, we're going to be going much more generally than that. And we have to go back to this model of how we set up the software. We took all the species and we put them in a multi-dimensional space. Every dimension has usually a one or a two or a zero or one or a one, two, three. Um, as its values. So one axis is, does it flower in the summertime? And the, the, the species gets a zero if it doesn't and a one if it does. And we do that for all the dimensions that we know. And of course, as you remember, even though it's a multi-dimensional space, we can represent each species by a point. The point will tell the value in every single one of the axes. Now we take a second plant, and it too is a point. And even though it's a multi-dimensional space, we can represent the distance between the two points using a small extension of the Euclidean measurement. You know, square root of x squared plus y squared, that thing. You just keep adding dimensions. It's still a single line, a single distance between two points. And we can do that for every single species. And then we can say, what does this look like for all the species in the database? Well, fine, a lot of them are clumped. Their ecological requirements and all the other things about them are too similar. And we'll, take the, we'll make the hypothesis that they want to be different in order to succeed as a new ecosystem. It may be wrong, but it gives us a hypothesis to test. And then we come back in five years, and we find out what each neighborhood has done, what's the average distance between the plants they chose, what's the variance, did they scatter the points out in this multi-dimensional space, or are they all clumped together? And we see this neighborhood did very well with its ecosystem, this one not so well, and the difference was reflected in the numbers that we get off of the multidimensional space. And so we need some algorithms to do that, and we've got three that work. Here are two examples, <coughs> one of which is called pipeline. We, we just pick the longest branch between two points, and we add the next longest branch connected to either side, and then we add the next longest branch and the next longest, and that's called pipeline. <coughs> that works very poorly, by the way. You'll see in a second. This one is called strike batches. <coughs> we order the branches in the least branching tree by length. We remove the shorter half, bang, gone. We recalculate the least branching tree. We reorder them. We take the longer half, and we leave the shorter half on the floor. And we keep doing that until we have the right number of species. That is the number that the community wants. Uh, and when we look at the results of this, and there's another one that we've, we've actually uh, already programmed. It's the one I showed you, actually. You can see that uh, pipeline, that the, the initial least branching tree has a mean length of 0.57, it has a standard deviation of 0.53 and a coefficient of variation of 0.93. These are its properties. We want to get the mean higher, in other words, the species farther apart, that's our hypothesis. We want to get the standard deviation down, that is, we want to equally space the different species in the multi-dimensional space, which means also we want to get the coefficient of variation down. Okay, pipeline does a rotten job. Pipeline goes mean to 1.08. Strike batches goes to 1.42. And it's among the, the, the three highest, in fact, or four highest. Um, in the standard deviation department, pipeline outperforms all the others. And if we look at the results in a squashed space where you can see how separate or, uh, or clumped things are, then I think I've got this here. Yeah, this is pipeline. These are 
a bunch of species in the multidimensional space, and pipeline produced a cluster over here and a cluster over there, which was not what we wanted, whereas strike batches did this. And all the little red points were selected by strike batches, and that, was re that separated them very, very nicely. Now, people have taken this already, this idea already, and I just have to finish by showing you my favorite example. Uh, this comes from Monso Elementary School uh, at the foot of Tumamak Hill, and uh, the great work of, of Moses Thompson, uh, who realized that this would be extremely good for his kids, uh, and that they have a lot of fun with it. And so he got them to develop a reconciled habitat in the front space of the school. Nothing special, not a special garden, right on the street. And there they are planting a very exotic thing, Opuntia, um, which is pretty scarce unless you open your eyes. And the result looks like this. The, the kids did a terrific job. Moses did a terrific job. Um, and there are, there actually are Sonoran desert tortoises that live in here and thrive in here. Uh, and, the, and the children go out and they tend the flowers. There's some flowers that have to be kind of eased through droughts. We have a few of those. Uh, and, uh, and so they'll water some of the special flowers that they love. And they also do a lot of art which develops their eye for nature. There is nothing, I think, that will bring these kids closer to nature than actually producing their, no, their own new ecosystem. And I think that's going to be true of the neighborhoods as well. Um, and I think that you know, the idea can move from community to community. The general rules will be different. The scientific hypotheses will be different. But we can test them in a very similar way. We can produce them in very similar ways. And we can make sure that the local people are in charge and the local people are the ones who decide what the design of their own new ecosystem is going to be. That will do a number of things, some of them obvious, but here's one that may not be obvious to you. If we can do this for enough places, we will produce a carpet of new ecosystems which are favorable to wild species that will, co that will cover large areas, reconnect large areas with good ecosystems for species we will break down the fragmentation, not by filling it in with old ecosystems. That's a good idea where you can do it, but it's not often possible. We will break down the isolation and the fragmentation with new ecosystems so that when the climate changes, that species that's in trouble simply has to pick it up itself and travel 100 meters north. That's what we're doing. Um, and uh, I hope it excites you. It excites me a lot. Okay, thanks. First of all, it was a beautiful talk. Thanks a lot. Um, I have a question about how your your hypothesis that these new ecosystems should have plants that are maximally different in your you know, hyperdimensional space. Yes. Uh, I mean, it makes sense from a niche point of view, but in terms of needing similar soil types, similar watering regimes, practically speaking, are there some cases where those are all, uh, you know, succulents? And, and Two succulents. things. You're right. But. You need a hypothesis if you're going to test the hypothesis, okay? And second, we understand that that's true. And so we've built in the, in, into the software. Let me get this back for you if I can. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we've built into the software this list right here, and it's, this is going to be extended, where we say, don't pay attention to the water needs. Don't try to separate them by water needs. We want things with similar water requirements. 
don't pay attention to the commonality. We, we don't care if all the species are common or all the species are rare. So we have already built in the facility so we can adjust the chooser to take into account this. But we still have to have a, a, a hypothesis. And the underlying hypothesis here is that species that are different, that have different requirements at some level in some environmental uh, uh, measurements are more likely to survive together, than spe especially in a small space, than species that are virtually duplicates of each other. And if you don't like that hypothesis, great, we'll do another one. <laughs> It'll probably make a more interesting ecosystem too, right? Uh, more likely to buy its fun uh, services. And you're right. And we thought about uh, the, the effect of this on the neighborhoods that when they say, well, gee, we want flowers all year long. We live in a climate where we can get them all year long, so we want to make sure we have flowers that flower at different seasons. You know, or not. Um, or we also have in there thorny. And they can go in there, they can take their selection, out it comes, and they look at the plants, and that one's thorny. Strike it. That one's that one's an allergen, strike it. That one smells bad, strike it. That one's poisonous, strike it. They can do whatever they want, but at the end of the line, we'll have a record of what they chose, they plant it, we see what they do, and we go in after the fact, and we measure the, the hypothesis. We, we see, and then we look at this and compare it to other neighborhoods, and we have a continuous variable um, which tells us how do the neighbors do with respect to how did the hypothesis predict that they would do. And we've converted this into science at that point. Yes, sir. Ah. <laughs> hey, um, I just have a couple of comments. Um, living where I do in the North Temperate Zone, there's this sort of impression that as global climates warm, plant communities will shift north. But I, the little bit I know about plants tells me that there are certain forest trees that are not going to live in the Canadian Shield because the soil is wrong. And so they're going to reach a limit where they can't expand. Uh, and you could comment on that later. And the, my second point is, um, when you were talking about population trends and, and species you know, richness changing and going down, one of the things that seems to be excluded to me is that in an ecosystem, Without human influence, at any point in time, some species are going to be increasing, some are going to be decreasing, and some are going to be staying the same. And we seem to assume that because some are decreasing that we should think the sky is falling when 99.9% .9 of every species that ever existed is extinct. So decreasing species is a natural phenomenon, and I think that needs to be built into the model to sort of moderate the uh, conclusion that decreasing uh, loss of species is a bad thing. Let me answer the second question because it's more complicated first, and then I'll go back to the other one um, where I'm going to depend on Margie Davis. Okay. Um, the dynamics of population within the, species, within the individual species are not, in fact, part of this model at all. What I tried to do was simply refer to well-known published work. I actually agree with you that conservationists are sometimes too willing to take points and project doom from those points uh, to make dynamics up out of two points. Um, and that, that's a very dangerous scientific chore. To, to, you know, it just it's, it's, it's fraught with trouble. It's really, it's going to crash. Um, so I agree with you. Nevertheless, we do know that even if they're wrong, we have experienced over the past 100 or 200 years the extinction of some remarkably common species, which is the real message here. The real message is that all, we have to treat all species as if they are threatened, even though they can't be red listed. We have to be worried about the existence of all species if the ultimate goal of this relaxation is going to be 95% loss of species diversity. That was, the, that was the real message. Look at the passenger pigeon. 
There were, there were between one and four billion birds. It was the most common species of bird in the world, I'm told, um, and it's gone. Uh, look at the, uh, the, um, the, the limpet that was in the northeastern part of the United States um, and was hit by a virus in the 1930s and went from being one of the most common limpets uh, in the ocean to being extinct because not it's not saying that things don't go extinct. But what I'm pay. saying, what I'm saying, Bob, is that very common things go extinct, and so just because something is common doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. No, my point is that at any given point in time in any community or any fauna, a certain set of species will be decreasing just because species go extinct. And so we shouldn't confuse that fraction of naturally decreasing species with what's, what we're doing to the environment today, and some attempt ought to be made to tease those two apart. Um, again, I think you're right. I think it's a good point. And I think that every estimate of, of the rate of extinction that's been published, with one exception, uh, makes that mistake. And that exception is a very tiny exception, but an important one because it's, it's intellectually powerful. It has to do with a, a reserve in Africa uh, and the application of island biogeography theory to that reserve to predict extinction rates. But most of them rely on just what you've objected to. The species is rare, the species is limited in range, therefore the species is in trouble. It's a, that's a leap. That's what, I think that's what you're saying, and I agree with you. Modeled turnover rates. You and others have modeled turnover I, rates. I have never this. succeeded in modeling turnover rates. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that was a job that was too hard for me. I have never succeeded in modeling turnover rates. And you won't find anything in the literature uh, where I've claimed that I've succeeded either because it's, it's too, it's, it just defeated me. It's one of the, and another thing that I might point out is the relationship of climate to diversity. I've tried with several different hypotheses, and there I have published them, and they've all wrong. Okay, um, they were absolutely all wrong. And uh, so there's some very, very big mysteries, but if we could get people to be more aware of how fragile their predictions of, of extinction rates are, they would work harder on them and take the dynamics more seriously. I completely agree with you, completely agree with you. The other point was about the different trees and the soil problems and things like that. Uh, you probably know Margie Davis is retired to Tucson years ago and I had a conversation with her uh, about her early work. She is the one who talked about how about half the species of trees moved with the glaciers. Um, they became extinct in areas where, which were too cold and they went to warmer places and then they went back. And she says right now, she doesn't believe that anymore. Um, she says that what happened in her opinion instead is that the plants disappeared from the record because they were squeezed into very tiny populations into climatological refugia that nevertheless were at the same places, were more or less the same places where they were. And then they came back out of those refugia when the glaciers retreated. That's what she told me. How's that? Is that, pardon? Fan of Margaret Davis. Me too, so, sure. Me too, me too. Um, but if, you know, we've, we've, got to get, we've got to get people like the IUCN uh, and the people who are in charge of the red list to understand how difficult it is to make predictions about extinction rate. Here's another example, the other side of the coin. We have a cactus, I have a picture in it, I won't take the picture out. We have a cactus um, in southern Arizona from Tucson to just into Sonora. It's got a total geographical area that's about 50 kilometers on a side. It's rare, wherever it is, there's about one individual per two or three hectares, okay? This cactus is so rare, and it's so geographically limited, that it's on the red list. But in fact, when you look at its biology, you understand it doesn't belong on the red list. Why? This cactus must be pollinated. 
and it's, it, it's, it's what, whatever the botanists call it. It has to receive pollen from some other individual. It can't pollinate itself. And the pollination is done by a, a variety of bees, not a specific species of bee. And the plants in the species all flower approximately two days after the onset of the monsoon every year in the summertime. So the bees grab the nectar and the pollen and they transport it among the different individuals that, that are living many meters from each other and the plants set seed and they survive and they stay rare and they stay adapted to this crazy life cycle. These plants have evolved to be, to be rare. Their, their reproduction is constrained to such a small, think about it, a very small period of time because if a cactus would flower outside of that period of time, where would it get the pollen to be fertilized? And if there were many, many of them, and they were all flowering according to some kind of a normal distribution, yeah, they'd be, they'd be successful, it would be okay, but they're rare. And so rarity and their, their life history work together to maintain them, and they are not something that we've caused. They are not rare and they are not constrained because of Homo sapiens. They're rare and constrained because of evolution, and they are a success. Mike, uh, how do you think that genetic diversity can help uh, conservation programs? How do uh, I think that what kind of diversity can help hunt conservation? I'm missing a, a word there. Before uh, how uh, uh, the genetic diversity measures ah, can help. Ah, ah. How do I think that genetic diversity can help conservation progress? Yes. Um, I'm not a geneticist and I don't know. Um, and I say that in all honesty. I don't say it won't, I don't say it will. Um, I think there are some amazing examples where it's clear that genetic diversity, loss of genetic diversity didn't matter. And there are other examples where it looks like it did matter. And I don't know how to make a generalization. It's very complicated, it needs expert studies. I would just hope that the scientists who have this particular tiger by the tail are honest about reporting their results. And if it turns out that genetic diversity is only important in this kind of case or that kind of case, and we don't have to worry about it in general, that they tell us honestly, even though they would hope to use it as a weapon in favor of conservation, that they tell us the simple scientific truth. Yeah? Is that fair? Okay. Do you have a, a, a counter to that? No, no, it's, uh, that's okay because there's a lot of, there's a great uh, discussion right now in Mexico about the, you know, maintaining the, the genetic diversity of maize and other plants because they are here in Mexico at the center of origin and that's important here, yes. you know? Yeah, but, but I don't know, that's why I wanted but, to understand, to know your I opinion. I love that. Okay, I, there are several kinds of varieties of mice that, that I eat and enjoy, and, and um, I would hate for the number of varieties to decline, um, but that's a cultural thing, and it's also my personal feeling. So the science is, what are the varieties, where do they grow, how can we maintain them? The, 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 polit the politics of it is, do we care? And if we care, how much are we willing to spend on doing that? My answer is a lot, okay? But I'm only one citizen, okay? And it is a cultural thing, I think, it really is. I, I, um, I, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, Thank you. Okay. Michael, have you considered including uh, future climatic suitability in this model? People have done that starting in Australia, um, and the, the results are grim. It's what sets out the, the problem of needing to transport the plants and the animals. Um, and what I've done is less than that, I have to admit. Um, th this is a 
in some ways, a first cut at the problem. We're, we're dealing at what I think is the largest level of the problem, which is just loss of area regardless. Uh, you will see in there that despite the 97% plus R squared, there's only one number for the temperature of each of those zoological regions. Now, I know there's lots of variance, cold places and warm places, but they got to contribute under the rules one number and only one, and we still got the 97% result. The same thing is true with productivity. They got one number, even though the places went from deserts to tropical rainforests. Um, this is a limit that we'll, we will try, I think we need to try very hard to fix, but I think it needs to be fixed at a different scale. I think we need to say, okay, here's how evolution works. With respect to diversity, we get a certain area to play with. We may call it a continent, whatever. There's going to be a certain amount of speciation that takes place because of geographical processes and genetic isolation. I don't think it has much to do with ecology, by the way. This is where genetics becomes very important. Um, and that will produce species at a rate which depends on the diversity. It's diversity dependent. We know that. Uh, it's, it's in the theory, and, and we have some confirmations of it from fossil evidence. So we're OK there. Then we have extinction rates that depend on the area, say, and maybe also on the climate. I'd like to know that, too. And so then evolution cranks, and, we pro and it produces a steady state number of species with you know, a lot of jumping around through long periods of time. Those species then have to sort themselves out. They are going, and there are people who study this in community ecology with very exciting results. How will they take a gradient of productivity and split it up? Will there be more species at the rich end, the poor end, the middle end? How will they take a gradient of precipitation and split it up? Where will the, we know what the, the, the number of species, but they develop specializations. They force each other into separate niches through coevolution. Where do they go and how many of them do they do, do go in, into these different places? That's a huge and interesting question for me. I think there's been a lot of progress made in 20 years, but we're far, far, far from solving it. Um, I want to live long enough to see some real progress in that one. Second question. Now that you've, you've uh, gone up to the continental scale, how would you take this program to the continental scale? You mean of new ecosystems? Yes. No, I wouldn't. I say, you know, what would you say to the Department of Agriculture, or the Department of Transportation, or Bureau of Land Management, or some other national or, or continental entity about creating new habitat? Okay, I'm not a Tea Partier, I'm not a libertarian, but I would say to them, keep your hands off. Okay, I really believe that. I th what I've seen is that um, they will sit around and they will take meetings and develop rules for what people are allowed to do. Uh, the rules will be arbitrary and science-free, uh, and they will get in the way. If instead people realize that they are already spending lots of money on their properties, they're gardening, they're planting trees, whatever it is. If they are cattle ranchers, they are spending money for agriculture on their properties. And they realize that for not only little cost, but maybe negative cost, there's the cases where we know where people have actually gotten more profit from the land if they reconcile it. When that educational effort goes forward and people organize themselves into smaller groups, they will be better able to take care of the local needs, the local life histories of the species they're interested in. Um, and then maybe in 100 years, we can bring the government in to tell us what to do. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to sound that I believe that as a political philosophy, but in this particular case, I think they can only mess it up. That's a guess. Okay. Thank you very much. I know you're tired, and you've been very, very receptive. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
En un momento más tendremos las palabras de clausura de este evento por el estudiante de doctorado Ricardo Ito. Pues buenas tardes, no venía preparado, no venía preparado. <risa> eh, pues en, en nombre de, de los estudiantes eh, del posgrado en Ciencias de la Vida, eh, para nosotros es realmente un orgullo estar acá, haber realizado este evento, sobre todo agradecer al, al, al departamento, a los investigadores, la confianza que nos dieron de poder comenzar todo esto desde cero, eh, poder haber invitado a la gente y eh, llevar a cabo la logística y toda esa parte de la administración que no a todo el mundo le gusta. ¿no? Pero bueno, ya acá, eh, no quiero hablar solo acá y quisiera que pasaran todos los que estuvieron en la organización, eh, no en orden de importancia, pero sí todos, Nadia, Denise, eh, Marisela, Claudia, eh, Lluvia, si pueden pasar, por favor. A todos los han visto por ahí, pero no es de una sola persona, ha sido de muchas personas y al final, pues, 10 eh, seguimos moviéndonos, aunque de alguna manera todos los estudiantes estuvimos involucrados en la organización del evento. Eh, pues, por mi parte, quiero dar las gracias a todos por haber venido, eh, sobre todo también esta unión de estudiantes de licenciatura y de posgrado de, de la UABC, de CICES. Eh, creo que al final yo me quedo con algo. Eh, esto y casi todo lo que escuchamos hoy tiene que ver con comunidades, con la comunidad que hemos formado hoy, estudiantes, alumnos eh, y con la ecología de comunidades. ¿no? Eh, parece que falta mucho trabajo en estudiar el ensamble de comunidades y la dinámica de comunidades para poder entender lo que va a pasar ante los cambios que la naturaleza nos está, eh, nos está enfrentando y que el hombre de alguna manera también está promoviendo. Y también nos dio mucho gusto, porque lo platicamos en algún momento, poder eh, haber vivido un día que realmente son las ciencias de la vida. no O sea, fuimos desde las escalas micro hasta las escalas macro, eh, vimos cuestiones que tienen que ver con biología molecular, microbiología y cosas que pasan a nivel del ecosistema. Entonces, creo que para nosotros ha sido un día completo y pues reflejó muy bien lo que para nosotros es las ciencias de la vida y el posgrado que estamos estudiando. Eh, le voy a pasar la palabra a Alejandro para que también diga algunas cosas. Voy a tratar de ser breve. Yo creo que hoy nada más este, aprendimos una cosa, que cuando se acabe el mundo y se acaben este, todas las especies, la única, las únicas cosas que van a quedar van a ser las cucarachas y los hongos. Entonces, este, muchas gracias por haber venido. Vámonos a la sesión de pósters. Este, gracias, de verdad. Muy bien, entonces, siendo las 6.20 del 6 de noviembre del 2014, damos por clausurado este evento. Para aquellas personas que no tienen constancia eh, de participación, por alguna razón, vamos a estar acá en la mesa de registro o cualquier otra cosa que haya quedado pendiente ahí eh, por parte del registro y nos trasladamos todos allá a la sala de usos múltiples donde hay ambigús, hay café, hay otras bebidas y sobre todo los pósters donde queremos eh, interactuar. ¿no?
Gracias.